ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Parisa Tavariz, and I work at Google as engineering director. I'm responsible for Chrome Security, uh, Project Zero, and a lot of our SSL efforts. And it is a woo! Uh, it's a huge, huge honor to open the Our Security Advocates Conference, or Our SA, um, this morning. Oh. Um, so since this is a first time event, uh, I thought I would share just a little bit of history about how we got here. It's a very short history. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of the noise that happened on Twitter in late February. Uh, 
there was an announcement of one of the largest and most established security conferences uh, that just happens to be uh, coincidentally happening right down the street. And uh, some noise on Twitter about the lack of diversity in that uh, announcement of keynotes. And so I saw this. I saw some tweets from my friends, Amy, Alex, and some other folks. Reached out to them as well as some other like-minded peers and uh, experts in security and privacy and said, hey, we should do something. And so we did. Uh, and that's really uh, the whole story of how we got here. Um, our organizing committee is all comprised of folks that have full-time jobs uh, that have nothing to do with event organization. So it's been a bit of a whirlwind over the past couple weeks to get here. Um, and we're all a bit scattered across the country. But it all came together in about five days, and we launched our conference site. Uh, it's been an inspiring and really humbling experience um, to just have everything come together in a couple weeks, and uh, in part aided by some of the technology that a lot of us have helped build or um, influence in some way. So some important details, uh, Wi-Fi. Of course, everyone is wondering about that. Wi-Fi details, if you need them, are on your conference badge at the bottom. You want to use the hashtag. Uh, and then bathrooms are over there. Um, social uh, tags and accounts, if you want to take part in the conversation, our uh, RSA conference and RSA 18, you can see that we're um, showing some of the, the tweets on this wall, and we'll be doing that through the rest of the day. Why RSA? Why do we want to do this event? So, uh, you know, technology today is more central to people's lives than it's ever been. And we see that it's evolving at this incredible and, uh, frankly, overwhelming uh, pace. And I think especially in recent months, we've seen that a lot of security and privacy issues are increasingly human factors issues. You know, it's about getting people to understand uh, their settings and the software they're using and to tweak their settings to their personal preferences. It's about getting people to install updates and to act on alerts. Uh, it's about giving analysts tools to spot attacks and also for us to be thinking about how emergent technologies will actually impact society and to help safeguard them. Now, given all that, it's more important than ever that our security and privacy platforms are really built to uh, reflect the diversity of our users, of our employees, and of our administrators um, of the world for those of us that work on products that are really meant to serve the entire world. And so I'm incredibly proud of the perspectives that we're going to be sharing on stage today. We have speakers from industry, from academia, from the media, from nonprofits and government, uh, and other organizations in the public sector. We have speakers. Uh, that will share their viewpoints as engineers, as policymakers and designers, as lawyers, as researchers, as journalists and professors, as business executives, public servants, and much more. And uh, I think we're going to have a, an awesome day of, of content and discussion. Wanted to share some stats about the conference. So I mentioned we put this together in about five days, less than five days. Uh, we sold out in less than 12 hours. And I want to give a special thanks to anybody that bought a ticket but wasn't actually able to um, uh, get a physical ticket to, to uh, attend the event in person. A number of people bought tickets to be there in spirit. And um, those contributions are, are very welcome as well. And it was a great show of, of support. We, uh, as you may have seen, we launched the conference with uh, most of our agenda actually filled, but we left it open for some talk submissions as, as well, and we got nearly 100 talk submissions in just a couple hundred days. In just a couple days, um, we obviously weren't able to include even a small portion of those talks, but a lot of people were interested in participating and, and speaking. And something I'm especially proud of is that 100% of the folks that will be on stage, so all of our speakers, our session chairs, as well as the panel moderators, all come from traditionally underrepresented backgrounds in uh, security and privacy. So uh, we couldn't have done this without the help from a lot of people. So thanks to our corporate sponsors. Um, first, I want to give a huge thanks to Cloudflare um, for providing this gorgeous event space. Um, yes. <laughs> Yeah. It's an in incredible space. Um, they've been hugely generous. I want to say thanks to Ashley and her production team for putting all of this together. I know how to do none of this, um, and it's so profesh. 
Uh, so thank you to all of our, our corporate sponsors, also particularly our advocate level sponsors. Um, so those are the ones that you know gave us the most money. Uh, and so thanks to Bank of America, again, Cloudflare, uh, Dropbox, Facebook, FireEye, Google, Habitat, MailChimp, Netflix, Palo Alto Networks, and Uber. Thank you for giving us money when we had no idea what we were doing. Um, you know, uh, we appreciate you uh, supporting us in this uh, fully and very generously. All of the, the proceeds, um, which I think is upwards of $70,000, will be donated to a number of charities that we think are, are aligned with the, the mission of this conference. Um, we're going to be donating proceeds to Hack the Hood, Black Girls Code, the Center for Cybersecurity and Education, and also the International Consortium for Minorities in Cybersecurity Professionals. All right, next, very importantly, I would like to thank our organizing committee. Again, all of these folks uh, you know, really rallied over the past couple of weeks. Many of them have uh, you know, full-time jobs that have nothing to do with this. So thank you to Dina, Chris, Megan, Melanie, Anshul, Kelly, Leah, Ashley, Adrian, Mark, Bria, Alex, and Amy for taking your evenings, your weekends, uh, part of your workday to make all of this happen. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank all of you and people on the live stream. Thank you for dialing in. Uh, it's been um, really incredible and exciting to just see how much support there has been. Um, people that have reached out, all of you that are, are here. And uh, I'm excited uh, to just to, to uh, be here and take part in this. Putting together this event, it couldn't have happened without a lot of people. Um, I'd like to invite Michelle Zatlin, who's the founder, co-founder of, of Cloudflare, and her organization, as I said, has been so instrumental in putting this together. Um, I first met Michelle at a tech conference in San Francisco, and we've stayed in touch ever since, and uh, she's always been a supporter of projects like RSA, thank you. Yeah. And uh, I'm delighted to have her share a couple words. Thank so, you so much, yeah. thanks, Parisa. <laughs> Good morning. Hi, as Prisa said, my name is Michelle Zatlin. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloudflare. Welcome to our corporate headquarters. Um, I really want to say on behalf of our whole team, we're just so proud to be hosting today's event. Uh, and I'm just the one who gets to be lucky up here and, and welcome all of you. So welcome. Uh, I just want to say a few minutes, and then we'll get on with the show. Uh, so many of us in this room and on the live stream think about security and privacy every day of our jobs. And what and what we've seen really over the last 18 months as this this news continues to come to the f f uh, forefront is like it can't this event can't come at a better time so i'm so excited to hear about all the different topics from the different points of view we're going to hear about today because i really believe this is a uh, uh topics that are just going to continue to come to the forefront and we need to be having conversations like we're going to have today you know as Prisa said, it's really, really important that we're building products from a di for the diversity of our users. And we think about that every day at Cloudflare. We're helping make the internet faster and safer for web surfers around the world. And so it's something we think a lot about. And I'm really excited to hear from the innovators today that are spending their time working on these complex problems to learn from all of them. Um, you know, I know that I've always said when you have a diverse team, you get way better outcomes. And of course, now all the research uh, shows that as well. And so I cannot, um, whether it's from where you are or what type, what gender you are or what your background is from or where you grew up, those are all different for forms of diversity. And I'm really excited to hear from the different um, uh, 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 panel today from how they're approaching these different problems because I think it'll all make us better in our jobs. When Parisa and Amy didn't like the speaker lineup at, at the conference down the street and 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 they didn't they got a pretty disappointing answer from the, the other organizers, what I admire most is it's one thing to talk about and to complain about things, but they actually came up with a solution and they did something about it. Um, and then they came up with a solution, they put forward, and in 12 hours, tickets sold out for this. So clearly, people want an alternative. And what I always say, that is entrepreneurship as its finest. So I love that so much. Um, today is learning more about the science behind what's going on, getting into the weeds, the technology, uh, and learning more about the hard problems that companies are signing up to solve. Because a lot of these problems are really hard, and we're going to get into the weeds of that today. And most importantly, you're going to get to meet the people who are working on it, which, which is probably the best part. So thank you to everybody who worked tirelessly to put this event on. Um, Parisa thanked all of them, but really, it, could, it was a real team effort. And this is something truly unique, and I know something that I'm personally proud to be a part of, and I hope all of you enjoy the day. And so with that, let's get today started. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you. All right. Um, Really quickly, I wanted to, to make it clear, our goal with RSA was twofold. One, create an awesome event uh, to share content, to network. I see a lot of familiar faces as well as faces I don't know, so I'm excited for the day to do that. Um, another goal was just to make a statement. And we hope that RSA will help our other conference organizers recognize that finding speakers with diverse voices is not this insurmountable task. Um, and we're tired, frankly, of hearing the same old excuses. Woo, thank you. Uh, there were many, many talks submitted that would have been fabulous to include in this agenda. Um, and as I said, we just didn't have the time for a, in a, in a one-day event. And so I hope that today's event is just the beginning of a discussion. Um, I hope that all of you will continue that conversation um, into the evening and beyond. Uh, I encourage everyone to you know, meet new people here, discuss what you're working on, um, make sure to talk to our panelists and speakers, many of whom came here on short notice. And you know, last but not least, continue to collaborate on the amazing work that you do. We have uh, a lot of challenges ahead of us, and I think it's really important that we're uh, leveraging each other's talents and working together. I know we're a bit behind schedule, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Adrian, who is the chair for our first session, uh, advocating for high-risk users. So thanks to Adrian. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, you're all a big part of making this event a success. Um, we're gonna start off with a topic near and dear to my heart, which is advocating for high-risk users. Neither security nor privacy are one size fits all. Even the words themselves, security and privacy, mean different things to different people. And this becomes abundantly clear when you try to translate those words into many other languages and find yourself having to try to explain to the person doing the translation what you think they mean, only to discover that the other person has a different idea. Um, understanding user needs and threat models is a key to building useful, helpful, effective, and necessary technology for everyone around the world. We're going to hear from five kick-ass speakers now on what they've learned from working with and advocating for different groups. Um, the way that our sessions are going to be formatted is, is we're going to have five excellent talks followed by a moderated panel up here on stage. Without further ado, I'd like to start off by introducing our first speaker, Eva Galprin. She's the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Director of Cybersecurity. Uh, Eva wields a formidable mix of political science degrees and technical knowledge to advocate for technical rights, as well as the needs of journalists and activists. I first became familiar with some of her research reports on malware, and I'm thrilled that she's here to speak with us today. Let's get this party started. Um, so out of all of the speakers, I'm going to be the only one doing this with no slides, and you're not really missing out on a lot because it was just 10 pictures of cats. <laughs> so welcome everyone to Human Factors. Uh, this talk is everything you always wanted to know about advocating for uh, vulnerable populations, but we're afraid to ask. So uh, the first thing that everybody really needs to understand about vulnerable populations is that you don't understand them. Uh, the most common misconception that I come across uh, among people who want to do this kind of work or who are interested in doing this kind of work is that they think they know what vulnerable populations are, what they want, and what they need without being part of that population or studying them or doing their homework. And so the first example that I'm going to use is from my own experience. I think that it's really important that if I'm going to point to mistakes that people make, that I should start with my own. <laughs> so I'm going to start with domestic violence. Uh, and let me tell you, finding a cute kitten for that was not easy. So uh, a few months ago, I tweeted that if there were any women who had been um, in domestic abuse situations with hackers who had later been threatened by those hackers with a compromise of their devices, uh, that they could contact me and I would make sure that they would get, uh, you know, that the devices would get looked at and they would get like a full forensic analysis. And I didn't expect this tweet to go viral. So, uh, 
I think something like 16,000 retweets and 24,000 likes or whatever shares on Tumblr and other numbers uh, that don't particularly matter, uh, my inbox started getting very full. And I heard from a tremendous number of women. Uh, also, I heard from men who were advocating for their female friends or partners. Uh, I heard from men who had been in similar situations. Uh, but mostly, I heard from women. And I discovered something very interesting, which was that very few of the cases which came to me uh, actually required any kind of uh, forensic analysis. You would think that the people who are in this situation are like, well, my, has my device been owned? And what was more common was uh, that their former partner was making a threat as a way of continuing to control them. Uh, as a general rule, if you are a hacker and you have compromised somebody's device successfully, you have, you have root on their, on their phone or on their laptop, and you're reading all of their email and you're tracking all of their movements, you want to keep quiet about it so that you can continue to track all of these things. Um, so this was a, a very different sort of problem. So I'm not saying that uh, domestic abusers don't uh, use remote access tools and things like that on, uh, on devices, but that the overlap between the people who are making these threats and the people who are actually rooting devices is very, very small for the reason that most people have, who have rooted the devices don't want to give away their advantage. And that was not something that I thought when I started this. I'm like, ah, everybody needs forensic analysis. This is totally a problem that can be solved with forensics. And then it turns out that this is a problem that can be solved by carefully leading people through why do you think your device has been compromised? Have you seen anything strange going on? Has somebody compromised your account? And it turns out that compromising people's email accounts or Instagram accounts or Snapchat accounts is much easier than compromising their devices, uh, especially if you are a person's longtime partner and you may have shared passwords or bullied the password out of your, uh, out of your former partner. Or you can easily guess their uh, security questions, which is also something that we've seen happen all the time. Uh, frequently, the partners have a lot of very deep uh, and extensive personal knowledge about the person and about their family. And, uh, and they leverage that into appearing to be a uh, much more skilled hacker than they actually are. Uh, and so the primary service that I ended up paying uh, to, to all of these uh, people who contacted me was slowly walking them through exactly what it was that their abuser was doing and kind of um, dispelling the magic of hacking. Because people frequently think, if they're not hackers, that, hacker, that hacking is magic, that you take over a computer, that the person can just snap their fingers and you have full control over the device, and that's simply not true. Um, the, there are some other things that we want to think about when we're talking to vulnerable populations. And the, um, the next one is, am I the right person for this job? So I was recently contacted uh, by a guy who runs an organization that connects uh, trainers to communities. And he expressed concern that most of the trainers who were, who were contacting him were white men. And most of the organizations that were looking for training were you know, grassroots organizations and people of color and LBGTQ organizations all over the United States. And he was like, perhaps this pairing will not work out. <laughs> Some things might go wrong here. Should I be putting these people together? And what I recommend in these situations is that uh, well-meaning people with the technical knowledge should partner with people who have the, uh, the personal knowledge of the vulnerable populations partner with somebody from the population or who understands the population and combine your powers uh, to do good because nothing is as embarrassing as being a well-meaning clueless techie in a room full of people uh, and say, you know, I am here from the internet to tell you what to do because it's not very effective. Uh, and a few examples of the ways in which these things are not effective uh, include uh, the importance of meeting people where they are and not where you think that they should be. And this involves a couple of dogmas. Um, 
probably the most common dogma that I see among, uh, among people who go out to meet vulnerable populations is uh, use Tor, use Signal, and then put on a cape and fly away. <laughs> Shortest training, very short. Uh, it turns out that uh, most of the populations that I talk to um, don't really understand the difference between uh, encryption in transit and encryption at rest. They don't understand when you use Tor and how Tor is useful, or when you use Signal and how Signal is useful. Uh, the most common misconception that I come across in sort of non-technical populations is that uh, Tor and Signal are somehow interchangeable, which I imagine most people in this audience understand is a profound misunderstanding of the situation. Uh, furthermore, there are situations where neither Tor nor Signal are going to help, and they're not necessarily the best tools. Uh, this is a very frequent argument that I have with, uh, with people who come from, from tech backgrounds, who come from Silicon Valley. They say you should use the best tools, you should use the most secure stuff. And uh, this is actually advice that doesn't make a lot of sense for some situations. Uh, for example, uh, Signal prioritizes sending uh, an encrypted message over getting your message to you on time. And so, if you need to send timely messages, like, uh, hey, partner, I am coming to dinner, uh, or I have bought the groceries, or we're going to meet at this restaurant, um, then sometimes Signal is really not the best choice, because you will be receiving that message, say, six to eight hours later, or maybe the next day, and you're going to end up sitting in a restaurant waiting for your partner, and they will not come. And one day, I am going to uh, publish an entire blog post about this, titled, Moxie Marlin Spike is Single-Handedly Destroying My Marriage. The other dogma I think that we should be very careful about when, uh, when dealing with vulnerable populations is open source dogma. Uh, it is really common, uh, especially at sort of EFFE kind of organizations, to say that the, the best tools are open source, that uh, open source software is really great, that many eyes make, uh, make bugs shallow, and therefore open source uh, is what we should all be using all the time. Uh, but I am not Richard Stallman, and uh, thank God. <laughs> and I think that the most important thing is to recommend people tools that work. And so in the case of, say, password managers, uh, sometimes I will have a population to whom I recommend a, um, a, a paid password manager, like 1Password, and that's if they need to go, uh, they need everybody in an organization to have it and they have enough money to shell out for it. Uh, I think 1Password actually has a really excellent uh, user interface, and, and that's why I recommend it sometimes over open source tools. Uh, and finally, the very last dogma that, uh, that I like to counter is the just quit Facebook dogma. And let me tell you that this is not terribly good advice uh, if you are talking to a room full of activists, because essentially what you're doing is you are telling activists, don't do activism. Don't go where the people are. Uh, and if you give people this kind of advice, uh, they're simply not going to take it. It's not going to work. Uh, and you will not have done a very good job of advocating for them. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Next up, we have Jesse Irwin. Jessie is head of security at Tendermint, where she's responsible for developing, maintaining, and delivering their security strategy. Previously, she worked at 1Password. Um, apart from her impressive uh, uh, role backgrounds, I first came across Jessie on Twitter, actually, where she was tweeting about her old lady gang. I was uh, very much charmed and impressed by her uh, funny but respectful discussion of this topic. Um, my grandmother is named Shirley. Uh, she's a fierce and brilliant woman who I look up to and admire. I, I hope to someday be half the woman she is. And she deserves online security and privacy just as much as any of the technologists in this room, which is something that I think, honestly, sometimes people forget. So I appreciate that Jesse is here with us today to talk about her squad. Hello, 
Fair warning, if anyone starts shouting things in the audience, the old lady gang is watching. They live in a neighborhood not far from here. They will literally come and get you. They know where you are, so watch yourselves. So when I'm talking about my old lady gang, I've thought a lot about, do I drag them in to have a panel? Do I find a cartoon? Who's the best old lady gang I know? So today we're going to be talking in terms of these ladies who apparently have figured out all these Jedi tricks that we didn't even know they had. Um, once upon a time, when I first moved to San Francisco, I didn't know anyone. And the only people who really noticed in my neighborhood, if I was alive, dead, functioning, were the old ladies that hung out on the corner with their dogs. Now, in this particular city, I have a feeling that old lady gangs run pretty deep. If you want to know what's going on in the neighborhood, if you want to know who misbehaved, who drove through the hedge drunk, if you want to know who's having problems doing God knows what in the homeowners association, this is the group. What I learned from these ladies, though, was for all of the power and all of these amazing life experiences that they had, um, once in a while, they had technology problems. I'm not sure exactly how it started, but one day, somebody had a broken iPad that came out of a purse, and they looked at me and realized, oh, you do that technology stuff, but I think I can talk to you because you acknowledge my existence when I am out on the street. Also, I like the dog. I tried to dog knock the dog. Whatever. Long story. <laughs> but my old lady gang came to me at first, with technology problems. They didn't identify them as security problems. They were just like, hey, this thing's not working. So when you get the iPad that's like five years old, and the passcode doesn't exist, and you start noticing that, oh, this thing's not updated. Oh, no, this is a security nightmare. It feels like a problem. The first instinct is, oh, no, this is bad. You should not do this. Except she didn't come to me to say, hey, what am I doing wrong? She came to me to say, hey, I had a problem, and I can't get my technology to work. We were not in a spot where this was about, hey, I need security training. It was, hey, this thing and I have a complicated relationship, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have to break up, or I'm going to have to throw it out a window, or whatever. But this isn't working for me. Come on, slide. You know you want to advance. So what I learned from at first with the broken iPad situation is there's a really big disconnect between what we expect an at-risk user to look like and what they actually look like. My old lady gang, all four of them, um, are fancy old ladies who live in a nice San Francisco neighborhood. However, they have a threat model, and that threat model isn't just that, oh, I can't use my, my machine. One woman, um, who you may not think of as at risk when she's got her purse in the right place and she is bossing down the street, has memory problems. Another woman has a significant uh, struggle with some of her family. And there is a back and forth tussle about who has control of what and who is able to access computers and update devices. And there's no good way to solve that problem um, for them without a lot of, of hard work. Another woman um, basically came to me and said, I love all of this technology stuff. My husband spent his entire career building it. I spend my life trying to figure out how to use it, but I don't feel like it's for me. And those are really painful things to hear, because when you look at elderly people as a population, they've got a lot of good things going for them. And they're actually a pretty ripe population that will fall for social engineering attacks and things that are not necessarily technical um, if you come in at them in the right way. Something I learned is that there's lots of security advice on the internet, and most of it is crap. Some of the things that you will find in the first 10 results of a Google search contradict each other. They're not helpful. And when you're trying to help particularly an older population improve what they're doing in security, you cannot come at them from the point of technology. You cannot say, oh, hey, let's talk about malware today. 
oh, hey, let me tell you about all of this stuff you can hook into your email account so that you don't fall for some zero-day God knows what contraption. Literally no one knows what that is and cares about it. The right way when you're working with an older population or a population that is not necessarily fluent with technology, the right way to approach these things is to come at them from life experience. I could spend all day talking about phishing emails and saying, don't click a link. I could also say, hey, let's have a conversation about con artistry. This is what con artistry looks like in the real world. This is what it translates to on the internet. So if you can identify this problem in the real world, great. Now let's talk about how to get you out of it. One of the most important things I learned here was that improving security is just like encouraging people to adopt better health habits, to stop smoking, to drink less, to change their diet. There's a lot of support that needs to happen, and the support comes in the form of giving people other options, showing people how to be successful and how to make a positive change instead of telling them not to do something. I could tell my old lady gang all day, don't reuse passwords, but at no point in their lives did they ever sit down and have a computer class outside of a library um, meetup that they've arranged. These things just aren't part of their day to day. So if I tell them not to do something, they don't have the tools to solve this problem for themselves. They also need a little bit of training. Um, one of the things that we did, which was really fun, um, I started talking to them about password managers, and they were like, what the hell is this thing? Which is a perfectly reasonable response. It was also, what the hell is this thing and why does it look so messy? I don't like the way it feels when it's all messy. Okay, that's fair. I can show you how to make it less messy. But when we're talking about these security changes and these improvements and tooling, what was really cool was these ladies were like, we'll practice. If this were a sport, I'd have to go dribble basketballs and you know, not destroy my manicure, which was a great comment. But we have to practice, and practice doesn't always look the way that we, as security people, expect that practice to look. Another thing to think about, especially with um, populations that are older or who may have significant memory impairments, physical disabilities, or all kinds of other access issues that we as security people never planned for, um, everything we know might be wrong. We can run around all day and scream that those password notebooks are awful. However, if the people you're working with aren't using a password notebook at all, or the password is something that is infinitely guessable and also their home phone number because that looks like it is a complex 10-digit long passcode for a phone, that's a problem. Starting people on the path of getting from having almost nothing or being almost nowhere to figuring out where they should be going and supporting that all the way through is absolutely vital. Something that really I, I will never forget is with one of these ladies, she um, had a fall and she was in the hospital. When she came home, she had a home health care assistant. And she started noticing things weren't in places that they should have been. One of the things she learned is that home health care assistants, um, nurses, people who came in for physical therapy, at times would actually prey on the patients they worked with. How do you provide security to someone who might have a memory problem, who needs a recovery process, but is ultimately in a position where physical access to their home and to their life is also right there for the taking of another person who's meant to help them or to take care of them? The last thing that um, I think is really important our threat model as security people is not the threat model of the people that we work with, especially when they're older, especially when using technology doesn't make them feel good. And if I had spent all of my time with my neighbors over the past few years drilling them on vocabulary, asking them what a phishing attack is and why it's important to understand all of the parts of these campaigns, they would have never been successful. They would know all of the vocabulary words for attacks. They would know absolutely nothing about defense and protection and what to do. When we're working with these groups, 
I especially don't think that we should focus on telling them to learn a vocabulary lesson and to do the equivalent of an entire college course of work just to be safe on the internet. What we need to do is tell them what they can do right, what's going to take less than five minutes to make their lives better. And we need to remember that it's not a one-size-fits-all situation. This isn't something a blog post fix. This is something that ultimately requires us to invest in building relationships with people around us and giving longitudinal education experience and support. And with that being said, thank you, old lady gang, for being my surrogate grandmothers. And thanks to all of you for listening. I have the pleasure of working with our next speaker, Dr. Martin Shelton. Uh, Martin is a user experience researcher at Google on the Chrome team. Um, I, I have worked on the Chrome security team for several years now and have had the pleasure of working with Martin for a while. Um, he also writes about digital security for open news source and works with the Coral Project at the New York Times. Uh, Martin has also written some of the clearest and most accessible guides to digital security practices that I've read. So I immediately thought of him when we were planning out this conference. Uh, thank you for being here today, Martin. Hey, folks. Uh, so yeah, I'm Martin Shelton. Um, as Adrian said, I do a lot of work around uh, digital security for journalists. I got started doing a lot of this work um, in grad school where I was, I was studying the security and privacy habits of investigative journalists, um, and especially in light of the Snowden disclosures at the time. It's a very sexy topic. Um, but as we know, uh, these things come and go. There's interest uh, that waxes and wanes over time. Um, and one of the things that I have learned is that quite often the things that got journalists really excited about uh, digging into digital security habits um, are things that sometimes we also forget. It's the news cycle, the things that we take for granted about um, information that seeps into our day to day um, and motivates us to dig a little deeper. So in the case of uh, journalists and digital security, a lot, of the, a lot of the work that I do in this space um, is trying to support journalists on really basics, uh, really basics of the basics. Uh, things like, let's talk about how the internet works. Um, let's talk about how telecommunication systems work. Uh, let's talk about risk assessment. How do you figure out what needs to be protected and what kinds of measures you should put in place to protect it? A lot of the, uh, a lot of the resources that I put together or trainings that I uh, will organize are things or are, are based around, again, the fundamentals. Uh, we need to talk about the basics of authentication, uh, setting up two-factor authentication, how to uh, how to try to get more uh, try to nail down your password authentication practices. And what this means for most people is like using unique passwords. Um, what this means for most people is not uh, using short, super predictable passwords. Um, and if this all sounds really foundational, that's because it is. A lot of the, t a lot of the time when I talk to people about what they imagine um, doing this work is like, it's, uh, it sounds very cloak and dagger, where <laughs> there's a sense that, um, or they evoke some kind of image of, uh, of you know, Watergate type. <laughs> you know, we gotta, we gotta sneak around inside of a, uh, an empty garage so that we're able to have a conversation with one another in a way that's not going to be surveilled. Um, the truth is that under most circumstances, uh, my friends in the news space, you know, they have a lot of different levels of proficiency. Sometimes um, there are people who are absolute savants at figuring out, let's, let's talk about threat modeling practices and all the things that I should be doing. And then they put in the work. Um, and correspondingly, there's a lot of different circumstances for which you don't have to um, bend over backwards in order to be a little bit safer. Um, and sometimes you don't have to bend over backwards to be a lot of it safer. So it really depends on their situation. Um, but you, 
after everything, we've t we've heard a lot today around. Uh, we've heard a lot today about how exactly people um, better communicate with their community and better understand the needs of their community. Um, Eva was speaking earlier about trying to come up or meet with community partners, people who better understand uh, the community that you're working with and on their security habits than you might. Um, Jesse spoke about having your own community, the people who you do understand, people who you've invested a lot of personal time in. Um, for me, a lot of the way that I do this is from a user research perspective. Um, so for anybody who's not familiar with uh, user research, uh, user research is all about, it's, it's a systematic practice for trying to figure out um, how people use technology and then how you can design around uh, their problems and concerns. And so the problems and concerns have to be chief there. Um, and like Eva said earlier, you know, what's true in the security world is also true in the user research world. Um, you cannot assume that you know everything about your community up front. And in fact, in human computer interaction research broadly, we start with this very foundational assumption that you are not your user, that you know very, very little up front. And with that assumption that you know very little, you can come in with fresh eyes and absorb everything that you can about that community so that you can, in fact, understand them. Um, this means starting with very few assumptions. Now, what I find quite often is that uh, security recommendations uh, that I hear from people who are extraordinarily smart and well-meaning um, quite often are things that may or may not actually fit into your real-world practice. So if I, told so if I told somebody, uh, do not put a fingerprint scanner on your device, um, well, fingerprint scanner can actually be really useful if your threat model is shoulder, shoulder surfing. Um, likewise, you know, the idea of having a written notebook. Again, uh, depending on your threat model, this might actually be more appropriate tactic than, um, than doing nothing at all. So after all is said and done, these are really simple practices that we can adopt, uh, but we have to be really contextually sensitive. We have to understand the community that we're working with. And user research is one way of doing that, not the only way, but one way of doing that. Some of the methods that this can involve are things like, let's uh, conduct interviews, let's conduct surveys, let's conduct focus groups, let's gather feedback um, from the communities with whom we work. Some of the people in this audience actually have participated in some of my research um, as experts or also as community members. And after everything, this is, uh, this is how I gather feedback in order to better understand what kind of communities that I want to help. And this is, uh, uh, this is the only way that I know how to do this reliably. And so communicating about security needs at the end of the day is not really uh, just about security needs. It's actually about everything else. Uh, it's really about understanding people's context and then how those security uh, solutions might be able to fit into their context. And as a consequence, I think that security recommendations should and can be uh, some, something that can help people to get their work done, the things that they care about done. And so one of the examples uh, that I like to bring up about this is uh, news organizations um, will occasionally ping me, or journalists will occasionally ping me and say, um, Martin, I don't want to give away my personal phone number to use Signal, um, an encrypted messaging app. One of the things that I recommend is you can, uh, for example, set up a secondary signal phone number using uh, Google Voice. Uh, if you're in the United States, um, you can also set it up with an application like Twilio. Um, this takes <laughs> a really long time um, on the Twilio end of things, um, but it can be a solution for your problem. And so uh, I've written guides with the help of 
uh, some of my friends here in the security community, including Harlow Holmes, uh, who is going to be speaking next. Um, but this entire, this entire effort has been uh, primarily about gathering feedback, both from experts as well as community members, and trying to better understand their needs. And so I encourage everybody uh, to look into user research as one potential way to systematically uh, better understand the needs of the communities with whom you work. Um, and if that's not an option, go find those experts. Go make sure that you're pulling in feedback, at least from the experts. And there are a lot of circumstances for which uh, getting experts, uh, expert feedback instead of individually gathering feedback uh, is one of the best options, especially when we're talking about at-risk groups. Sometimes it's, it can be actively dangerous to somebody's health or well-being to talk to them directly, especially if they're under surveillance, direct surveillance. Uh, talking to experts who are able to act as a proxy for those groups can be really helpful as well. And I'm happy to be uh, your proxy when speaking to a news community. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Martin. Next, we'll be hearing from Harlow Holmes. Uh, Harlow is the director of Newsroom Digital Security at the Freedom of the Press Foundation. Uh, Harlow helps journalists learn how to secure their newsrooms as well as secure communications with their sources. Thank you for being here today, Harlow. Clicker. Nice. Thanks. OK. Oops. Back. Hi, um, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm carrying my laptop because it not only contains my notes, but is also a security blanket of mine. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, my work and my research recently. Um, I'm going to tell this story in three chapters. One is more about the meta aspects of the digital security training space. Uh, the second chapter is probably a frank discussion that some of you might not like. And then third is really, really fun, um, hopefully, uh, about uh, how I've actually been applying a lot of these topics in the field, as we say. So real quick background, Freedom of the Press Foundation is, we like to call ourselves, a 21st century organization for 21st century journalists. And so this comprises um, technical, uh, uh, technical support in terms of um, software, uh, bespoke software, uh, digital security trainings, uh, consultations, etc. Um, obviously, a very, very loud and uh, and proud um, legal advocacy department, um, and uh, um, and also uh, journalist advocacy. Um, and yeah, this uh, uh, training is what uh, I do and head up in the New York office. Um, I have a background in digital security by way of mobile development for human rights defenders, which was a petrifying job, and I'm kind of happy I don't do that anymore. Um, but uh, over the years, uh, I've uh, gotten to, to really come to know uh, very, very intimately a number of developers of primarily open source tools in the space that are saving lives every day. Um, also have uh, strong relationships with, I guess, San Francisco types like yourself um, in order to probably, or like, you know, make some inroads in um, uh, influencing policy on behalf of the extreme populations that we serve. And this is how we win. Um, Collaboration within the InfoSec community, as Martin had just mentioned, um, when uh, you know uh, he wrote this really, really awesome how-to guide on how to you know like uh, have a pseudonymous signal identity. That actually, uh, or, um, and uh, I helped collaborate in writing you know the pseudocode you know just to show people how it's done. That actually changed a lot, and it's also one example of like you know similar projects that we all do in this space. Um, we we keep in touch and we work on little projects together and take people by surprise. Um, another thing that is important uh, is in, uh, how we do our work, um, especially from um, my position, um, working with so many journalists, is to keep 
uh, uh, keep lines of communication open with the press. If something is broken, we're the ones who, you know, get on the, the phone with, I don't know, Forbes reporters, for instance, and explain not only like what has happened, but also um, use our uh, use our ability to narrativize it in order to establish a narrative that we hope is responsible, technically correct, um, and uh, ultimately accessible. And it's actually really, really cool when, you know, like I will go into somebody's office and do a digital security training, and then like the next week they're writing an article about the stuff that we talked about. So um, this is actually like a very uh, easily uh, understandable, like one-to-one -one direct relationship straight from, you know, our corner of information security uh, and open source activism and what you actually see in, you know, your favorite website of choice. Um, we also uh, encourage to meet developers in the middle. So especially because um, I uh, come from a, a development background, uh, knowing how to like uh, file a bug report, you know, uh, file a, or uh, open a GitHub issue, or you know, do a pull request or something like that, in order to help developers out, um, is a really really great way of you know like uh, translating what you have to say to end users who have never seen GitHub before and putting that directly in the hands or in the minds of the developers on these tools. And it's actually really, really encouraging to know that um, <clears throat> just the way that our corner of the internet works, like if we did want to see something happen in a, an app like Signal or Mailvelope or whatever, like it's really just like, it, it's very, very easy to get these developers' attention and to make sure that they understand the urgency. Okay, so that's the end of chapter one. Um, so I did want to uh, talk about uh, threat modeling. <clears throat> and normally, we, when we teach threat, like, threat modeling, and I'll go into our specific like, metrics for that, um, when we usually teach threat modeling, we uh, tell the people that we're training that they have these adversaries out there in the world. And of course, you know, we, we try to uh, make it less vague, have them flesh it out, understand that there is, you know, the, um, the jealous X uh, adversary, and then there's the three letter agency adversary. And knowing the difference between the two is really going to save you a lot of worry. Um, but I also want to mention that we are your adversary. Um, there are a lot of things that people do in this area of the country um, it, regarding policies, especially regarding uh, um, user privacy, data retention, uh, encryption, and the political weight behind that, that you know, are decisions that we, we aren't necessarily happy with, and we will come and get you. So please continue to listen to us when we say how important um, these things are. And I'm going to kind of walk through a couple of examples so you understand that. So, ooh, all right. Uh, a lot of my time is actually spent on a really, really awesome project that is funded by a, a, like a, a, a variety of organizations um, in partnership with the Ford Foundation, with Sundance, um, with uh, this other really, really excellent group called the Doc Society to work with documentary filmmakers on their often bizarre and bespoke uh, digital security needs. And so um, over the past, I guess, like, two years that I've been on this project, I've gotten to work with a huge number of, of filmmakers um, of different kind of capacities with different resources and do, in addition to like uh, using this as an opportunity to hone my training skill set, I'm also um, using it as an opportunity to get kind of like an anthropological overview of what this community is like. So digital uh, filmmakers are all of these things, they are awesome, they are incredibly busy, um, they're really, really innovative, and they'll pick up something and repurpose it, and then, like, you know, that's something that in and of itself is, like, Oscar-worthy. Um, that said, they're not digital security experts, and they expect things to just work. So, we teach, uh, um, ultimately, like, the, the point of this initiative that we're working on is um, to put, you know, uh, starting from threat modeling, which is a very, very important methodology to learn, but putting tools in uh, filmmakers' hands so they can, uh, one, uh, protect, uh, you know, like, these assets. One, protecting themselves, protecting their footage, often which the footage is, you know, entirely unique. And if anything happens to that footage, if it's destroyed, then that's a huge problem. 
Um, learning how to protect uh, like people who you interview with, fixers, etc. Um, all because uh, and realizing that like these funding organizations that work with these filmmakers that actually write checks and uh, fulfill grants uh, need to expect filmmakers in order to take care of this due diligence beforehand, lest they um, put themselves in danger, put their subjects in danger, or you know more commonly they just lose some money on you know like a production that goes way out of budget. So, these are some types. Um, the uh, community filmmaker is a, uh, uh, that's usually like the independent person who's doing a, an like maybe doing an investigation for the first time um, with, you know, not only with their camera, but also using next generation tools. And so there's two things that I, or three things that takeaways for working with a com community filmmaker type. Um, is one, this is a really, really great place to start off with the crypto party. It gets people talking about their preoccupations with digital security and like learn little tips in order to bring them up to speed. Um, also, because their budgets are co so cash strapped, you have to think about like whether or not encryption or like actually encrypting certain footage is going to be feasible because it might write too many times to their cards and make the cards like unusable. Um, so there's always these toss-ups that we teach people in this class. Um, then there's like scouts or like location type people. Actually, this is one class where uh, uh, of filmmaker where um, signal came in to, came in handy so so often. Like you know, how do you communicate with the fixer if you're in a, like a weird place on Earth um, and you definitely don't want that person to have their phone number in your you know in in your contacts. Um, uh, also, like uh, another really fun use of Signal um, was, or has to do with interviewing. Like we always say, use Signal because it's end-to-end -end encrypted or whatever, which is great. But if you're a filmmaker and you have an interview that you actually need to record, you need to capture, how do you teach someone to um, safely record an end-to-end -end encrypted conversation without like introducing more vulnerabilities to their device? So um, I could go on and on forever, but I have what I've gone. 13 seconds over, um, and uh, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions. So. Thank you so much, Harlow. Del Harvey is our next speaker, and she's the Vice President of Trust and Safety at Twitter. Uh, she's also known as Twitter's uh, resident troll hunter, which I think is a fabulous uh, job title. Del's background includes hunting pedophiles, which is crazy awesome and uh, something pretty badass that I admire. Del has been at Twitter since 2008, where she was employee number 25. Uh, in her role at Twitter, she faces down challenges with abuse, spam, and user rights on the platform. Del, thank you very much for coming to speak with us. Thank you. Hi there. I would introduce myself, but it was already done for me. I was very pleased with myself, just to be completely honest with you, about coming up with the whole personal protective equipment, product policy and enforcement pun up there. That was pretty much the highlight. Also, that's my daughter, so enjoy her personal protective equipment there. So you've heard about advocating for a pretty wide range of different groups, uh, high-risk groups, and you've heard about how you don't really know what you're doing because you don't really know those groups. And at least in those instances, the folks who were talking earlier generally at least had an idea of what group they were talking about. And what I'm here to talk about is how I try to do this for literally everyone. Not literally everyone, but everyone who has used Twitter or who uses Twitter or who might use Twitter at some point in the future. So at least a fair number of people. Everyone's favorite quote from the InfoSec side of the house. So there are obviously challenges when you're advocating for high-risk groups, even when they're in the known knowns bucket, when you know who they are and what they're trying to do and what their risk profile is and what could go wrong. It's still a challenge because there's all sorts of things that you have to do in terms of going to them and making sure that you're solving the problems that they want solved first and all that sort of thing. And 
With known unknowns, where you maybe know that you don't know what the group needs, you can go out and find people who do, and talk to them, and get their feedback, and make sure that you're not making terrible mistakes when you try to solve problems. I have generally found that one of the most challenging situations to find yourself in is figuring out how to advocate for your unknown unknowns. You don't know who they are, or what they're doing, why they're doing it, what they're trying to avoid have happen, but you just sort of know they're out there. So I guess they're unknown, known unknown unknowns, something like that, stacking unknowns. And you know, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can try to address this. For me, for how we've tried to handle it at Twitter, it comes down to three main areas, which are product, policy, and enforcement. It's all coming full circle with that title slide. On the product side, I will say that hands down, if you, are not, if you are not of product yourself, but working with them, it is incredibly important that you start out by relationship building. Because it is so useful if you are positioning yourself as there to remove roadblocks and help make the final product a better one versus saying, hey, look at all the horrible things that you didn't think of that could happen here. Everything is going to be ruined and you will be, be to blame for it which might point out why they want to talk to you, but will probably make them somewhat averse to like coming to you again or looking forward to the conversation. If you can instead say, hey, love the product that you're working on. I see a few small things that we could tweak. We could do A, B, or C, and, or even just A or B, and that would address it. Could we try that? It becomes a much healthier conversation. And it's a better way of sort of demonstrating your value within that conversation, too. It's also worth noting that, you know, no matter who the audience is, whether it's within product, whether you are a product, there's a bunch of straightforward protections that you can try to advocate for, even if you don't know who the person is who's going to be using those protections. Things like on Twitter, block or mute or protected accounts or two-factor and even options like the sensitive content interstitial or the quality filter, things where the person who's on Twitter can choose what their experience is. And it's also worth thinking about what I generally refer to as unintended exposure and ways that you can reduce that. For example, when Twitter started hosting images, we made the decision to strip out all metadata from the image so that we weren't in this situation where, you know, somebody has a new smartphone and they're uploading pictures of, you know, their house or their kid doing something cute and they don't realize that encoded in that image is the latitude and longitude of exactly where the picture was taken and if we don't strip that out, anybody who knows how to access it can now see exactly where they live. And that's one of those things where people are like, wait, wait, there's what? Like, I still regularly hear that that's a surprise to people, so that means that maybe we should just not make them have to know that, and we should just take steps to make sure that they don't have to deal with the issues that could pretty easily stem from that. Now, for policy areas, planning for the unknown unknowns pretty much involves among other things, planning for edge cases, in addition to setting baseline policies meant to protect marginalized and frequently targeted individuals and groups. The qualifier there is at scale, and a lot of the companies here know about scale, edge cases become way more common. We have hundreds of millions of tweets per day, so that could mean we have hundreds of edge cases a day if you're just talking about a one in a million chance. And when you're dealing with that level of scale, it means that those edge cases can't just be something where you're like, well, we'll come up with a way of handling that when it pops up. It's a little late then. So you have to come up with something beforehand. You have to at least come up with a process beforehand for handling the unexpected. So you can only ever expect the unexpected. Some of the specific protections that we've tried to put in place from a policy perspective in some of those sort of we aren't quite sure what could go wrong, but we know something could go wrong, uh, would include things like, you know, we have support for pseudonymity on Twitter. You don't have to use your real name, your legal name, your birth name, any variant upon any of those. You can use the names that you choose. The, we also have, for example, we have a data licensing business for public Twitter data, but we actually have explicit policy carve-outs prohibiting the use of that information, even though it's public, for anything related to surveillance or targeting individuals. Because, again, it's public information, but we don't think that's how it should be used. And we have a pretty robust, what's the next piece? 
enforcement process around all of those things and a use case review process that comes into play too. So I have learned over the years that nothing makes people who have to do enforcement happier than being asked to deal with tons of edge cases in gray areas at scale. No, anything makes them happier than having to deal with tons of edge cases in gray areas at scale, actually. And that's totally understandable, but part of the reason that it's super, super important that you partner really closely with the people who are doing your enforcement, if it's not within your own organization, is because that partnership is key to figuring out where you're screwing up. And the chances are very good that you're screwing up somewhere. On Twitter, it's very easy for us to find out if we're screwing up how we enforce our policies uh, because people are in my at replies telling me how dumb we are and how we made so many dumb decisions and they can't imagine what we were thinking. So it's a really easy way to just get that just crisp feedback circle. Um, <laughs> And you know what? We actually look at that stuff. They are, not, they are not always right. We were not always being dumb. Sometimes we were being dumb, though. And even in instances where maybe we were right about what we did, it helps highlight areas where we failed to communicate clearly why we did what we did or didn't do. Because if there's a failure in what people's expectations are, that's still a failure on our part, and that's still something we have to address. So figuring out how to get that feedback loop, even if it's not your personal at replies, and I would generally recommend it not being your personal at replies if you, if you have the choice. Uh, you know, putting that into place is really useful. And if you screwed up, hopefully you want to fix it and prevent it from happening again. This is the dream. We all, we all live for these, these goals. And we've taken some really specific steps around that, at least at Twitter, things like, creating cultural context trainings that are given to anybody who does enforcement around abuse reports, for example, and making sure that they're targeting known edge cases with that, creating a mechanism that makes it really easy for us to quickly send out updates to those trainings. If something comes up, we start seeing a new attack vector, we start seeing a new type of harassment or abuse, making it really easy to push those updates out and get everybody up to speed on what we're doing now, for example. Uh, improving our appeals process, though we still have work to do there. It's something that we're spending a lot of time and energy thinking about, including how to make sure that we're continuing to support pseudonymity and limiting how much user data we collect from people who really want to limit how much they're giving to us. And finally, developing escalation channels and processes for handling situations when there is a risk of imminent harm or danger to someone. So in other words, not just sort of saying, well, someone needs an imminent danger here, but the process says that we go do this thing, and sorry, like making sure that there's still a way to get those situations escalated so that they can be reviewed by the appropriate folks and we can figure out what we should be doing. And you know, look, maybe you already do all of these things. Maybe all of this is super old hat to you. If so, awesome. I would love to connect, share best practices, talk about how we can continue spreading the gospel of these things. If not, maybe you don't do any of this, or you only do some of it, and you want to start doing the rest. And in that case, I'd still love to connect with you. And then maybe we can see how we can help and, and help share information and, and make this better. And if it isn't relevant to you at all, I hope you enjoyed the picture of my daughter in a hat and the Donald Rumsfeld quote. So across the board, though, thank you guys so much. I hope this was at least mildly interesting. That's the bar I tried to set. And I'll turn it over to the panel. We're now going to have a moderated panel with our speakers, all of whom are going to come back out here to have a discussion. Um, Shira Frankel will be moderating the panel. Shira covers cybersecurity for the New York Times. And previously, she spent a decade in the Middle East serving as a foreign correspondent, reporting for BuzzFeed, NPR, the Times of London, and others. Thank you for leading the discussion, Shira.
Great, thank you everyone. One of the things we were just talking about backstage was how nice it was that our panelists seemed to kind of be in consensus about their message, about what the important you know, considerations of security are and what people back home should be taking away from our discussion today. So I wanted to open up the chat just now with asking you all, what do you think, when you're trying to get your team to consider security at the very beginning of their product development, when they come to you guys with an idea and they're excited, What's the first thing you say to them when you want them to consider the diverse audience that's going to be receiving these products? And sorry, I, 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 I'm not going to call on anyone. You guys should just speak up. <laughs> um, unless we don't speak up. And then we don't call on <laughs> unless yes. I get blank stares and then. The, the first thing that I typically ask for is the functionality. Um, when we're talking about building new product stuff, I want to know, I want to know what it's supposed to do what the user expects it to do, and then I want to know really who we're ideally designing things for so we can go and root out any biases that might exist in the process. But I always want to know how it works, because if it works in a way that is potentially way too confusing or only speaks to the engineer who is designing it, we already have a problem. And we need to really make sure that we are digging to the core problem we're trying to solve and not solving for some other thing that's been imagined. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's always just, what are we doing? Why are we doing it this way? And what do we expect out of it? And then we can talk about like actually calling up friends and telling them to hammer on it for a little bit. Sometimes I find that I'll be, I'll be told, you know, we've, they'll come to me and just say, you know what, we want you to tell us what could go wrong here? We've thought about it. We're pretty sure it's totally fine. Like, what could go wrong? And I find that sometimes just asking them to start from the assumption that someone has died as a result of this product that they're launching. And this is only when they ask me to do this to them, to be clear. This is not generally <laughs> how I provide feedback. Just close. Uh, no, it's, is, you know, OK, look, you guys came up with this. Somebody died as a result of this. How did it happen? And I find that for people who do not spend their time thinking about the worst that could happen, for people where catastrophization is perhaps not their watchword, uh, that they're often really bright people. And if you put them at the other end and they have to sort of Sherlock Holmes it to figure out how did this, how did this take place, then they're like, OK, OK, somebody's dead. OK, let's see here. It was probably with a candlestick in the library. And it was Colonel <laughs> Mustard. Like, you know, and it's funny because now I actually regularly will have conversations with people who are saying, you know, I thought about this product, and I was thinking about how somebody could die from it. And <laughs> the people who overhear this and don't have context are probably alarmed. But, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a, it's really useful sometimes for you to help facilitate that mindset shift around where they're approaching the problem from. Hmm. Yeah. I think I come to this from a slightly different angle as a user researcher, where a lot of the people who are approaching me with various uh, product-related design challenges that they might have in mind um, are probably only approaching me because I am the privacy and security uh, user researcher on Chrome. Um, and so chances are they've already identified a potential series of concerns. And as a consequence, uh, it makes my job a little easier. Um, there are also a lot of institutional controls in place at Google. And so I, uh, where we have a wonderful team, Adrian um, is on this team where we uh, focus on privacy and security, user experience um, issues that are likely to affect Chrome as well as other products. Uh, and after all is said and done, um, a lot of that thinking has been outsourced to um, many, many brilliant people who I work with. And so I don't have to deal with that quite as much as, uh, <laughs> yeah. I occasionally have to deal with this problem, but the more common scenario for me is that uh, either a startup or a company comes to me and says, you know, what kind of privacy and security policies should we have uh, in order to make you not yell at us? when we launch. Uh, and the other most common conversation that I have is, so 
We're building this product just for activists in this one particularly vulnerable population, and we haven't really done anything about security or learned anything about the population and what could possibly go wrong. Um, so I spend a lot of time yelling. Sometimes it works. Um, but occasionally, I end up in these conversations where I'm trying to convince the people who are building the product that their product is a bad idea. <laughs> that it is poorly thought out and they should stop. Uh, and uh, the most common scenario there is usually we are, uh, you know, we want to build a platform just for high-risk activists who are worried about being watched by the government. I'm like, how about you don't put them all in one place? <laughs> Maybe that would be nice. We want to build a, uh, a tool, a secure communications tool, just for high-risk users who are being watched by governments. What? So that when you uh, confiscate their phones, um, the uh, government will see this tool on their phone and they'll say, ah, I see, you are a dissident, and throw them directly into jail. Yes. It's not like that hasn't happened before. Um, so I spend a lot of time telling people just not to do things at all. Uh, <laughs> sometimes because people could die. <laughs> um. I also, uh, I, I highly agree with that there. Um, there are many cases where things just do not, or, and never are going to work as promised, um, simply because the use case that, uh, the, the use case is entirely like at odds with the technologies themselves. So once again, speaking specifically about like filmmaking stuff, like everyone is, everyone in, you know, InfoSec is real in love with, uh, I mean, as we should be, uh, in end-to-end -end encryption and everything gets encrypted and like we have all these like really, really great tools or whatever um, and they are great, but like there's a huge difference between, you know, like the, what we would encrypt and what, you know, and like a compact flash with like, you know, terabytes of, of data um, and so, uh, not only that, but then there's also, you know, like duress situations where you don't have time to encrypt all the things. You actually have to go right now. Um, so uh, that's something that I'm always, um, I'm, I'm becoming more and more sensitive to. Actually, really quick follow-up. All of this just made me, it just reminded me of a large number of, ser of situations where people have approached me um, to ask, hey, can we do research on X topic, um, and it made me think, this is actually a really bad idea. Um, <laughs> it's like, what if we invert our model from starting with technology, which is often what happens. We've built this thing um, that we'd like to do user research with. How do we find those participants? How do we find those users? Um, instead of doing that, we really ought to be doing more of a ground up approach where we instead start with, okay, what are the needs for the communities that we care about? and then try to build around those needs. It's like a reverse engineered threat model. Right, right. There's a habit of saying, if you just do this one thing, everyone's gonna be safe online. And I'm wondering, you know, I've seen two camps here. I've seen the one camp that's saying, let's have a catch-all. Let's have a catch-all policy that we can roll out to everyone and say, just use this product or just adopt these three habits and it's gonna affect the greatest number of people, we'll secure the greatest number of people. And then there are those who advocate against and say, no, 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 this is super dangerous. By giving people a catch-all, you're, you know, you're essentially creating a system where everybody becomes vulnerable. Um, I'm curious where you guys fall on this, what approach you take, and what, where, how you think the conversation should really be structured around this. Um, I, uh, one thing that I do teach in, maybe not in Digital Security 101, but in like a little bit more advanced, I do this with a number of groups, um, is I actually uh, I show people a matrix where on, you know, our y-axis is, uh, um, so let's take like an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app. Which one should I use? On your y-axis, you're going to evaluate it on um, whether or not like it actually works, whether or not there are design choices baked into it that make it, um, that once again run counter to your goal of actually it, uh, having a private conversation. Um, you know, like how do people treat metadata or et cetera. Uh, and then we have our, our um, our x-axis, which is actually just all about accessibility, um, because obviously, like, you know, uh, I, I guess, like, 
we can have a great conversation, um, but if you can't reach, you know, uh, members of your family on that, if you can't reach, you know, other friends or random people that you need to talk to in your job as, you know, like a journalist or whatever, then that's going to affect where it goes. And so ultimately, um, you're teaching people to make choices. And the reason why you're teaching people to make choices is because of, you know, the limitations of reach. But it's also because, like, I don't know where we're all going to be, like, you know, two years from now when, uh, you know, like, <laughs> Signal is broken uh, and, uh, or, uh, you know, WhatsApp is closed down or whatever. We want people to have these metrics already. Um, so whatever it is, they can make these decisions. I tend to be pretty opinionated about what we're trying to solve for with the catch-alls because what I find in those conversations is this feeling that security is a binary. It's, it's a yes or a no thing. In reality, security is a really complex spectrum and we can make incremental improvements here and there but having this kind of absolutist idea of yes or no, and these three things are the things, um, to me just isn't the right way to look at this. What would be an improvement or a rule that we would set for everyone makes a lot of generalized, generalized um, decisions about who everyone might be. We can tell everyone to use two-factor authentication. Two members of my old lady gang have struggles with their thumbs and going back and forth with that home button to um, put in that six-digit code within the 30-second time period that it needs to be actually entered into the box. It's much more about creating a process and that decision-making paradigm and way less about use this product over here. All the products are fundamentally insecure. If they're all 99.9% secure, why is the security about the product and not the process of getting to do the thing you need done, done in the right way with the least risk possible? All right, so I am going to bring a dissenting opinion. <laughs> ¿Por qué no los dos? Uh, as a person who spends a lot of time giving security advice and uh, writing content for EFF's uh, Guide to Privacy and Security, which is uh, Surveillance Self-Defense, which you can see at ssd.eff.org. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about advice which is applicable to most people. And there are a few things that you can tell people to do that would be helpful to the majority of people. The most important thing is to frame those things in a realistic way. Say, everybody has individual privacy and security needs, but here are a few things which are fairly easy to do, which will be helpful for most people most of the time. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to solve your specific problem. But if you don't want to get down into threat modeling and figuring out what your specific problem is, this will probably cover you. And I think that that is a useful set of advice to have, and I want to advocate for that. Um, Beyond that, telling people, look at your specific set of problems and do a lot of threat modeling and think about exactly what tools are right for solving the problems that you have is excellent advice. But not everybody has that kind of time and not everybody has the inclination and we need to make room for the people who don't want to spend that much time thinking about it. Yeah, I feel like when I hear somebody uh, when I hear somebody do the use Tor, use Signal advice, it often feels like it works 60% of the time every time. Um, which I don't know what what this what this question often what this question means to me is um, if we want to give advice uh, universally, then quite often uh, it's going to be advice that is useful to a lot of people in a lot of contexts. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's universally applicable, and so what I try to do. Whenever, uh, whenever I'm, I get somebody on the hook for a moment, um, is gauge how on the hook they are. Uh, that is, how much do I think that I can bring them with me into the security rabbit hole? And if if it's uh, if it seems like you know there's only mild interests, like do these really basic things. Um, these are really foundational, easy things that you can do. Um, I encourage you to also read this and this and this um, if there's time. Um, and usually those are security guides from places like the Electronic Frontier Foundation or to uh, read up on um, materials from Freedom of the Press. Um, 
I've written things in the space that sometimes I'll point people to. Um, after all is said and done, trying to give people enough guidance to be able to get started uh, while, and using the things that they're asking about, things like Signal or password managers, as a hook. But then after that, um, depending on how involved they are in this process, how much investment they have in trying to go further, it might be that like that's where it ends, and it might be that I continue to have conversations with them. I would agree. I think I'm I'm in a very similar camp to to Ava in terms of you know look there are some baseline things like you know hey maybe don't type your Twitter login credentials into a random site on the internet that isn't Twitter. Like I I feel okay giving that as general guidance to people. You should avoid that. Uh, maybe try not to use the same password at a ton of different places, or at least have like tiered passwords if you must do it in terms of you know your pizza login and. Your, your, you know, Excel help forum login, maybe have the same password if you're less concerned about those than your email. I may have an Excel help forum login. Might be a specific example there. But um, at the same time, I think that what we try to do, and one way of addressing this, is to just have, similarly to, to your point, have tiered <coughs> levels of security that users can add on, that people can say, you know what, I thought I was good with just my password and login, but I kind of want to add a phone number to this account, or I kind of want to make it so somebody can't reset my password without knowing the email address associated with the account, or I want to be able to add two-factor, or I want to be able to add X, Y, Z. And even in situations where maybe you identify that somebody is being targeted or you identify that somebody has had their password compromised, those are opportunities to say, hey, you might want to think about adding this additional security preference to how you're using this product because this thing happened. And you know, ideally, you'd get people to use exactly the right methods for them before anything happened. But I've already resigned myself to the fact that people may not always be reading the help pages that I carefully write. So it, it may not always be uh, before the thing happens that you can evangelize, but at least when the thing happens, definitely take advantage of that to evangelize, if at all possible. So a quick one. Um, if there is going to be a catch-all, if there is one thing people watching at home say, God, just give me one easy thing I can do. What is it? Is it a password manager? Is it, you know, just use Signal? Like, what's, if you've got, like, 30 seconds, you're in a lift with your driver, and you've got to tell them, like, one security thing that they can incorporate right away, what's the thing you roll out? Password manager is pretty evergreen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty much team password manager for life. Don't talk crap about them in front of me. <laughs> We're not going to be friends. <laughs> because on one aspect, if you get someone using the password manager perfectly and they have immaculate passwords, there's an improvement. On the other, if they don't do that, they still kind of have a catalog of their threat surface or their attack surface on the internet. And I'm pretty OK with that, too. Well, since we've already covered password managers, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with two-factor. And then um, if you can explain the difference between SMS two-factor and an app uh, or something like a YubiKey, do it and explain that there are, there are tiers, there are levels to uh, how committed you want to be to two-factor. And here are some things that you can do. Uh, also, and knowing that. Ultimately, even with the two-factor and the you know and the the strong passphrases that are total unique, um, you're only as good as your "I forgot my password" uh, <laughs> settings are. Oh yes. Mm. Yeah. 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 Also, your uh, the answers to your security questions should not be real. <laughs> Lie to yeah. your security questions. Tell tiny yeah. stories in them. <laughs> Has that been fixed yet in Facebook? I remember like a, a bit ago. Um, was Alex. The, not, <laughs> like, there were still security questions, but they weren't changeable for a certain group of people, maybe mm. having to do with when they signed on to the service. And this was before security culture. So uh, obviously, everyone was telling the truth in their security questions back in 2005 when that was like not a thing. Anywho's. Yeah, I always randomize my passwords for, uh, or my uh, security questions in my password manager and then store them there. Yep. Um, to, since, since we've got authentication covered, I guess, um, and, I'm, and I'm making Dell's life really hard. It's like at the end of the line. Not um, the first time this has happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to go with just updates. 
updates on all of your devices. Mm. Um, yeah, Cooper likes that one. Um, <laughs> just because there are so, so, so many um, hardworking people who are trying to, they're desperately trying to push you these updates. Um, and all it's about is not only this feature request, but also um, patching vulnerabilities. It's an extremely straightforward way to uh, protect yourself very, without, without very little, with very little effort at all. So. Password managers, authentication, updates. I'm going to go with, you know what, make sure that you go through all of those accounts that you actually use and like and make sure your backup email addresses and contact information, all that sort of stuff is still up to date because the number of people who I know who have lost access even to primary email accounts because the backup email that they had on it was at a site that is, they never use that email, it got uh, given up. It got rotated back into use or the like, and somebody else grabbed it with the sole purpose of compromising their primary account is not a small number. And just making sure that you know, you've got that phone number associated, you've got an email address that you are in control of, that you know how to access, that your security questions are uh, fixed on and all that jazz, take that step. Um, I want to close with asking you about some of the more unique threat modeling that you've had to do, some of the unique cases. We, a lot of the purpose of this conference was to say that, you know, the audience for which we're creating security is not uniform. Um, they're not homogenous, so how do we create solutions for them? And I think it'd be useful to hear about some of the more sort of interesting cases that you've had to, I know, I know some of you have brought this up in your talks already, but if there are any other cases that you looked at and you thought, wow, this presented an incredibly specific challenge that we had to, you know, we had to workshop, we had to figure out how to answer this. I totally have one. And it's, it's my, one of my favorite stories because it was completely inadvertent on, on the part of the threat, so to speak, which is back in, in 2009, so back in the dawn of time with Twitter, uh, the trending topic algorithm was a very simple algorithm. It was what's being said the most, minus some things like the or ah or what have you. And it was completely, we, we, it got broken by teenage girls. And it got broken by teenage girls in a really robust and significant way. Because what was happening is they would tweet to whichever celebrity or musician or artist that they were a fan of. And they would just tweet, for example, hashtag Justin Bieber, I love you, come to insert country here or insert city here. And that's all they would tweet hundreds and hundreds of times per day. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't automated. You know, we put in duplicate matching, so then they started typing, hashtag Justin Bieber, come to X, we love you, one, two, three, <laughs> 787. And they had other people who they followed who were doing the same thing. And these were real people on their real accounts where their timelines must have just been exhortations to Justin Bieber to please come to their location because they loved him. <laughs> So trending topics suddenly turned into basically the Justin Bieber, please come to blank, we love you. Column. Column, which was not its original intended purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so we made some shifts. You know what, we're gonna shift it to not just be like what's being talked about the most. We'll do like changes in velocity, right? Like all of a sudden this topic is being talked about more than it usually is. So they started seeing that Justin Bieber was falling off the trending topics, and they were like, this can't be. So they started coming up with new hashtags for it. So it was theoretically a different topic. And it turned back into the Justin Bieber, I love you, come to this location <laughs> trending column. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really fascinating because it wasn't like they were trying to do anything bad. They had no ill intent whatsoever. They just wanted Justin Bieber to come perform, you guys. Like, that was all. <laughs> These were believers, they were passionate. I love that passion and enthusiasm, but it was breaking our shit. <laughs> so we ended up, it was actually a really helpful way to start figuring out how to avoid that sort of basic manipulation and gamification of the trend, but it was not an expected threat vector. Now, I suspect teenage girls for everything. <laughs> and, and that has actually held me in pretty good stead. I'd say the most interesting threat modeling situation scenario I've had to work on um, 
was a couple of years ago with, again, my old lady gang. Um, figuring out a way to help people get back into accounts when they have memory issues, or they can completely lose their concept of identity and they need an identity like re-verification process for their own brains is an extremely difficult thing because there are lots of things that we would say as security people or that other security people might say are terrible, but they're actually the thing that worked in, in our particular situation. Things like writing down a clue to part of a password in a safe place in the house. Well, I've been told many times, but that's fundamentally insecure because what if they don't know about how to physically secure the thing? What's safe to us when we're like, oh crap, let's hide the PGP keys from the NSA is totally different from, I don't know who I am, but my computer can help me work through this particular episode if I do it right. Um, Touch ID can be helpful here sometimes. It ended up being part of our scenario for recovery. But again, if you have 10 attempts before the device wipes itself, or you tried too many times and you have to come up with the password again, you're still at the same problem. And it was something that ended up being a little bit of a game. We had some good practice runs, but also a little terrifying to see kind of how much of what we build is, is built with this mindset that everyone's brain and eyeballs and physical parts are all going to work the same way and have the same capabilities. Any other quick ones? No? All right, we have gone 25 seconds over, but I think we've gotten a good start to the day's sessions. I'd like to thank all our fantastic panelists. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Thank you to all of you for coming here today. Uh, this is a wonderful panel. Uh, we'll now be breaking for 15 minutes, so please come back and get excited about our next session.
everyone. We're going to get started in about four minutes. So if you can start finding your way back to your seats, it would be great. Nobody hears me. If you can hear me with the mic, clap once. If you can hear me with the mic, clap twice. If you can hear me with the mic, clap three times. Thank you all. We're going to get started in three minutes. If you can please find your way back to your seats, that would be lovely. Please take your seats. The session is now starting. All right, everybody, I will start talking in 30 seconds. We're going to start having people come up on stage. All right, everyone, we're going to get started now. <laughs> I know. Our, um, our beloved chairperson is over there having a conversation. Good morning, everybody. Hi. So there's a really interesting thing that happens when you're working on tech and policy or ethics. What it means is, well, there's actually a lot of interesting things, but what it means in part is that you are in two homogeneous fields at the exact same time, and you have to struggle to be taken seriously and listened to <laughs> by both of them. And I'm pretty lucky to have worked with actually a lot of people who have broken through barriers in order to make their selves heard and make themselves successful in those fields. And a few of them are going to be on stage now speaking with you and talking about their work. And we're going to start with Jennifer Granick. Uh, Jennifer is the Surveillance and Cybersecurity Council with the American Civil Liberties Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. Um, and in 2015, one of my favorite facts about Jennifer um, was her black hat keynote called Life Cycle of a Revolution, 
which received a ton of attention and really, I think, highlighted some of the really big issues in these fields. And I think she's going to do some of that today for all of you. Jennifer Granick. Thank you, everybody. And um, thank you for coming. And to the organizers, thanks for putting on this show. Um, we're only just begun, and it's really been fantastic already. So uh, last year, I wrote a book. And it's called American Spies, Modern Surveillance, Why You Should Care, and What to Do About It. And thank you. You don't have to read it, but if you could buy it, that would be great. <laughs> and in the book, um, I wanted to try to highlight a couple of things that even experts had learned from the Edward Snowden disclosures. Because it's easy for the big picture to get lost with all of the news. And there were three things that really stood out to me, even as somebody who studies this field. And the first one is that increasingly, modern surveillance is mass surveillance. Um, we used to target people for surveillance because of their political uh, opinions or their religion or their race. And now the mainstream is being surveilled. The second point was that secrecy is hiding this fact from the general public. And the secrecy takes two forms. One is secrecy that's part of wordplay or games that the government plays in order to pretend that it's not doing surveillance that it is doing. And the other kind of secrecy is secrecy enforced in the law, whether it's classification or sealing of surveillance orders, um, secrecy that's um, built into the process and is legalized. And so people don't know. And then the third point was that people should care about this. And the reason people should care is because we have so many problems in this world, um, you know, from poverty to racism, discrimination, environment, you, whatever the thing is that you really care about. That thing requires some kind of social change. Um, there are entrenched interests that keep it the way that it is. And part of addressing that issue is to confront and to fight those entrenched interests. And surveillance makes that hard. Because those people who are in power can use that information against activists in order to try to silence or neutralize us. And I want to talk today in particular about one such technique that is being used that maybe we're not paying enough attention to. And that technique is government hacking. Okay? And by government hacking, I mean, in particular, law enforcement, but also intelligence, um, getting access to our computers, our laptops, our phones, in order to obtain information about us. And this topic is obfuscated through the kinds of word games that we see in surveillance more generally. So you'll see people call it lawful hacking. Well, isn't that the issue? whether it's lawful or not, it's not per se lawful. You'll also see people call it um, extraordinary access, as if it's something that is extraordinary and wonderful, or something that is out of the ordinary and not common, when increasingly it is becoming so. And we know this because of work by like, great people like Citizen Lab and others who have found out that there's hacking of activists going on by Ethiopia, by Egypt, by Mexico. Um, but we also know it because we're beginning to see um, your you know, regular uh, democratic governments trying to implement and protect the practice of government hacking in law. So the UK has government hacking as part of the Investigatory Powers Act um, and is saying, like, this is what we're going to do. At least in the UK, they call it equipment interference, which I appreciate the honesty. Um, in the United States, we don't have any special law. I clearly don't need this, so I'm going to put this down. In the United States, we don't have any special law that says that um, hacking's OK. Instead, what's happening is that we're taking the run-of-the-mill process that law enforcement uses when it does run-of-the-mill searches and pretending like that legal process is enough to authorize 
hacks into people's computers. And so what we've seen in the history of government hacking is um, some pretty fun stories. Uh, one of the earliest cases of government hacking involved um, somebody uh, involved breaking into somebody's house and then installing a key log around their machine. Um, but today we see government hacking in terms of uh, sending malware distributed to all people who visit a particular website. And the most recent is in two child pornography cases. In one case, innocent people were infected by this malware as well. In the other case, the government tried to take more effort to try to narrow it down. And um, this is what we've seen, and we are likely to see more. So. Why do I, and, and in these cases, the government got a warrant. A warrant is very important. It's basically where the government has to go to an independent party, a judge, and say, I have good reason for doing this. This is not just random and promis promiscuous. There's good reason for doing this. But government hacking is different from um, regular searches in five particular ways that the warrant requirement can't really address. First is the amount and the quantity of data. What's on my computer is far more invasive than any 50 phone conversations I would have. There's the invasiveness. Part of government hacking now can include things like turning on the camera on your laptop or turning on the microphone on your smart TV and basically converting these everyday consumer appliances into in-home surveillance machines. Then there's the problem of the falsification of data. If this information is being collected for criminal um, prosecution purposes, how can we know that the very act of accessing the computer hasn't changed the information that's there in ways that impinge upon the defendant's rights? And how can the defense test that theory if and see that the evidence is not altered um, in any way if the government insists on keeping the exploit and the vulnerability secret. It um, interferes with the due process rights of the defendant in the criminal justice system. The fourth way is cybersecurity harms. Um, when you have the government as an incentivized attacker on the network, that is a very different thing from having the government be on the side of defense. And, um, that means, one, the incentives are misaligned with defense, and everybody in this room knows that defense is losing, and it's hard, and we have to work really um, hard and together to make it, to, to try to improve cybersecurity. But also, there's the problem of the government losing exploits and uh, you know, them getting in the hands of the wrong people, as happened with WannaCry. And then there's the problem of the government hoarding vulnerabilities instead of informing uh, the vendors or the software manufacturers that they need to fix the problem. And finally, there's the problem of public trust. In order to serve malware, we've seen the government pretend to be an Associated Press reporter, serve up uh, child pornography for a period of two weeks, We've seen them try to force vendors into creating uh, malicious software updates for their products. How can the public trust the government or trust the commercial entities, the devices, the software that we deal with every day if this is going to be the way that, the, um, the way that government hacking operates? So this um, amount of data, the invasiveness of the techniques, the due process problem for checking the use of this in criminal contexts, the problem of losing exploits, of hiding vulnerabilities, the problem of public trust. I mean, as lawyers, our approach to this is always to try to like make rules and legislate our way out of this. But you know, we may have some ways to deal with the privacy problem, even though it's far greater in degree than you know, any other information that we allow the government to access with a warrant. But I really don't think that we as rule makers, we as lawyers, have the tools that we need to deal with the invasiveness, the cybersecurity problem, the due process problem. And so here we are having this mostly secret activity going on without the rules and regulations that would be required to mitigate the downside, and without the knowledge that we need to know what to do about it. Thank you.
Next up, we have Nicole Ozer, who is the Technology and Civil Liberties Director at the American Civil Liberties uh, Union of California. Um, Nicole has so many accolades, I could stand up here and talk forever, um, but I will pick out one of my favorites, is that she was recognized by San Jose Magazine for being one of the 20 women making a mark in Silicon Valley, and I would argue probably across the country, if not the world. Um, let's welcome Nicole to the stage. Hi everyone, it's so nice to be here today. Thanks so much to Amy for organizing us and for all of you coming to our SA today. Um, so my colleague Jennifer did a wonderful job sort of providing an overview on surveillance and some really emerging and surreptitious issues um, that we're seeing in terms of government surveillance. I'm actually gonna drill down on something that has been in the news a lot lately um, that's actually very visible but I think that a lot of people actually don't know as much about. Um, you pretty much would have to be under a rock if you haven't been hearing about Cambridge Analytica in the last two weeks. Um, but one of the issues is that the privacy practices of Facebook and other platforms um, and the way that they've built the platform hasn't just lured issues related to consumer privacy at Cambridge Analytica. Actually, those same kinds of platform policies and lack of controls uh, for information, including like names and profile photos, has actually also created uh, an infrastructure for government surveillance. There's been sort of a widespread shopping spree related to information that's on social networking and being used for government surveillance. Um, and you know, back in 2009, um, Bruce Schneier really talked about the issue that you know, we don't want to build an infrastructure that can also be used to facilitate a police state. Um, in 2016, uh, the news broke that Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram were actually being used by surveillance companies like Geofedia and Media Sonar to uh, target activists, particularly activists of color across the country. This was widespread. We were seeing police departments from California to Colorado to Baltimore uh, using social media surveillance tools that were taking advantage of data available through these companies' uh, APIs. It wasn't actually an audit by Facebook or the other companies that revealed what was happening. It was actually a Public Records Act investigation by our team out here at the ACLU. Uh, we found out that there were not only systems being used in Fresno, but across the country uh, that were surveilling activists and particularly activists of color. Uh, this was blatant. Uh, we, in our Public Records Act investigation, found documents that companies like Media Sonar uh, were urging uh, police departments to target what they viewed as uh, public safety threats. Those public safety threats were people who actually posted hashtags like Black Lives Matter, it's time for change, unarmed. Uh, uh, let's ask questions. So this was sort of blatant what we were seeing in these documents. Um, we were also seeing companies like Geofedia um, uh, touting that uh, it's data that they could access through Facebook and Twitter and Instagram um, should be used to target uh, overt threats, which they characterized to include protests, uh, unions, and activists. Um, Data Miner, which was another company, was actually using its access to the Twitter firehose and its examples to its potential customers for how to use this API access was actually a student protest in South Africa. Um, and they were also sort of highlighting how you could use the system to drill down to learn more about particular types of individuals, including both activists and journalists. So what we saw sort of happening was incredibly blatant. Um, the ACLU, along with Color of Change and the Center for Media Justice, exposed what was happening, worked with the companies, and to their credit, companies like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram um, uh, you know, strengthened their developer policies and prohibited use of the API data for surveillance. But while they tightened up the uh, 
the surveillance policies themselves, they didn't actually address some of the underlying issues in terms of what kind of data was available through the API, or what kind of information could users themselves control. Um, not all of the information could be controlled. And it's these vulnerabilities in terms of uh, what is available through the APIs and also what data is actually um, can users control and not control that we see the Trump administration now exploiting as well. I think most people are aware that the Trump administration is wanting to engage in systems. They've been called extreme vetting. They sort of have a different name every week. But it really is about monitoring individuals, immigrant community members, and those who they communicate with. And what this really comes down to is sort of issues that have been in issues that have sort of resulted from actions more than a decade ago. Um, you know, the Cambridge Analytica threat um, and what happened was something that the ACLU identified more than a decade ago. We actually uh, produced a Facebook quiz about Facebook quizzes that identified this very threat that if I'm friends with you, I'm friends with all the apps that you run to. Um, this, this app sort of spurred some government investigations and forced Facebook to make some changes, but they never fundamentally addressed that app gap. Um, they also, at about the same time, made some really big changes to privacy settings, including um, creating what was a category of publicly available information, things that users could no longer control, um, that there were no user controls for. And I've sort of highlighted you know, Mark Zuckerberg's testimony last week that users have complete control over information. The fact is that's simply not true. Right now, information that is public, that you have no controls over, include things like your name, your profile picture, your networks, like your school and your workplace. And if you replace your name helps people recognize you with your name helps the government recognize you, or your networks allows others to find you more easily, and you replace it with the government can find you more easily for workplace raids, for school raids, the impact of publicly available information and having no user controls on this information has really dire consequences in terms of the current state of social and political life, um, particularly for vulnerable immigrant community members and activist community members. It's not hypothetical. These are actually the Q&As provided by DHS to vendors who they were seeking to bid for the extreme vetting program from this past July, where they specifically urge vendors to apply techniques to exploit publicly available information to monitor um, immigrant community members, and that they're trying to also develop and have found workarounds to find even more information. So the impact of not having user controls on publicly available information or what has been deemed by companies like Facebook and others to be publicly available has incredible ramifications. Um, you know, the reality is there are 2 billion plus photos that users can't control. There's 2 billion plus networks that users can't control. There's 2 billion plus names that users can't control. And for many, many years, uh, the consumer privacy protections haven't been strong enough, but now the stakes are even higher because what the Trump administration wants to do is utilize the infrastructure from social media companies like Facebook and others to power its deportation machine. So this is why sort of during the testimony last week, I was, I was really harping on this issue of publicly available information and also how the defaults are set because not having control over all of your information and having defaults set to public has massive ramifications, not just on consumer privacy, but also the actual safety of, of millions of users, particularly vulnerable users um, in the United States and abroad. So hopefully during the Q&A, we can talk about some of the work that the ACLU is doing, both on the local, state, and federal level to push back on these issues. Um, or passing ordinances in local communities, but also just how important it is um, for how settings really uh, make a difference, um, how company 
practices can really make a difference, and particularly in the current political and social climate, just how critical it is to really understand the connections between consumer privacy and government surveillance and make sure those settings are strong and that users are protected. So I'm looking forward to Q&A and talking more about this and other issues. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ashley Tolbert, who is a software engineer turned cybersecurity engineer and researcher at Stanford University's Linear Accelerator Center. Um, I was saying earlier uh, in the coffee area that anybody who has NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in their bio becomes an instant hero of mine. <laughs> and Ashley is one of those people. Um, she has a diverse background that includes researching database security at JPL, as well as modeling software for NASA Ames. Ashley? Thank you. All right. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is the future of secure coding, uh, specifically as it relates to emerging technologies. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in. Uh, so first I wanna talk about the current state of software security. I wanna talk about what's stopping us from really actually throwing all of our resources into secure coding, and then why secure coding is very important right now, and then looking ahead to some of the exciting things that I think are gonna make uh, coding securely easier and more exciting in the future. This is also one of my favorite cartoons from Dilbert. <laughs> so. All right, so the current state of software security. Um, I saw an article from Fast Company that said that 2017 was the year that software bugs ate the world, uh, which is a play on the 2011 uh, quote by Mark Andreessen that software is eating the world. Uh, so I thought that was pretty funny. Um, there were a lot of headlines around application security in 2017. We had the Equifax breach, where about 148 million Americans were affected, um, and that was a result of an unpatched struts vulnerability. We had a, a software defect in Singapore that actually caused a train crash. 28 people were injured from that incident. And then we had the widespread WannaCry incident that was a result of a Windows exploit. Um, and now recently we've had an entire city being affected by vulnerabilities, and that was Atlanta. And so I would say the software uh, security, the state of it right now is a little questionable. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so let's look at a few more industry stats. So I'll be referencing a lot of stats from this report. This is the Vericode 2017 State of Security Report uh, that they released. And uh, I, there are a few st um, striking findings in it. One is that the top 10 list of the most common vulnerabilities from 2017 and 2016 are actually very similar, which says that year by year, we're, te we're technically dealing with some of the same coding issues over and over. Um, another one said that 83% of organizations said that they had released um, code before without testing it or resolving security issues, which is not good. Um, <laughs> and uh, another stat said that 30% of the applications that were tested passed the top 10 OWASP, um, the top 10 security risk that they list, which are some of the most common vulnerabilities or security risks that are listed each year. Um, so I'd say that gives a, 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 us at least a snippet of where we are as an industry. Um, uh, this is only uh, 1,400 customers that they actually worked with, but it does give you an idea that software security is pretty important right now because it is the foundation of all the technologies that we have coming down the line. Um, and then the last, um, the last uh, stat is actually from 2015. DHS, DHS released a note that said that 90% of security incidents result from exploits um, coming from defects in software. So um, that gives you a better idea of that it, it is a, a constant problem. So what's stopping us? What's stopping us from really thinking about security in our code and thinking about getting developers security training? I think it's a lack of focus on education for one. Um, developers tend to receive inadequate security training or none at all because if you have a developing team, you have a security team, it's hard to, I think, convince management to get the developers security training. Uh, and that differs from company to company, but uh, I think it's still an issue at a lot of places that have uh, a limited amount of resources to, put around, to go around. I did my undergrad in computer science and was not required to take a security course. Uh, it was optional. And so I think security is being treated as a complement to development instead of a fundamental part of development. 
Um, coding schools. I, I have a question about coding schools um, because you know they're typically a six to eight, 28 pro, uh, week program where you're taking through um, many fundamental uh, techniques of software development and languages. Um, but a lot of the coding schools didn't list security on their curriculums, on their sites. Um, and so that, my question is, are they teaching security? Um, so, that's, so that's something to think about. Another thing is that a lot of teams check for security after code development. So code is written, and then it's pen tested or scanned after the code is being written, which is a reactive versus a proactive approach. And I'll talk a bit, about, a bit more about that a little later. All right, so common misconceptions about security. Number one, security costs more, and it slows down software development and your time to market. Um, I would say that fixing your reputation and having to deal with the loss of customer trust probably takes a lot more time and a lot more money. Um, and I, but I think that's, that's still a very common um, misconception. So the same report that I referenced earlier found that 52% of developers said that they were worried that security would uh, be an effect on their deadlines and their software development. <clears throat> So I do think it's still a, a, still a huge misconception. I think a, lo a little less now because of all the headlines, but I think it still does happen a little. Um, another thing, I think it's hard to, security is a hard sell sometimes. It's seen as something that's needed once an issue arises, um, not before, it's like insurance. You don't actually think you need it until something actually happens. And so it can be a hard sell sometimes when, when resources are limited especially. All right, so why is uh, secure coding important? Well, number one, we are living in a hyper-connected world, one that is continuously being connected to the internet. We have more and more IoT devices every day. Your toaster is online, your fridge is online, everything is online. Um, I work in the Department of Energy, so DOE. Um, the energy grid is, is pretty, pretty, pretty high on my uh, radar. And so th there is an attack in 2015 in Ukraine that shows that an attack on this energy grid can be catastrophic at mass scale. Um, I think a thousand homes, over like thousands of homes were left without power for several hours. So I think that's proof that, that cyber attacks on the energy grid can be an issue. And then election security. There's been a lot of talk around security on voting and, and voting machines. Um, and so I think that's something to think about too. And nation state actors. There's an increasing threat from nation state actors to use our vulnerabilities against us, right? And so I think it's still, it's still something we should keep talking about. All right, so looking ahead. So what is exciting in software security? I think there's a few things. I think to push the future of more secure software forward, I think the push for education will need to be number one, um, or, or at least high on the radar. Um, I think more on, job, on the job security training and then putting security as a requirement or at least um, uh, at least creating a program for undergrad programs and coding schools I think is a way to go. Um, I do think that bug bounties are really, really encouraging a lot of secure coding. I think Bugcrowd released a report that said that the payout right now is around, it's like over $6 million, so I think that's amazing. Um, machine learning and AI, I do think that there's great opportunities in security for machine learning and, and machine learning and AI because eventually we may have a tool that can proactively find vulnerabilities in software, and, and I think that that's a great help. And then DevSecOps. Uh, there's a lot of talk about DevSecOps right now, which is essentially the idea that um, security is baked into every part of your software development lifecycle um, from, from start to finish. And there's many, a lot of resources on this. <laughs> there's a lot of, probably be a lot of talk about it this week, so um, I, I definitely get involved with that if y'all are interested. Um, and then here are some big questions that I have and, and, and I'd like to sort of pose to, to you all to, to think about. Uh, number one, what responsibility do coding schools have in ensuring that their graduates are learning security? Like, is security part of development or do you think it is a part um, that something that's learned after you learn how to code? The second thing is, should developers have a universal code of ethics for software security? Right, so a lot of industries that do work that impact the public. They have licenses and they have a code of ethics, right? Doctors. Um, but software developers don't. And so that's something I think we can think about. Uh, and then how much should our future consequences influence our, our present decisions in coding and software? So I think these are, these are great questions to think about. 
All right, so I'll leave you all with this. This is kind of my, uh, my last takeaway. Um, there are 14,600 vulnerabilities that were submitted according to CVE, uh, the CVE detail site in 2017 versus 26, uh, 2016, the amount was 6,447. So I think that probably suggests there's a growing amount of vulnerabilities or at least more people submitting them. <laughs> Take that as you will. <laughs> and then my last thought, we are deploying software right now that makes very important decisions on our lives, sometimes life and death decisions. We will have to think of new ways to ensure that it is secure going forward, and we will have to start thinking about securing our future right now. Thank you all. I was about to start talking without the mic. None of you would have heard anything. Um, next up, we're going to have Ryan Wanstreet, who is a PhD student at the University of Washington. Um, although this is just the most recent in many of her lives, they have given her kind of a wealth of experience to draw from. Previously, she was in the Peace Corps. She was a project coordinator at the Center for Media and Data Studies at Central European University. And she worked in many leadership positions at Access Now, which is my employer and where I got to know Ryan and her wonderful work. Ryan? Thank you. Oh, uh, that's not the first slide. There we go. Hi. Thank you for having me. Are you having trouble? That's the question a John Deere rep asked a man named Chuck Biebermeyer when they called him during a sleet storm. He had been out plowing his fields and he had noticed that he was having a little trouble getting through the earth. It seems like his engine just wasn't getting as much power as it should be. And that turned out to be exactly what the problem was. Deere's sensors had registered that there was some kind of problem with the air intake. And so for his safety, Deere had actually started to throttle his engine. And so that kind of like took Chuck by surprise, right? He was a little freaked out. But I tell this story because it's actually really emblematic of how very carefully many machines are being controlled and monitored on our farms now. So that tractor is part of what is part of precision agriculture. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. What it is, how prevalent it is, some of the problems with it, and how people are starting to deal with these problems. This is a really basic overview, um, but very simply, precision agriculture is when farmers can take uh, data from historical records, from satellite images, from you know, sensors that are all over their farms to create what's called prescriptions. And these prescriptions can tell the farmer or the farmer's machines themselves things like where to plant, how deep a seed should go, how much fertilizer to put in places, how much phosphorus to use. And that precision agriculture is being marketed as being more sustainable and cost effective, more efficient. And there's some evidence that this is true. So uh, farmers that are utilizing these tools are saying like, yes, we're using less water, right? And of course, if you're using robots, ostensibly you have less labor costs. And I do have to say that there is a, a lot of cool robots that are being developed in this space. And I wanted to show you a couple. So on the top, well, in the top uh, is a driverless tractor by John Deere. And that's actually the least cool thing on this space, or on this slide, uh, because there's a ton of automated um, tractors right now. John Deere, as of a year or two ago, was actually the largest purveyor of automated vehicles on the planet. They were way ahead uh, in this space, way ahead of Waymo, way ahead of Google. Um, on the other top, <laughs> my, my left, your right probably, is a strawberry picker. Fruit and vegetable bots are becoming incredibly common very quickly, and that's largely led by labor needs. On the bottom left is Prospero bots, and these work together like in an ant colony to deal with individual seeds and plants. And then this is the Hortobot. That's my favorite. The Hortobot seeks out individual weeds. I think it can directly spray herbicide. But it's also equipped with a little something extra. It's actually got some lasers and a flamethrower. Because, like, <laughs> I guess some weeds are extra tenacious or something. What could possibly go wrong with that? Um, 
So behind the growth of precision agriculture is a fact you will hear over and over again in every article that you read. We're going to have nine, nine and a half billion people we're going to have to feed by 2050. And if I had more time, I'd go into some of the problems with that hyperbole, but it is true. We have a very growing population. And alongside of that is a growing precision agriculture market. So in 2016, the market was ostensibly around $3 billion. And a very low ball estimate of what it might be worth in 2021 is around $19 billion. And that's why so many people are eager to get, it, to get into it. So you have players that names you'll recognize that have always been part of the farming community, like John Deere, Monsanto. They bet very early and very heavily in data analytics. Then you have new entrants, like Microsoft and IBM. And then you have venture capitalists, many of whom are very in involved in the technical industry, like Google Ventures. And this is a global phenomenon, right? So although North America has about 50% of the market share, the places that are intent or will likely see the lar largest amounts of growth in the next five years are places like Asia Pacific, Brazil. So that's kind of a very broad overview, right? Um, this new technology, big data, um, is on track for this fourth agricultural revolution. It's going to save the world from famine. And like, by the way, a lot of people are going to make a lot of money. Like, what could possibly go wrong with all of this? Well, it's not going to surprise you that there are things that could possibly go wrong with this. So there's two big issues that you consistently hear folks talk about as their biggest concerns, although there are a host of other concerns that we could talk about. Um, data and cybersecurity. So in the data realm, like none of this is going to be new to this crowd. People are concerned about who owns it, who controls it, how is it being stored. Farmers really want to know, like, how could this data possibly be used against me? Could the government get access to it? Could my landlords get access to it? Could it be possible for my neighbors to see it? I personally am really curious about who's writing the algorithms that are behind these prescriptions. And farmers really want to know, why should someone else be making money off of the data that I'm generating? So in the cybersecurity realm, I mean, this is the Internet of Things. It's smart devices. It's a problem, right? Farmers are going to walk, they're worried they're going to walk outside and their tractor is going to be bricked. I have a slightly larger concern. I worry that somebody is going to go after an entire network. So what would happen if some malicious state actor decided that they wanted to hack John Deere's network of tractors or go after Monsanto's platform? Could they actually bring down like part of America's annual harvest. Now, I know that sounds like kind of, kind of crazy, right? But the FBI is actually really concerned about the growth of these technologies in agriculture. So in 2016, they sent out this bulletin. And they were like, farmers, we're really excited that you're, you're engaging in these new technologies. We think it's a, you know, a really great way to, to make your production more efficient. But like, by the way, like, you're probably making yourself really vulnerable to ransomware. And like BT dubs, if you're using GMOs, like you should probably know that hacktivists might come after you. And some, some companies have actually already been um, hacked. So Climate Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Monsanto, has already been breached. So big data, cybersecurity, those are the two like biggies, right? So how are people starting to deal with this? Well, it's not going to surprise anyone that the open source community, which is very vibrant in the agricultural sector, um, thinks that the, the, the correct solution is to move, move everything away from the proprietary, uh, proprietary platforms. So they're developing open source, um, open source software, open source tools. One of the biggest problems with that is scale. And that's actually quite literal when it comes to tools. The, the open source tractors, for example, they're developing won't work on America's large farms. There's also quite a bit of data in initiatives. So a couple years ago already, the American Farm Bureau created a set of data principles that dealt with portability and ownership. But to be honest, they're kind of squishy. They don't really put the farmer first. And it's a little easy, for example, for um, corporations to sell the data of their consumers to third-party contractors. And that's probably why you're, you're getting so many other 
like nonprofits and coalitions and, and platform co-ops that are trying to create neutral bodies outside of the proprietary systems, that they want to create their own like safe spaces almost. And you also have some commercial entities that are being developed, that they're, they're billing themselves as like farmer forward and data centric spaces, some of whom are even figuring out ways to like allow farmers to sell their data to analytical companies. And that's a, an innovation that farmers are very, very excited about. So in the government sector, um, you have, there's a move to push Congress to classify agricultural data in the same way that medical data is treated. And there is at least one working group that's working with different, um, different groups within government sectors to, uh, to deal with the larger cybersecurity questions. Now, this is probably the very broadest overview of a huge sector that you could possibly get. And you've noticed that it is most heavily US focused, even though this is a global phenomenon. But I want to leave you with one final thought in my 30 seconds. Um, the issues we talk about today and in tw on Twitter, um, surveillance capitalism, surveillance platforms, the problems with the Internet of Things, uh, problems with consolidations of corporations, these things are becoming as prevalent on farms as they are already on our phones. Now, farmers really do want to participate in this new technological and data ecosystem. They recognize the benefit that they can get from it, but they want to do it in a way that will allow them to maintain their agency and independence. And I think that that's still possible. There are really neat and innovative alternatives that are being developed. But they need to be supported today because this, this, uh, this sector is moving so fast that if they're not, if they're not bolstered right now, that those, those options won't be available tomorrow. So thank you. And now we're going to bring it all home. Um, our final speaker for this session, before we go to panel, is Anna Lauren Hoffman, who is an assistant professor with the Information School at the University of Washington in Seattle. Her work sits at the intersections of data, technology, culture, and ethics, a fact that I found maybe best exemplified by the fact that her bio simultaneously quote, quotes John Rawls and Janelle Monet. <laughs> Anna? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Anna Lauren Hoffman, and I am an edge case. I am a fraud. I am a weapon. Or at least that's what certain systems have said about me, to me. And by systems, I mean combinations of hardware, software, and people that serve to evaluate assess, and secure particular environments. And I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about security in a broader sense. And I want to talk about the assumptions and normative ideals that we build into systems when we're trying to prevent fraud, when we're trying to uh, improve security in certain contexts. And this work is situated in the area of Applied ethics and technology, and like all applied ethical areas, making decisions involves balancing a few different factors. Most salient among them are technical factors. We are, at any given time, bound by the limits of the, given, the tools we have in front of us, technically. Practical factors, deadlines are real, budgets are real. These things help inform and shape our decisions. And also moral factors. And by moral factors, I mean the principles, values, and ideals that guide us in making decisions. But within each of these sort of corners of the triangle, there are also little negotiations that need to happen, choices that we make, assumptions in particular that we make about the world, and who occupies it? 
So a few stories. People may be familiar with this image. It is the image of a human body outline that gets spit out by the little screen on the other side of that airport body scanner that you walk through. Now, these are controversial for many reasons, but I think it's worth revisiting what actually happens when you negotiate with one of these systems. A lot of people don't recognize that the TSA agent on the other side of that machine before you walk in, the TSA agent makes a visual assessment and decides whether or not you are a man or a woman and pushes a button, a pink or a blue button. <laughs> like, I'm like, not making that up. And why do they have to do that? Well, they need to do that so it tells the software inside the millimeter wave scanner what to emphasize and what to ignore. You don't want the underwire in every woman's bra setting the machine off, so you need to tell the software to ignore that. So there are a set of features and assumptions about what a typical woman's body is going to look like as they walk through this machine, or what a typical man's body is going to look like when they walk through this machine. And those assumptions get coded into the software that interprets the data from the millimeter wave scanner and makes it, uh, it makes it accessible to a human agent. So for trans women, this is a problem for a lot of different kinds of bodies, but for trans women in particular, transgender women, when they walk through the scanner, if they have not had certain surgeries, in particular on the lower half of their body, they're going to see something like they see on the, on the uh, left. They're going to see a big old red or yellow blotch. And their genitals are going to be labeled as a threat. That blotch is no different than the blotch that would show up on a shoulder, on an ankle, wherever else. Labeled as a threat and treated as such. To the point that it triggers a set of procedures that you can't get out of, no matter how hard you beg, that I would argue rise to the level of state-sanctioned sexual assault. Dating websites. I don't mean to pick on any one particular company. This was just a, a case that was publicized by the trans feminine gender queer activist Addison Rose Vincent in the Huffington Post. But it's not an uncommon experience. So what happens on particular in particular dating apps is you have a set of gender options that you select when you sign up. Sometimes they are limited to very strict binaries. You can identify as a man or a woman. You can then say you're interested in men or women or both. And that's kind of the, the field of possibility. Now, different sites can get different levels of nuance here. But what happens in some of these cases is you have transgender women, straight trans transgender women, sign up for these sites, indicate their interest in men, and their profile starts showing up. And cisgender men look at the presentation of certain women, or in this case, somebody who clearly wanted to overcome the limitations of the site and let users know that they were trans by doing that brilliant thing that users do, right? They work, they find a way around the system. It's like, well, if this is going to be profile heavy and I don't have that many options, well, I'll just state it in my profile picture. In this case, the user, after a little while, started getting these automated messages that said, we've noticed some suspicious activity. You've been getting a lot of reports, knock it off. Knock off your inappropriate behavior. OK. In this case, the user didn't know what they were doing. That was entirely inappropriate. So they just kept going. And pretty soon, they got locked out of their account. Was it the intention of the platform to lock this person out of the account? No. But did they arrange software and people in certain ways that produce a particular outcome? Yes. So what happens is they were, rely they were relying on user reports. And a lot of people in this room already know that a flag is never just a flag. They were relying on user reports. And not only that, they had automated, the like they had automated these messages. So there was no human reviewing the reports. You got X number. You got the email. You got X number of reports more. You got locked out. 
whether it was their intention or not, the cumulative effect was to endorse the harmful stereotype, a stereotype that causes direct violence and harm, that trans women are somehow not real women, that they are fraudulent, they are deceptive. And here you had an outcome that not only played into that stereotype, but amplified it. This is my favorite one, it's a little more recent. There was a computer science researcher in North Carolina who decided, who was working on uh, facial recognition technology, in particular for border security, with some funding from the government, from the Department of Defense. One day a student brought it to this person's attention that there were all of these videos on YouTube of trans people sharing their the stories of their transition in pictures. Now, for trans people that decide to undergo hormone therapy or other kinds of interventions, it can have a more or less drastic effect on, the, on your appearance. And there's a culture on YouTube of sharing these videos and of sharing people's journeys and stories to offer support. It's a way of community building. It's a way of, of sort of making connections with other trans folks. This computer scientist took one look at these videos and said, wow. What if a terrorist took hormones to trick a border camera and illegally acts as a country? Like, this is the literal quote, right? Like, what kind of harm can a terrorist do if they understand that taking this hormone can increase their chances of crossing over into a border that's protected by face recognition? That was the problem I was really investigating. Never mind the fact that there are trans people who cross borders all the time. They're not terrorists. Here you have a decision that's made in order to fuel security research, research into border security, that does the same thing, that similarly says and confirms the harmful cultural stereotype that trans women are somehow deceptive or fraudulent. Again, a stereotype that leads to direct violence and harm, murder. But more than those concrete outcomes, those concrete violent outcomes, I want you also to think about the kinds of anxiety that, that, that these choices, the kinds of anxieties that these design decisions make for particular communities. That violence doesn't only inhere in the abhorrent, does it only adhere in those sensationalized cases of direct harm? But it also inheres in that background knowledge, that constant thing in the back of your head when you belong to a vulnerable group or your identity is marginalized in some way. When you go to a system and you're just like, in the back of your head, you're just like, oh crap, is it going to fail me today? That when we distribute those vulnerabilities and anxieties unequally, we create and further broader injustices and unequal conditions in the world. So thank you for your time. All right, we're now going to bring all of our speakers back up onto the stage, and we're going to have a panel session. Um, it will be moderated by Kara Swisher, who is an American technology journalist, a woman who needs no introduction. Um, she is also the founder of Recode. Um, can all of you come back up here? All right, everybody sit down. It is a distinct honor and thrill for me to have an all-woman panel, which has never happened in my 110-year-old career. <laughs> um, seriously. 
<laughs> so nice. I don't know what to do. I think I'll just stop right now and get off the stage. Um, so I want to start. A lot of you talked about very different things. I was, uh, your beginning was amazing, the weapon. Yeah. It's 100% it very, it's true. I want to make two observations, and then I want to get into talking about ethics, because you all talked about very different things, um, robot farming. Uh, lack of ethical training, <laughs> all kinds of things. Um, but I want to read two things. One, one thing I want to make the observation that the, the yesterday the Pulitzer Prize was won uh, by Ronan Farrow and the New York Times, a set of women at the New York Times. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that the Me Too movement, these two stories <laughs> were critically important to starting off this, were written by women and a gay man. There's, there's no coincidence of why that was. And so I want you to think about that as we're talking about <clears> this. And then secondly, I posted a thing today. Um, I'm writing an essay about last week's hearings, the Facebook hearings, um, where Mark Zuckerberg successfully wore a suit. I think that was a success. Um, <laughs> OK. Um, and I, want, I was thinking of this quote because I, I think about it. And I want to put this in the context of what we're going to be talking about. It's from The Great Gatsby. My son is reading it in high school right now. And so I got my high school copy out and started reading it. And of course, there's this famous quote from it. He was all very careless and confused. They were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their money and their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the mess they made. I think it's a really good quote for what we're, what's happening right now around security and ethics. And so let's uh, start talking about that. Um, I'd love to get each of you, and there's a lot of people here, to talk sort of really where you think we are in, this, in ethics, because I think that's, to me, what's been missing from the entire thing. And it, it, it is directly related to the lack of diversity and lack of different ideas within some of these companies. And so you all talked about government, but it's this, it, to me it's the same idea of how people think about what they're doing. So I'd love to start with you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. um, just briefly, where you think we are. Um, I mean, I think there's this very one-sided, you know, people can take this one-sided approach based on what's the, you know, I mean, I thought you put this so well, like what's the question you're trying to investigate? And this, you know, from, from my perspective, this overwhelming um, kind of focus on terrorism and crime as if those are the only interests that, and those interests reign supreme over everything. Mm -hmm. And I think you can see it, you know, in Nikki's Facebook, oh, I'm talking about your talk, but in Nikki's Facebook talk also, it's like when you're, you know, you, you have what your goal is, and that goal can seem all-consuming and then other goals and other important interests kind of fall by the wayside. And, you know, that's what I was trying to say about government hacking. You know, it's like, okay, well, we're going to get this information, but these other important goals are so t closely tied to it and we're losing <laughs> sight of that. And that's why we really need to have a conversation about you know, the, the other interests that are connected to these efforts. Right. Do you think it's a lack of thought or purposeful? Um, I think it's a combination, but mo I don't think it's... I, I don't think it's um, Malicious. I think that it's, you know, you work on what you get judged on. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a big surprise that law enforcement wants to catch criminals. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the only interest at heart. Yeah, I, you know, um, not thoughtlessness per se, but lack of depth of thought. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. So one of the things I, I spent a lot of time thinking about discriminatory algorithms, thinking about um, uh, sort of representation and harm through automated systems. And I find that the conversation has gotten so much better mm -hmm. around impact. Like mm -hmm. we, we've, we've gotten so much better at talking about particular discriminatory outcomes um, uh, of a given system, whether it's like in, in finance and, and determining whether somebody has um, is a a loan risk or not, uh, or in the criminal justice system, we're good at talking about these, these impacts, but we're not yet quite to the point where we're questioning the assumptions that are informing our questions. We right. kind of have this like this uh, libertarian-y like intellectual freedom, a very like a very uh, a contextual version of intellectual freedom that's like, well, you shouldn't we shouldn't prevent us from asking questions. Right. Failing well, I to call, recognize I call it libertarian light. <laughs> libertarian yeah. light. Yeah, this is good. Uh, uh, and and so not only uh, so so we haven't quite penetrated that that like there are a set of assumptions about people, about bodies, about communities that are informing our questions. Uh, but yet we, we treat questions as kind of like the sacred domain, and we don't interrogate those assumptions that are fueling our questions in the first place. Right. Um, I think part of it is we still have a, a deep like belief in techno-utopianism, like technology can solve all of our problems, right? Uh, I mentioned that, um, you, you know, you'll always hear this fact that, uh, oh, we all have nine and a half billion mouths to feed and we have to, you know, we have to deal with that. And there's a lot of problems with that fact in, in general, but if you talk to 
Um, if, you, if you talk to providers in the space and people that are dealing in the space, they're like, that's why we have to keep pushing so hard. We don't, mm -hmm. these are important questions you're asking, like, oh, cybersecurity is important, like, privacy issues are important, but we don't have time to wait because we have to solve this problem. The fact is, is like 73% of our arable land is, is, is uh, it goes to ethanol and, and to cattle grazing. So there's, there's other ways to deal with this problem too. Um, but there's such a belief that like technology can solve every problem without changing any of the other multiple options that we have available to us that uh, it kind of allows us to, to gloss over all the issues. Yeah, I'll add to that. I think, I think with technology, and I'll talk a little bit about how, how what I talked about in my, my talk about the code of ethics. I think specifically in development, um, I think software development, I think people start talking about ethics when uh, there's impact on or when dangerous things happen or when you realize the impact of your decisions or your software can really, really do some harm. Um, and I think that's when the ethics conversation happens. I think specifically in technology, it will happen. I think it's starting to happen now. Um, but when you're, I think a lot of times when you're building software, even you don't know what people will use that software for sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like you, like you, you have no idea how it can be weaponized sometimes until really? it's Really? I'm sorry, I'm going to push back on that one because I think okay. you do have a sense of how it can be weaponized if you use slight creativity um, in terms of... But that I, requires I, diversity yeah. in order to... Right, to well, be able only to because... I, I'll, I'll, I mean, I've said, used this example many times. When I was uh -huh. at Facebook, when they had Facebook Live, they showed me an early example of it. And I was in the room and I said, well, what are you going to do about people who murder each other or beat each other up <laughs> or commit suicide? Right. And literally to a person, I'm like, Kara, you're so negative. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, have you met the fucking human race? Because I feel yeah. like the history has been pretty tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. And literally it was this sort of how can you rain on our fantastic parade of of mothers wearing Chewbacca masks. How can you do that? <laughs> and, and it was, I find her yeah. menacing myself. But, uh, but what, what's, what was fascinating was the lack, uh, like that they, yeah. oh, we didn't know. I think that yeah. is yeah. just a canard. But go ahead, yeah. please no, no, go, no, please no, proceed. No, and, I, and I totally understand where, where you're coming from. Um, I think it's. I think it can be tough to imagine all the, the possibilities. Dog <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes it can be difficult to imagine all the possibilities of how a software can be used. And I think that goes back to my conversation of we do need to think about privacy and security in mind a lot as software is being developed. But I do think um, ethics comes into a conversation specifically in software when bad things happen. Um, I think it's still a conversation that's still still being had. I guess I would completely agree with you, Kara. That um, you know. We identified these threats. <laughs> like we identified these threats in 2009. Mm. We talked about mm. the implications of the app gap. We talked about the implications of publicly available information. We talked about Google Street View when mm. it was. I mean, these are not things that were unexpected. These were not things that couldn't have been addressed. Mm. There were very um, deliberate actions to prioritize growth and the bottom line over user privacy, over issues. So I, I thought. You know, much of the testimony last week was, you know, either somewhat misleading or disingenuous. I, mean, <laughs> I think that, you know, ethics, I think the companies do what the companies are forced to do. Um, I think that a lot, you know, changes will probably happen with GDPR because they have to and they're going to be hitting the bottom line if they don't do that. I think that things have certainly changed since I started doing this work in 2004, but some of it is that um, the companies have been pushed to for that change through FTC investigations or through law. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg talked a lot about changes that the company had made, but he didn't mention that the company made those changes because they were forced to by the consent decree or forced to by the Canadian government or forced to by, you know, the Illinois biometric law that they were then trying to gut. So, you know, I do think that, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of folks in companies who are committed to privacy and human rights, but I think that um, real change and fundamental privacy change happens when the companies are required to do so by law. So let's talk about that. Let's use the Mark's testimony last week to talk about that, because it does extend to the government and everything else. I'd love to get your assessment of what 
uh, you think happened. Um, I was struck myself by the obsession of terms of service um, by the legislators, because it's a very easy thing and, and, and really not the point. I felt like it was not the point whatsoever, but they enjoyed saying your terms of service suck. Um, and then we go back to business as usual, essentially. Um, so I'd love to get each, just an idea and anyone going to, uh, of what you think that represented, because he's high, very representative of uh, Silicon Valley, I think, in terms of mentality. Um, and to be fair, they have been trying to make changes now, forced to uh, because of it. So anyone thoughts on what happened last week? Speaking to the ethics piece, and to, to tie this question right. with, the, with the previous conversation a little bit, um, you know, the, these kinds of controversies as drivers of change, these, these kinds of, um, we think about ethics when bad things happen, as yeah. Ashley put it, right, um, is a, a, another dimension that I just kind of want to insert this before we talk about um, Mark, uh, is, uh, is that <coughs> these things do fuel change, but we also need to be mindful of the fact that it is constantly the same communities who are having mm -hmm. to raise that issue, right? Like, right. It, it's not, the, the, we're not fueling change sort of because we're all equally beta testers in the right. wild. Um, no, it, it's trans folks, it's communities of color, it's disabled people, right. and, and it's these people who are constantly having to come forward and identify the shortcomings of systems and fight to be seen right. or fight to be accommodated, and, uh, and so, so, well, this is a driver. It's, it's obviously woefully insufficient because... No, I agree with yeah. you. That, to yeah. me, was what I saw last week, was mm -hmm. not someone who was well self-aware in any way <laughs> of the problem, but just kept repeating, you know, we have a broader responsibility with that one. Mm -hmm. I drank mm -hmm. every time he said that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting yeah. because it began so last wrong. year with, what are you talking about? We had no responsibility. And then it slow rolled to, okay, maybe a tiny bit. And then it was even as of two weeks ago when I did an interview with him where he said, I don't want to make decisions from my desk in California, if you remember that quote. Like, I don't want to make decisions yeah. about this platform. And I was like, well, you built it. And he goes, yeah, but I don't want to make decisions about it. And I go, but you built it, Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> like, and the monster's having, making some trouble you know, for the rest of the country. Um, and so it was an interesting thing. And then to the hearings two weeks later where it's, oh, it is my responsibility. So you're right, that's 100% true. But I mean, I, I'm more skeptical of the ability to um, fix this problem through rules. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are clearly problems we can fix through rules, but you know, there are, I, and I think this is why we have so much focus on terms of service is because right. for a long, long time in the privacy world, our solution has been notice and consent. Mm -hmm. That's been our framework for a long time. And you know, notice and consent doesn't work. Like nobody's actually surprised about that. Um, People don't read them, you know, what are they really agreeing to? They can't project what's going to happen. It disadvantages some people. If everybody else agrees, then the platform works for these people, but it doesn't work for these people. It doesn't work for a variety of reasons. But then what do you do? What's the answer? And um, that answer is hard because there are trade-offs. There's trade-offs on data portability and, and competitiveness for other companies that want to take advantage of Facebook data um, where the users like it. There's trade-offs on the cost of regulation and whether smaller companies will ever be able to comply and actually ever grow up to be able to compete with the Facebooks and the Gmails and the Twitters mm -hmm. of the world. I could go on, but I think you know we are seeing the GDPR. The GDPR is a set of trade-offs that mm -hmm. was basically made because Europe does doesn't really give a shit about the American internet industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to see what that has, is going to you know, wreak here. We already have the right to be forgotten problem, which is combating directly with our First Amendment and freedom of expression. Right. So you know, we're in the complicated trade-off stage. And I think that it's going to be hard, and we're going to lose stuff. And the question is, which are we going to lose? And I think that's why people focus on the wrong thing. Right. It's because it's an easy answer to a very sure. hard if, problem. If only we could read this, yeah. we'd understand. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> go ahead. So I, I guess I have a slightly different perspective because I'm coming from a different population. Um, in some ways, I thought it was great because, man, they showed that everywhere. Like right. every TV channel and every public place showed those hearings. And how often does that happen? Right. Um, one of the, you know, they've, this data in agriculture is not, it's not new. They've started to implement this over the case of the past, over, you know, the past five, seven, eight years. Um, and one of the things that apparently really surprised these, like, like Monsanto and Deere, although why it surprised Monsanto, I don't know, um, was the fact that 
uh, farmers wanted to know what was happening to their data. They were shocked that they weren't just implicitly trusted. Mm -hmm. So there was already sort of, of a, um, a questioning that was happening, which is why you're having, you're having these neutral bodies and, and like these alternative commercial platforms being developed. So at least in sectors that aren't saturated already, right. you're starting to see these, these alternatives that are being developed and these policies that are being created that, that are are forming partially because of, of the tr this trust and, and some of the problems that you've seen in like social media companies. And, and so the more that you see um, <laughs> Facebook kind of struggle to answer basic questions, um, the more I think you'll see advance advances in sectors that aren't as developed. It, it, such as this. I'm shocked that Monsanto thought it would be trusted, but okay. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I was shocked that they just had it implicit. Like, I, yes, I, I, but I'm from Missouri, so I mean, having Monsanto as a neighbor has given me kind of an implicit, like, distrust, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so when you think about the impact of that, because I do want to get to the government stuff, do you imagine when you say that it, it, it does have an impact, or where does the impact go uh, after this week? From the hearings, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Oh, yeah. Um, where does the impact go? I mean, I do think that it's, it was very useful to have these conversations. I mean, I think that we have been waiting for these conversations for about a decade and trying to get sort of widespread discussion mm -hmm. about the fact that, you know, people aren't in a position to necessarily understand these things. We saw the members of Congress really having very little understanding of how yeah. Facebook <laughs> actually works. And to well, me- Well, that's, that's a very low bar. But right, <laughs> but, but the reality is that members of Congress aren't so different from the general public. And so the, the concept that technology has advanced exponentially and we really haven't had any advances in privacy law for 20, 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, it is, it is an industry where in other places where there is information asymmetry, where things are hard to understand, where you, where you overestimate the risk and you underestimate the potential harm, that law and policy does step in to create um, protections for people, you know, in the automobile industry, in the healthcare right. industry. So, sure. you know, that has, where do we go from here? You know, I think that we actually need real steps to be taken because what I have seen is, you know, the companies do, you know, one step forward and three quarters of a step back, yeah. um, you know, and it's this dance when something bad happens, there's some reaction, but the fundamental issues don't get addressed. Right. I was really yeah. struck by how many uh, politicians said, how would you like to be regulated, Mr. Zuckerberg? That was right. really interesting to me. I was like, what? Like, you know, it was, it was an interesting thing to say publicly. But I, we yeah. know that there's often a lot of, you know, heat in D.C. Right. Um, but one of the, I think one of the Republicans said, you know, we either overreact or we do nothing. Right. And I'm like, you know, being here in California is a place where we really have sort of moved the ball forward in terms of consumer privacy in a lot of different ways. I mean, we wouldn't have privacy policies if it weren't for the California Online Privacy Protection Act. We wouldn't know about data breaches if there wasn't the California data breach law. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it's because California has a constitutional right to privacy that's broader than the Fourth Amendment that applies to so private parties I want to as talk well. in the time we have with where the, where the solutions come from, not just with privacy, but security right. too. Because, you know, one of the things that wasn't discussed very much for some reason I'm not getting was Russia, what happened on, on the platform. There were very few questions about um, about that, about mm -hmm. Cambridge Analytica. It was quite small compared to the obsession with the terms of service. Um, but but where does it come from? So let's talk about where, where it comes from. Then do we want it to come from a government which, which we have just discussed, which you have all just discussed, has a problem with its, of its own, which I think it was, uh, I think it was you, inherent incentivized attackers, where the government themselves mm -hmm. are the ones attacking and using this data. Um, so let's talk about where it comes from right now and then discuss what, how we can trust a government to make regulatory policy when it itself has an incentive to attack the population. Uh, and I'm just talking about here, it's happening all over the world elsewhere. So where do you imagine, so you think California or states from the states? Well, I think that's one option. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's where we do see movement quite a bit. So, you know, 
I would be surprised if we don't see some states moving on some of these issues, but I think there's a lot of discussion about what potentially can happen, you know, in Congress. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of conversation about, you know, you can have laws, but if you don't have strong enforcement mechanisms, you know, what kind of power, you know, the FTC and other agencies have. So there's a lot of conversations. I mean, there's a lot broken, which mm -hmm. is how we are in this space right now. Mm -hmm. All right, where else do we think that it's going to happen, these, these kind of protections? The, so I think going, going a little bit back to the, the last conversation, I think one thing the impact of last week um, impacted is the need for technologists and legislation. Um, and I think that is a great place to start because I, I definitely think there needs to be some type of technical um, informing on, on, on these legislative issues. And I think that's, that's definitely an answer. And there was a lot of talk about that after that, after it happened. So. Right. right, well, w that they're not in the room exactly. when they're making these exactly. things. They're absolutely not. They're seen yeah. as a second tier. That was obvious from the hearings. But there wasn't a lot of technological expertise. <laughs> exactly, so that was one of the first thoughts I had. So, so mm -hmm. and then where does that come from then? From training by these companies to, in their self-interest to do so, or? from the universities, from where? Because you, you, know, you're, you were talking about the idea of getting ethical mm -hmm. guidelines yeah. w w related to security and privacy exactly. within the training, which does not exist as far yeah. as I can tell. Does not, yeah. There's so where does that come from? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are some organizations like Tech Congress, which yeah. is you yeah. know, making- <laughs> And it, Travis is here. Travis is right <laughs> so, over here. Um, <laughs> so a uh, good line of sight, Travis. Very <laughs> right. um, which are basically yeah. helping to put uh, technologists in in, um, congress in as staffers in mm. congressional offices. And that's yeah. you know, one way you can Absolutely. kind of see the effect of that when you have senators who are asking questions, who have somebody who understands the technology there exactly. to explain things before them and help them you know, sort of get up to speed and, mm -hmm. and do their homework. And what about certainly within? universities. I came from Stanford, so sir, I think universities are important. <laughs> Maybe that's you know, self-importance <laughs> of, of academics, but I think that's another way too. And you know, I mean, com technology companies are very rich and they have yeah, lots of lobbying ability. They can also help serve an educational role even if it's somewhat self-interested. But exactly. I just wanna sort of push back on that a little bit because you know, there, there is a lot of technological knowledge that gets sort of brought to Congress or to legislators on issues. And it's, you know, good bills get drafted and good, good ideas are put forward and usually it's, it's decimated by lobbying from the industry side. So mm -hmm. there's sort of this idea that, you know, legislators don't know enough to, you know, to create rules and laws for the internet. But in my experience in 15 years working on these issues, that's not actually what's happening. What's happening is that the industry doesn't want any regulation and they muck it up in yeah, the right. system so it looks like nobody knows what they're doing. And law enforcement doesn't and law enforcement want to does accept the same any thing. advances in privacy. So there's a Sorry. complete no right. and the process of, and, and there's a good storyline saying, well, look at this mess of a bill. Legislators don't know what they're doing and that actually isn't what's happened behind the scenes. Right, I do think it takes responsibility away from them to actually do something. And I think to me Latin, next, last week was, you know, he didn't, he didn't, he looked reasonable and so, so sorry again. <laughs> and he wore a suit and he didn't sweat. And he wasn't an asshole like Bill Gates was when he went up there. And therefore, he's a nice boy kind of thing, which is, that drives me nuts. But so it seems like he, he's an adult, he has children. Stop it, stop calling him a boy. Um, <laughs> so I don't feel like there's gonna be any, any movement at all whatsoever, except if Facebook decides to do it themselves, from my perspective. But. Yeah, well, I mean, so there's, uh, to come back to the role of universities and researchers, yeah. they're, they're, one of the outcomes of this now is that the Social Science Research Network is, mm -hmm. has arranged with Facebook, uh, researchers, independent researchers, right. will get access to certain kinds of data. There are a lot of questions remaining about what kind of data and when and how and how that gets vetted. Um, but you know, that kind of independent oversight is, it will be useful. I, I think the, the, the key takeaway here though is that there are, there's n never gonna be like one knockdown solution, especially right. to infrastructures this big and this mm. powerful. Um, you need the government as, as much as I, as much as like my skin crawls to say that as somebody who like has to deal with the TSA and airports. Mm -hmm. You're like, we need the government to get involved. Mm -hmm. but, but you also need like power, like uh, existing counter levers to the power of some of these companies. That, that's one 
uh, so one source that that's was, powerful enough. That was that usually is the counter level yeah. with automobiles with finance. Absolutely, absolutely right. And so so it's going to be a bunch of these things coming together. And my uh, and the thing that I uh, that I often point to, and we don't think about these as tech ethics issues. We don't think about these as security ethics issues. Um, but another thing that we need to focus on, and it's deeply unsatisfying, is just making the lives of vulnerable people less contingent on the decisions of these technologists, on the decisions mm -hmm. of, of these people. So like access to healthcare and anti-poverty are tech issues, mm -hmm. right? And, and we don't fold those in, we don't think about those, um, and, and it's, it suddenly makes the problem seem really like big and intractable. Um, but really, that, that, the, the end game for me is making vulnerable communities less vulnerable to mm -hmm. the decisions of Mark or, uh, or other do at you, all. Do you imagine that, how does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen now. Right. <laughs> right, right. That's the other thing is that I think there are different timelines of change that, 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 are, that are important to grapple with so here. So you were talking about the government being one of those sol mm -hmm. solutions. But the, as you said, the government ad is advantaged by all this information and uses it in some way. Is that, it used to feel like that was the case. In this case, it feels perhaps not so much. Oh, I mean, that information is available to the government often without any real legal process. Um, and not just to our government, but increasingly to other governments uh, around the world. Um, you know, and I, I, I totally get and agree with what you're saying on the one hand, but I think on the other hand, we have this kind of, in the United States at least, we have this schizophrenia. We want the government to get involved and solve the problem of like big platforms when it comes to to privacy, but um, the government wants to come in and solve the problem of big platforms when it comes to spying on people and speech. Mm -hmm. You know, and here in the United States, we're like, well, people should be allowed to say and express what they want to say and express within, you know, certain realms, and our realm is quite large, but um, in Europe and in other democracies, they don't have that same um, value placed on freedom of expression. And, you know, for me, the thing that made me fall in love with the internet was that ability to say mm -hmm. what you wanted. It was, you know, the line from the Hacker Manifesto. You're judged <laughs> on the content of your mind and not based on your appearance or where you come or you're from or your religion or anything. And that idea, I mean, to me, I'm still in love with that idea. But the more you ask like the government to fix it or even to ask platforms to fix it, that value is put at risk. And it is very hard to do both those things. So where does it come from, e from each of you? And then I'd, I'd like to end by asking, Let's pick someone who's heavy in the idea that we need to have more surveillance because they're out to get us. Um, actually, they got us without the surveillance. It's kind of interesting um, to think about. Like, say you're Dick Cheney. All right, let's all be Dick Cheney for a moment. Uh, <laughs> that is dark, Karen. Yeah, I know. I'm going to the darkest person I can think of um, who's actually intelligent. Um, so I can think of a lot of dark, dumb people. Um, so what, what, what is the argument for the government being able to do these things. Is there one? Do which things? The, 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 the surveillance? Because surveillance. Oh. that's what they use. They use this idea of we're going to be attacked, but we got attacked. Well, the, the government does surveillance. The government yeah. can no, do I a get defense that. amount. I get the yeah. question is with what safeguards. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, there's very little scenarios where you just say to the government, sorry, you're out of luck and you have no other options. Mm -hmm. um, especially today, where there's so much data around. The question is, you know, what limits do we place on that, and what does the public get to know about it so that when things go wrong, we can make changes and fix it? Dick Cheney, <laughs> anybody? Sorry, where, where's Dick Cheney? <laughs> you don't want to make well, it wrong. This is, this is the, the, so the point I was, I was trying to, to make is that in the near term, like the, the kinds of counter pressures that are powerful enough are mm -hmm. going to be the government, and it's exactly this thought experiment that makes yeah. that so deeply unsettling yeah, exactly in the exactly. long term, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you could pick one thing that has to change in this, one law that has to be passed, one thing, each of you, I'd love to hear what you think it should be. Let's start at the end and finish. What about a minute? Well, I mean, years ago, I really talked about you know, this, this, the Cambridge Analytica just validates to me that in order for there to be change, people actually have to know what's happening. And so years ago, following sort of the Facebook quiz about Facebook quizzes, we introduced the California Right to Know Act, which would have given individuals the right to know what information was collected about them mm -hmm. and how it was shared, not just sold, but how it was shared with third party <laughs> apps, whatever. And to me, that forms, it doesn't, give control, but it forms the foundation for people knowing the actual impact on them. Because when it's personal, people understand the harm. When it is in the future, they don't. And so 
it's, it's not going to solve it, but I do think that real transparency and control is absolutely essential. Um, and as I said, I think having information that has no controls, publicly available information that users can't control in any way is really detrimental both for consumer privacy and government surveillance. Okay, Nick? Yeah, I think, I think um, GDPR is gonna have a lot of impact on, on where we're going um, because a big part of it is that you cannot assume with sin, consent from, from someone. And I think um, that, I think that's pretty important because I think a lot of times, a lot of consumers, you have no idea where your, your data is going once it's on the internet. Uh, you know, when you want privacy in your home, you close the door, but when you want privacy online, you have no idea what that even means anymore. Uh, and so I think, I think they're, they're, we're gonna have to learn a lot from GDPR. Okay. So I have three things that kind of connect in my mind at least. Um, first of all, all the things that I talked about potentially being able to be hacked in the US, all of those things can be done on reverse, right? So the US could decide to do this against Russia, you know, Ghana could do it against whatever. Um, and I think one of the worries that I have about over-regulation is that that could actually consolidate control in lesser and lesser corporations and make it harder for newer entrants to come on yep. the market. So if I were going to say that I want um, changes in legislation, I would actually say that it would it, it, there would be mechanisms to help bolster like newer entrants, whether that's to like support platform cooperatives, whether that's to support like nonprofits, I, I, like so less regulate. I mean, I, I know that it need to be regulated, but I don't want to make it harder for new entrants to become yeah. part of that because I think that the diversity in this in this ecosystem is is one of the most important things that we can support. Yeah, and I think what's astonishing is there's, it's not, when they were asking about the monopoly, I was like, no, it's scarier than that. There's too many of them. So mm -hmm. he does have competitors, but they're all just astonishingly powerful when they're arrayed yeah. in front of, between Google, Amazon, Facebook, and the others. five. Five, yeah. yeah. Uh, as one piece of the puzzle, and it's not a, 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 knockdown, not a knockout solution, but as one piece of the puzzle, I would like more rooms where future computer scientists are captive and I get to yell at them. Yeah, so I think there's a role for education to play. Um, yeah. and I think there's a role for agree. scholars like me um, and researchers like me uh, who, who study social and ethical dimensions of technology to have more exposure to future technologists. How many can you yell at a day? Oh, I mean, with technology. <laughs> <laughs> with funding. Do you, do you, yeah. I'm just curious if you feel like a scold, because I do, and I enjoy it quite a bit. Oh, all the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah, like, like a, although my children are better behaved than some of these people. Um, uh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, three things, right to encrypt, limitations mm. on the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act so that outside investigators can figure out what these algorithms and platforms are really doing, and the Email Privacy Act, if you want our content, you go get a warrant. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think I have ever been more proud in my entire career than sitting watching that panel and having something to do with it was everything to me. Thank you all. I'm supposed to announce that we are now breaking for lunch and it is available on the roof or in the basement. So you can go up or you can go down and we'll be back after lunch. Thank you. Thank you to all of everybody.
Hey everyone, please take your seats. We're starting in two minutes, two minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. How is everyone doing? Perfect. What do you think about the content so far? I hope we'll continue with the same way for the rest of the day. And thank you so much for coming. My name is Anchal Gupta, and I lead information security team at Facebook. So I had this pleasure and honor to put this particular session together. And I had so much fun doing it, but at the same time, it was very challenging. Why? Because we had only five spots, and there were so many great submissions for this session. Uh, that shows that there are so many passionate people out there who care about security, privacy, and online safety. So considering that, putting or selecting just five leading voices was really hard. I had to disappoint quite a few people. Uh, hopefully, uh, they definitely get a chance to speak at another stage. Uh, so uh, I'm going to do slightly different, uh, non-traditional introduction for my speakers, because uh, yeah, they are sitting some in the front row, because they are so well known in this space that you already know their achievements. I don't want to go over those. I'll talk about the stuff that you don't know about. So you may want to pay attention to their intros, because then later on, maybe you can blackmail them with some of this. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so our first speaker is Kate McKinley. She is from Facebook, and um, she is right now working on securing our Oculus platform. So all the augmented reality, virtual reality stuff that you see. So after her talk, you can definitely bug her about this. Uh, the fun fact about her is uh, she is a photographer and filmmaker. And she is currently working on her first feature-length documentary about Japan Night at South by Southwest. So while working on some of the really critical stuff, you will notice that these ladies are finding time to do some other exciting things, too. So let's welcome Kate. And he's going to talk about memory safety. Kate. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction, Anchal. Um, I'm Kate McKinley. I'm security partner for Oculus at Facebook. And um, today, I'm here to talk to you about what is the longest running crisis in technology computer security to date. And that is that um, we're working with languages that are inherently unsafe. And first, I want to talk about a little bit about what memory safety is. There's a definition on the screen. but it's the property of a language whereby uh, it, the program is not allowed to access or cannot access memory that it hasn't allocated or been given explicit um, permission by the operating system. And unsafe languages leave programs open to a lot of different attacks. So some really uh, common ones are access to uh, uninitialized or previously freed memory, buffer overflows. Uh, we also see race conditions, memory leaks, and type confusion. These are just the names of some of the attacks. But what they do is they allow an attacker to essentially take control of your program and take control of your computer. Uh, let's see. So um, we have a number of mitigations for these kind of attacks. Um, for example, uh, we make a stack on our programs non-executable. We randomize the layout of our libraries. We make sure that uh, pages in memory are either executable or uh, writable. Uh, additionally, we have more advanced technologies, such as canaries, where we put random values into the program to at runtime to make sure, and the operating system can ensure that that is not modified during runtime and sandboxing, whereby we separate our processes into different privileges. Additionally, we've developed a lot of tools over the years for static analysis, um, address sanitization, and recently, uh, Firefox has started integrating formal verification into its uh, libraries. So NSS specifically uses uh, formally verified cryptographic algorithms, which allows you to make certain proof statements about that program and about its safety. Um, but all of these are bypassable. Um, 
So we found that we can, uh, if we can't make our attacks on the stack, we can uh, make our attacks on the heap. We can return into libraries that are known to be safe and find code there that does what we want it to do. Um, we can actually find the location of a lot of these libraries in memory and then use that uh, as the information to make exploits work. Um, and even last month, uh, one of Microsoft's most recent uh, protections was uh, shown to be bypassed by some researchers at Black Hat Asia. Um, and if we look at the number of vulnerabilities here, uh, in roughly the last year, about 80% of Chrome and Firefox vulnerabilities uh, that were marked as critical were due to memory safety issues. Um, there's some other numbers up there for Mac OS. Um, OSS Fuzz is a project by Google to help um, find vulnerabilities in open source libraries. And they found over 1,400 issues. And that most of that is just, we could find more if more projects were on this, uh, on, on OSS Fuzz. And Project Zero's vulnerabilities, 70 out of 86 critical vulnerabilities that they reported and are public today are due to memory safety. So this is a really big crisis. Um, I think I've got my slides out of order. I talked about mitigations. So what we need to do is we need to bypass the C programming language, right? We need to make sure that we are working with languages that are safe by design. And to do that, we have to understand what our developers' use cases are. We can't just go to them and say, hey, use this cool new language. Um, we, have to we have to understand why they're choosing this tool and how we can help them use it properly. Whether they want to use Go, Rust, Swift, whatever they want to use, uh, but we should be encouraging them to use these languages. One of the issues that we have with this, of course, is tooling. A lot of times, new languages don't come with the best tooling. And so that is a thing that we can work on. We can help them discover new tooling. Um, since Rust is now used heavily by Firefox, that tooling has increased uh, substantially. We also need to make sure that our languages can interface with the existing things that we're using. We're not going to replace 100% of all C code ever written in a short period of time. This is a long-term project, and we have to be geared for the long term. So we need to be able to interface with the existing libraries that are in use. Uh, additionally, we have to be sensitive to performance issues. Sometimes adding a small amount of memory can substantially increase the cost to a company of delivering your products or services. Uh, and finally, we can start by doing similar to Firefox and replacing the most dangerous components first. Uh, so for example, uh, Firefox replaces Lib Stage Fright, which has uh, a number of vulnerabilities, not just um, a lot of memory vulnerabilities and how it processes SMS messages and things like that. And so uh, replacing these most dangerous components is probably the best way to start. Um, so we have to be careful about this uh, unstable foundations that we see. So a lot of times these are written in C. Uh, in so if you're trying to use a language like Python or JavaScript, uh, you may still be running on an unstable base. Uh, example is last year, uh, Microsoft Edge had a, uh, had a series of issues with out-of-memory vulnerabilities which were used to uh, gain access to other regions of memory. And that was, these were vulnerabilities in the underlying C code that uh, run the JavaScript interpreter. Um, so these are our interfaces, are these libraries. And we also have to understand that this is not going to protect us against logic bugs. But I think if you look at the number of issues that are just due to memory safety, we can just get rid of a lot of them right away. Um, so this is my advocacy. I think you should all be using Rust. <laughs> but a lot of other, uh, but again, there are a lot of other good languages out there. And these languages have good uh, online communities. They have uh, ways to learn. They're online compilers. Um, take a moment, learn about these languages contribute to development, make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. That was excellent. So our next speaker is Lee Honeywell. 
and she is at present a technology fellow at ACLU, but that's going to change very soon. In four weeks, she is starting her own security company. So if you're looking for jobs at startup, you may want to talk to her. Um, fun fact about her, and I want to make sure I get the uh, number correct here. She was once 804th best downhill ski racer in the world. <laughs> so come on over. Thank you. Oh, is this quicker? Great. Thank you for the, uh, the wonderful introduction there. Yes, very briefly, 804th. Only in the downhill discipline, not solemn, not giant solemn. Just downhill is like 1,200. Anyway, so yeah, halfway between heaven and hell, how do you secure grassroots groups? So I apologize for like double fisting it here with my phone. The, we don't have the, the little presenter mic or presenter screen. So um, my name's Lee Honeywell. Uh, I've made an entire career out of putting out fires involving computers. Um, I'm now at the ACLU, where I'm a technology fellow. Instead of putting out fires involving computers, I explain computers to lawyers so that we can sue the government. Um, <laughs> So this is, uh, this is the Golden Gate Bridge. In 1933, the Golden Gate Bridge made history by making an unusual decision for the time. They spent $130,000 of 1933 money, which is like a couple million dollars of today money, um, putting a net across the bridge. It was the first large American infrastructure project and one of the first job sites in the, construction job sites in the world where they put a lot of thought into having a safe job site so they had this net, um, they got the riveters who were welding red hot rivets into lead paint. Lead paint was totally, they were totally okay like using the lead paint, they were just like, maybe we shouldn't breathe it in. So they got people to use respirators um, and they required hard hats. It was the first job site in American history that required hard hats. Um, and measures like this uh, saved so many lives. It was an, a very, very safe job site. Only about 11 people died in the multi-year project um, of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, these are six of the 19 members of the Halfway to Hell Club. Um, falling off the bridge while it was under construction was called going to hell. And these were six of the 19 men who in the multi-year construction of the bridge were saved by the net. Um, so the reason I bring this up is to get you thinking about safety and what, what safety is in software, what it means to be designing software that is safe for its users. Um, in November, uh, December of 2016, um, about 3,000 people, maybe a few people in this room, signed a pledge uh, called the neveragain.tech pledge, pledging to refuse to participate in building the engines of deportation and the engines of genocide, uh, refusing to build databases of people by their religion, thinking about data minimization in software and where we should be just like deleting data, not having data. There was a great tweet sometime around fall 2016 that was like, uh, the last line of defense for user safety is a bunch of SREs with sledgehammers. Um, but it doesn't always need to come to that, right? We can, we can get ahead of the game. And uh, the pledge was 2,800 technologists saying, we are going to get ahead of the game. We're going to think about where we should be deleting, tech, deleting data, um, refusing to collect data in the first place, and designing secure systems that minimize our need to, to have insight into people's data. So some of the things that I learned from this were about the actual safety piece, but I learned a bunch of meta things in organizing this pledge um, about how to work together with people securely in a loose-knit fashion, fashion across organizations. Um, because when we're, we're talking about designing software, we often think about designing software for companies that are like somewhat well-defined collections of people that have sort of boundaries and, you know, the firewall, people have been saying the firewall is dead since I, like, before I was even in this field, which was like 10 years ago. Um, but there's still the idea of like a perimeter. Your, your organization has a list of employees. Um, and, and even if you're interacting with other organizations, there's sort of like, those are, those are known interactions. You've got a, a contract with the other company that you're sharing data with. Um, but we, we're starting to see a lot of work styles like BYOD and Beyond Corp and all of this stuff where people are like, oh, maybe it's actually nice to work in a lighter weight way. And then, of course, there's people who are fighting the good fight to protect individual users, whether it's the bird site, Facebook, all of these other things, thinking about ways to do user education, 
authentication based on people's like social connections and relations, two-factor authentication, getting people to do that kind of thing. And also thinking about like how can we just take ourselves out of the, the equation, whether it's end-to-end -end encryption or again that data minimization piece. And that's why you know I'm really glad to see people doing things like implementing, even if it's just a little secret conversation mode that you have to drop into. It's really great for like sending my sister my dad's passwords when he forgets them, which is frequent. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of organization is fundamentally a loose knit collaboration of people using tools that have been de designed for a soccer team to do activism and more serious things, but they're using tools that are not designed for that. Um, so as you're building new systems, as you're building new products, the, the thing that I ask people to think about is what is that squishy middle piece that is not an organization, but not just an individual? And how do we enable and build secure systems that protect those users? And some, some of it is getting the actual users to shift to like a security culture, right, of minimization, of least privilege, of all of these sort of buzzwords that we know as security professionals, how do we get the people using our software, using our products, to be thinking about that? And one of the things that also got me thinking about is that there's, with all of these like civil society groups that are organizing, um, whether it's the current administration or other countries around the world that have governments that are even more hostile, um, we as security professionals have a responsibility to reach out to those groups and not just be like, use Signal, use Tor, but really work to understand, I mean, that's important, but work to understand what those groups' needs are, how we can help as security experts, share our expertise with them. Um, and to also be remembering that there's, there's two big buckets of adversaries, those operating inside the law and those that don't care about the law. And to think both as we're protecting organizations, individuals, and the squishy middle in between of collaborating individuals, um, that those are both of our, like we have to be thinking about both of those threat models. And one of the reasons that I had all of these realizations in, uh, in working on the neveragain.tech pledge and in my more recent work at the ACLU was getting to work with a lot of people who were not like myself. And I think that sort of lines up with what we're doing today here to, to see what are, the, what are the people working on security issues that don't look like ourselves, uh, working to, to reach out to those people, reach across whether it's the aisle, the cubicle, um, or the, the conference room and say like, hey, what do you think about this? What has your experience been that has been different and how can I use that to, to be a better security practitioner? Um, so I had a long rant in this last slide about what I'm doing at the ACLU, but I'm not gonna be doing it for much longer. So you sh if you go to my Twitter, you can find the job posting if you're interested in explaining computers to lawyers so that they can sue the government. Um, and my slides will all be up here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Lee, that was awesome. So uh, I really like the way she compared the maturity of our software security with those nets and the hard hats. It seems like we are still at that stage that we are putting the safety nets around, we are putting the hard hats, as opposed to getting somewhere where we can call it really mature organization from security. So our next speaker is Kelly Lum. Uh, do we have, okay, Kelly's out there. So she's a security engineer at Spotify, and uh, in addition, she is a professor of application security at New York Tendon School of Engineering. And when she is not doing these two things, she is a semi professional small plane pilot. So we can ask her later on how she does so many things. And today she is going to talk about encryption and how to scale it. So here we have Kelly. Awesome. Uh, everyone can hear me all right, I, I presume. Um, first of all, thank you so much, uh, RSA, and everyone for having me. It truly is an honor to be one of the few selects. Uh, I see they're going to start talking crap about me up on that screen, so I'll try to not look that way. Um, this is not about something that I'm currently working on at Spotify. This is something that I worked on uh, maybe in uh, a life or two ago, but my life and 
was uh, when I worked for Tumblr, my life was all about certificates. I, couldn't, I could not spend a single day without thinking about certificates. So, and I think we've been thinking about encryption, uh, HTTP, TLS, whatever we're calling it right now. We've been thinking about this for ages and ages, right? And so this is my life in the cert trade. This is a boy sets fire reference. If you uh, recognize this, I'll buy you a drink. Probably not. But who am I and why would you care about anything I have to say? I've been around the block, started out in the government, worked for finance for a while. Now uh, Tumblr, Spotify, kind of getting into that whole um, waking up at 10 in the morning, getting wear, wear jeans lifestyle. So here's what the problem statement was at uh, Tumblr. And I'm probably actually going to go under time because I talk really fast, unless I go on a rant. Uh, <laughs> We wanted to get as much of our blog network over HTTPS as possible. We had you know, the Tumblr dashboard, anything that you logged into, anything that was dealing with sensitive information. That had been over uh, SSL, TLS uh, for a very long time. And there were two problems with getting the blog network over HTTPS. One is that we had uh, sort of a mixed content issue. Um, we had a lot of users who didn't really understand why they should have their blogs encrypted. And then there was also the problem that a lot of people had custom domains, right? The people who actually wanted their blogs encrypted didn't really, they really wanted it for money purposes, for SEO purposes, basically to make it, their overall organization look cool and secure. The people who actually might have actually really needed it were people who probably didn't realize that they needed it. You know, you are a blog that serves um, content that is uh, maybe uh, gay, lesbian, uh, LGBT+, plus, and you are serving to a lot of people in Russia or a lot of people in another country where the, uh, marginalized people could be punished or penalized for accessing that sort of information. So we wanted to figure out how to get those blogs over HTTPS while making the experience, one, user-friendly, you know, we didn't have to want to make our users go out, generate a CSR, send us a certificate, understand that what public-private key infrastructure was. And we wanted to uh, make it as inexpensive as, prop as possible. Remember, we're a startup. You know, we really got to not pay, I mean, pay our content distribution network to do it for us. No offense, Cloudflare. We love you. So then this wonderful thing came along, and it seemed like a miracle. It was really great for everyone. Let's encrypt. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Um, just, but the impression of Let's Encrypt, for a lot of people, they're like, oh, OK, I click a button, I install an app. All of a sudden, I have a beautiful certificate that I can pop onto my web server. Um, not so easy when you have thousands and thousands of web servers in your infrastructure, right? Not so easy when you have a lot of different domains owned by a lot of different people, a lot of different individuals. It's not just Tumblr domains. It's not just um, company dot whatever makes chocolate dot com domain. It's Individuals, Kelly wants a domain. Limpbiscuitrules.com wants a domain. Very important, limpbiscuitrules.com. <laughs> So there's lots of cool tools and clients that can interact with Let's Encrypt that can follow that process of talking to the Let's Encrypt servers, generating that wonderful certificate information, and getting it so that we could put it on our servers. But is there any one that would work in our infrastructure? And now there probably is. This is something that was in the works for three, three plus years. When Let's Encrypt was very, very young, there wasn't a lot out there. Now there's a ton of stuff. So really, we couldn't find anything that worked with our infrastructure. PHP, it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> but how does Let's Encrypt work? Just as a gentle primer, want to also just kind of get people to understand the problem statement uh, that you can't really just tell a user, oh, you want an encrypted website? Use Let's Encrypt. What's wrong with you? It's so simple. There's a lot of different steps that you have to do. One, you have to let Let's Encrypt know that you want a certificate for a domain. I'm not going to read all these slides. You can get them later. Two, Let's Encrypt is going to say, you want a certificate for that domain? Prove it. Here's a challenge. Here's a thing that you have to sign all your stuff with. Host that challenge. And, we'll, and if you can actually host that on that domain, we like you. We'll let you have a certificate. Once you prove that you own that domain, then you can then talk to Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt will say, you're good. You're copacetic. Give us a CSR. That's when you actually do get your certificate information. But that's only half of the problem. We understand how the system works. That doesn't seem so hard. 
But what does the actual communication format look like? Does anyone here like reading RFCs? I fucking love it. Sorry. <laughs> So what, is that, what does that communication look like? Is there a header? Is it in formatted in, in, in XML? Is it a JSON uh, payload? We had to really figure out, look at a lot of previously written code, look at the RFC, or lo look at all this stuff, and figure out how this works. So not just as simple as press the button, get a certificate. Again, keep this in mind, the, the solution that, and I'm not saying this to di this Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt saves our lives. Let's Encrypt made us able to provide this service for our customers in a way that they didn't have to understand how to do anything. All they had to do was flip a little switch, and they didn't have to pay any money for it. Accessible and just so much easier than what we had before. But then, now how do you get those certs? And I, I kind of underestimated here. I said, oh, there's a lot of little databases and oh, there's a lot of servers. Thousands of servers, right? Distributed uh, digital, distributed computing, right? Lots of databases in the back with private sensitive information, lots of, uh, lots of uh, web servers in the front that need to have our certificate stuff installed. So we made a Scala service. That's it. Keep all of our private secret stuff back here. Have something that can cache those requests. And if we do have a request coming in for a domain where we haven't loaded that certificate information, we reach out, grab it, and pull it in. Very sort of dynamic. Do you have a cert uh, is this uh, requesting a site for a certificate? Do we have a certificate? Give it up. I'm looking at my notes to make sure I didn't miss anything. Nope. I also wanted to get in, this is something that I glossed over a little bit, is in terms of our design decisions. We really wanted certificate usage to be opt-in, one, because it really was all about that user experience. You flip on HTTPS, TLS, whatever, for all of your sites, it's going to break a lot of stuff. You may have hard-coded links that all of a sudden don't work. You may have um, um, JavaScript that isn't going to load because of mixed content problems. The same thing with cascading style sheets. All of a sudden, your beautiful uh, page that you, that you paid a designer thousands and thousands of dollars looks like something from 1998. <laughs> Not cool. Also, we wanted to keep under the rate limit, right? We also don't want to break the experience where you know, we're pounding Let's Encrypt, this wonderful service that we want everyone to have access to uh, just by constantly hammering it for every single domain that has um, an HTTP re HTTPS request going to it. I've talked to some other people, and I will not name names because I I am not a snitch. Uh, there are some other companies that sort of did a different approach to this. They actually did, and they didn't do it all at once, but they actually said, here are all of the websites that we host that have custom domain names. We're just going to go out to Let's Encrypt and generate a certificate for all of them. We didn't want to do that. We did not want to have that on us. We did not want somebody to be like, who the hell are you, and why did you generate some private uh, certificate information for us? I uh, didn't ask you to do this. Now somebody can steal it and pretend to be me. We want, really wanted the concept of consent and deliberation in terms of I am making a conscious decision to opt into having my site encrypted, and I may not know why I want it, but I'm telling you that I want it. Sort of like me and candy. <laughs> All right, 43 seconds left. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, just Grab me after. Again, thank you so much for having me and listening to me being hyper. Bye. <laughs>Thank you, Kelly. That was amazing. I think um, she has set a really good example as to how we as security experts should think about providing solutions. Because we at times think about, oh, this is a solution, and we don't really ground it in reality. We don't think about how that's going to work for our users, for our engineers. So next up, we have Jen Taylor from Cloudflare. She is head of product and design. and. Um, when she is not doing product security advice, she is doing whitewater rafting guidance. So she was at one point a professional teacher slash coach for it. So you can still connect with her to get some tips on that. 
And today, she is going to talk about DDoS, believe it or not. So she'll make Mirai Bot look like a piece of cake. <laughs> Correct? <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jen Taylor. I'm head of product and design here at Cloudflare. And at Cloudflare, we have over 8 million sites and applications on our network, uh, which means as a result of serving individuals, large enterprises all over the globe, we see a, a broad variety of traffic. The good news is a lot of that traffic is good. The bad news is a lot of that traffic isn't. Um, but what we do here at Cloudflare is inspect our traffic to identify threats uh, and then focus on ways that we can understand them um, in the industry and help mitigate them. So specifically, when we look at DDoS, I want to orient people to sort of what the world looks like to an attacker. There are kind of two ways they're going to get you, right? The first is kind of kicking it old school, which is kicking a lot of traffic over your network. So basically, flooding your network with huge volumes of traffic, basically to clog up your pipes. And that's kind of when you read headlines about big DDoS attacks, these are the things that typically hit the headlines because they're sexy, right? It was this big, and it's very compelling. What we've actually seen more of more recently are more targeted attacks where attackers identify a specific choke point or vulnerability with a site and then just hammer that site with a huge volume of requests. So whereas large bits through the pipe will slow down the whole network, request-based attacks have a tendency to just slow down a single site or application. And of course, there are those enterprising attackers that manage to do it. When that happens, frankly, everything hurts. So looking at the world of those large volumetric attacks, you'll notice over the course of the last of the 10, 15 years, these attacks have grown exponentially in their size. And if you think about sort of why is that? Well, you know, if you think about like what did our networks look like in 2007? Like to clog up the pipes of a network in 2000, they were, they were smaller. We didn't have as much capacity. Part of the reason why these attacks keep having to get bigger is that our networks and our infrastructure are just getting bigger and bigger on a regular basis. Now, looking at these attacks. In the life and year of life and year here at Cloudflare, looking at these large volumetric attacks, you'll notice that they're fairly consistent. We have some that really spike, but for the most part, they're fairly limited in the frequency. And one of the things we did last September is we announced um, unmetered mitigation, which means we no longer kick people off our network for bad traffic. And as a result, you kind of notice they really trail off in the last quarter of the year. Mostly it's because like attackers are like, oh man, that's no fun. I'm gonna go move on to something else. Now, that doesn't mean that the volumetric attack is dead. In fact, what we actually see with attackers is that they're enterprising individuals. And what they do is they kind of change their pattern. And so you'll notice here again, another year in the life of Cloudflare, you know, we continue to see sin flood attacks on a fairly regular basis. You will notice, though, that after we announced unmetered mitigation, the attacks just become more spaced out. Again, attackers are sort of like, you know, it seems like they kind of got that nailed, I'm going to move on to something else. And that's kind of where we've seen the industry moving. Now, I talked about kind of life in the year. If I just look at what my last week has looked like, this is sort of what we've seen on our network. And I actually had to have our designer update the slide this morning because we had a gnarly sin flood attack this weekend. But what is actually interesting here is that these aren't necessarily huge, like network sweeping volumetric attacks. What we're noticing is that a lot of attackers are going back to old tried and true methods using UDP protocols and reflection and amplification attacks. So here at Cloudflare, we basically have seen an attack on our network every 40 minutes for the last six months. And if you were to look at the inventory of what they are, they're some of your favorite UDP protocols. And people are like, what's going on? Like, why is that happening? Well, like, top of the list is NTP, right? That's the time protocol. And if you think about what's happening in the industry around applications and devices, I probably have like three devices on my body right now that are leveraging NTP to stay in sync via time. And if you don't lock down that server, you're creating an attack vector. Similarly, SSDP, the plug and play protocol, has also become an interesting attack vector. And this is one I actually want to spend some time on. So it's the plug and play protocol. You leverage it over port 1900. And the thing that's really interesting about these attacks is that they don't need to be long and they don't need to be big. 
but because of the nature of the protocol, it's a chatty protocol, so you can actually, through reflection and amplification, drum up quite a bit of targeted threat attack traffic. This is how it works. An enterprising attacker spins up, probably on a cloud instance, some capacity, and spoofs the victim. They then put out an SSDB request, probably to uh, something like a broadband router that isn't, doesn't have port 1900 locked down, floods the broadband routers, and SSTP is a chatty protocol. SSTP gets the, 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 gets the request, and they're like, oh, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm running an iPad and a DVD. And, and the packet size that comes back to the victim is typically 22x the volume that they generated. So again, small volume, old school replication uh, and, and, and pushing it back to the victim um, directly through that. Now, I talked a lot here about what's happening in that y-axis and sort of the shift that we're seeing in those volumetric attacks. But I wanted to take a moment to see what's, what we've seen starting to happen at layer 7, those request-based attacks that are happening at the application layer. And if you'll notice here again, life in a year of Cloudflare, um, if you look what we're seeing in terms of layer 7 attacks, it's fairly consistent. It's actually growing in some cases. And you'll notice our intention around unmeter mitigation really didn't do much to deter layer 7 attacks. If anything, you could argue that you see actually some growth. So what does a layer 7 attack look like? So this is a small IoT-based attack that we saw earlier this year. And unlike the pre preceding attacks that I talked about, they only needed about 2 gigabits of traffic to generate this attack. Not a lot. But what you'll notice is it, they generated 2 million requests per second. And if you turn around and you point that at a large enterprise, you can bring a site or an application down fairly quickly in a fairly targeted fashion. Two other things that I find very interesting about this attack is you'll notice it only took about 50,000 unique IPs to generate that volume of traffic. So again, you can do a lot of damage with a small surface area. And if you think about the millions and millions of IoT devices out there, yeah, I get a little yeah, nervous. The other thing you'll notice is, again, it's fairly small. It's short. Um, and what I'm actually showing you here is, is a, um, a chart of the HTTP traffic by data center. The other thing that we've noticed with these attacks is they tend to be fairly regional because they tend to target a specific device. And what you're seeing here is actually a spike in traffic in this attack from our Hong Kong data center, which means that the device used to perpetrate this attack was probably an IoT device uh, in and around the China market. So in closing, what do you do as an individual? I think you continue to do what you've done already, which is put your service behind a DDoS mitigation solution. You leverage and employ HTTP rate limiting so you can throttle the traffic as you see it. And you continue to buy yourself a little extra capacity above and beyond what you typically would need so you have flexibility if those fluctuations in traffic happen. But most importantly, as we saw with the reflection and amplification attacks and with the IoT attacks, lock it down. If you're not using it, lock it down. Reduce your exposure, reduce your surface area. Um, you basically want to minimize the surface area that you present to an attacker to help perpetrate an attack. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. That was great advice. And now we are on to our last speaker. Um, that's Window Snyder. She is... Um, CSO at Fastly, and I was asking her what, are, what is uh, one of the fun facts about you, and this is what she told me. Before starting in tech, she was a seamstress at a costume store. So that's the diversity our speakers bring. Uh, they have a lot of different things that they do outside of securing our world. So let's welcome Window. Actually, have this. Thanks. So apparently, I'm the only speaker who uh, was expecting a podium. So, <laughs> just for me, they found one, which I so appreciate. Um, so I'm sure someone can identify my password by by that. So I'm going to have to change that, you know, eventually. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I used to build 
costumes in a, um, in a, a costume shop, actually. It was a, a theater. Um, so not a costume store. You couldn't come in and, and buy them. So actually, I can, I can build really froofy, like poofy, period costumes. But not very well. It actually resulted in two different trips to the emergency room. I managed to like <laughs> sew through my finger. I managed to like take a steamer and like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so um, it was great that I eventually moved over into tech because <laughs> that was not a career I was going to last very long in. So um, I am going to talk to you today about how to do application security with a small team, a small budget, or perhaps neither, <laughs> nothing at all. Um, and uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, my name is Windows Snyder, and I have worked on security teams uh, at large organizations and small organizations, at Apple and Microsoft, at Mozilla, and I'm currently the CSO at Fastly. And um, I feel like in this kind of space, you can go ahead, comfortably date yourself, and like, not have to worry about you know, what that means. I started um, as a software engineer uh, in 1995, and working on primarily security-sensitive systems. This is before we even had an application security industry. We didn't have books. <laughs> we didn't have conferences. We didn't have, we had hardly anything. We had uh, some folks who'd been working in this space who you know, had, had come up with some ideas. We had crypto. We had books about crypto. Yeah, that was pretty much it. Application security was essentially just crypto. So um, things have really changed, but some things really haven't. Um, and one of the things that uh, I see everywhere I go is an underinvestment in application security. Um, and part of that is sometimes it's a, it's a recognition, maybe late, um, that, you, that you need this kind of work, that you need this organization in your, in your company. And sometimes it's actually just a, a difficult time trying to build this organization. Um, so sometimes it's about, like, for a small development or a startup, uh, for a small development environment or a startup, it's, it's, it's easy to trade off long-term strategic choices of all sorts, not just security, for getting features shipped because it's... it's about you know, delivering um, and, and, and getting to market and capturing the opportunity. And a lot of things, not just security, maybe reliability or uh, localization or you name it, accessibility, um, don't get the attention that they need until later in the process. And security is, of course, on that list. And for more mature organizations, sometimes they think that it's maybe their code's not likely to be targeted, that, um, that attackers will go after different weaknesses, uh, weaknesses or maybe their, their specific um, area is low risk. Um, so they decide not to make an investment into, into security, application security specifically, until they start feeling pain. And sometimes that's a compromise, and sometimes it's a competitor with similar technology that's compromised, and then they realize, oh, that could have been us, and then they you know, try and hurry and spin something up. And, uh, and now you find yourself, if you're this lucky person working on application security in one of these environments, which is every environment, you find yourself thinking, uh, You've got to back, your, back security into this situation. You've got a pile of legacy code. Maybe you've identified lots of vulnerabilities and you've got this massive backlog. Um, or maybe you haven't found any at all because no one on your team knows how to go looking for them. And uh, you might find yourself attempting to address a huge amount of application security work alone or with a small team. And uh, you might have the, the headcount to hire folks. But as a lot of you know, this is a really specialized space. Um, to, to really be effective as an application security engineer, you probably were a developer for some number of years. You started working on security, and that's another several years. And to, be, to begin to be effective in the application security space, you're probably already in your career many years before um, you're going to be you know, really effective in that space. So, of course, it's hard to hire, hard to hire those folks, and they're incredibly expensive. Um, so it's hard to build those teams. And, uh, and, and even if you, are, you have the headcount, being able to grow as fast as the application security work piles up, especially as you start to recognize just how deep the rabbit hole goes, um, it's hard to, to keep up. So no matter where you're starting from, there are lots of things you can do to dramatically reduce the vulnerability of your code base that you can do with a really small team or with no team at all. Um, the first is to accept that you can't be perfect. Um, which I think most folks in this room recognize, and it's mostly our jobs in the organization to convince everybody else that that's the case. Can't be perfect, and it's all about just reducing our risk. Um, so we make it harder and more expensive for the attacker to go after whatever it is that's valuable in your environment. So we identify assets. Is the app collecting personal information? Do you perform financial transactions? Is your system sending communications? Is code installed in the system or a device that's valuable? That's every device. Is it running on a site with any users at all? <laughs> An attacker might want to go after the data you store or are transmitting across the network um, or even just capture or even just use your app to compromise the user's device, um, like a phone, and use that as a stepping stone, an entry point into the system because the app is probably 
um, getting less security investigation than every other entry point to the system. So that is uh, a reason that no matter what your app is doing, that you need to consider this for your environment. Um, vulnerabilities in the web app could be used to compromise the servers to allow an attacker to host exploit kits that take advantage of security issues in browsers or to compromise data on the user's machine or even to mine Bitcoin. Like the opportunities are, are endless for the attacker. So they are willing to be opportunistic. So yes, your little game app has value to an attacker. Your little web app has value. Attackers are opportunistic and will make use of all sorts of problems that you might consider beneath their notice. Your lower risk SaaS app might compromise the data of a customer who's actually the real target and all of your other customers are along for the ride. Uh, defense in depth re requires compromising multiple aspects before getting to assets. And so they might be willing to look at, let's say, the content management service that considers themselves low risk because uh, they're just hosting a copy of it. And the one thing that they're doing is, 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 is pushing it to wherever. So we got that thing locked down and we don't have to worry about everything else. Absolutely not. The, uh, the, the, this, this entire space is, is, is your problem, too. So anyways, we first do the things that we all know we need to do, but for some reason we find it incredibly difficult to get done. So that's you know building security through all aspects of the development process, whether that's the SDLC or something modeled specifically for your space. It can be very lightweight, but it needs to be a consideration at every aspect. So you work to improve code quality and architecture because you want to reduce the number of vulnerabilities. Move to a higher level language, as one of our earlier speakers brought up. Fantastic. That gets rid of a lot of memory corruption issues. Um, and all these things make it expensive to exploit vulnerabilities. So the vulnerabilities are still there, but it's just harder to make use of them. Um, leverage the security mechanisms from the platform. Don't roll your own. There's no reason to build it yourself. If it exists in your platform, take advantage of it. It's fine. Oh, we need to build our own allocator because it's more performant if we do. No, you don't need to do that. <laughs> Every developer wants to be a kernel developer for some reason, but no, don't. You don't need to write your own allocator. You're not going to implement all the security mechanisms that are in place to avoid all the incredibly numerous um, memory corruption issues that we've seen over the, over, over the years. So just don't. Use the memory allocator, allocator from, your, from your platform. Um, there are encryption libraries. Definitely don't roll your own there. Um, leverage a library for that. Memory management. Um, security training. Yeah, it's for everybody. No matter how big your organization is, yes, you do need to do security training. Um, and that's because you've got this fantastic opportunity with peer review. You, you want to patch quickly, of course. Your whole infrastructure, whether that's the workstation for your devs, your workstation for HR, uh, for uh, your servers, you name it. You want to patch quickly to reduce the opportunity, the window of opportunity for attackers to uh, uh, take advantage of vulnerabilities in all the technologies that you depend on. And of course, they have vulnerabilities. And the 30-day uh, the or 60-day or 90-day window that you've, got, uh, that you've agreed upon to, uh, to, to get that, that, that patch rolled out, it's a huge window for the attacker because they're being opportunistic about it. They're like, oh, there's a vulnerability out there, and they spray the internet looking for it. So even though your site might not be on their radar, as soon as they identify that, that your site has this vulnerability, they, now you are. So it, 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 you don't even have to be, they don't have to be looking for you. They just take advantage of the fact that you're around. Reduce the attack surface area. Um, this is something you don't even need security folks to do. They can, you, you, you explain a concept to them, and they can go about identifying ways to um, do input processing, for example, in one place. So instead of having input validation everywhere, you've got it in a single point of uh, place. Um, isolating components. They can identify uh, core functionality th themselves and is isolate it and say, oh, this, this functionality is over here. It should happen on a separate service. Uh, these two components should speak to each other through a narrow channel. So we only have a narrow uh, uh, set of opportunities for an attacker to take advantage of a vulnerability that might be anywhere in the system because we only have you know, a handful of, um, of APIs that are even available. So if, the, if there's a vulnerability, it has to be one of these APIs in order to get from this system to that system, whatever the system might be. This might be a service. This might be a, a, an actual machine. You name it. Um, the engineers themselves can identify how to isolate these components, and you leverage the benefit of a pretty robust security architecture through isolation. And, and importantly, you need to reduce the, the data that you store. I, I, I think this is, uh, I'm really excited, you know, one of our other speakers brought this up earlier today, that this has become something that the industry has been thinking about more seriously. But once upon a time, it was actually quite shocking to say something like reduce the, the data that you store. Because if you store it, you have to protect it. It's definitely interesting and valuable to somebody. Um, and you're probably not um, as good at protecting it as you would hope to be. So if you don't need it, don't protect it. We're not later going to come around and use machine learning on it to pull out something. And no, it's not going to happen. Um, AI might might eventually produce something inf interesting for your organization for, uh, on top of this data, but you can start collecting it at the point in time when you have a business need or business justification for storing that data. If you don't need it, don't use it. Um, the same reason you like shred documents before you recycle them. You, uh, you don't carry all your money with you at the same time. Um, <laughs> 
I take my laptop out of my car before I walk away from it. And part of that is because I live in San Francisco, and part of that is because <laughs> it's just such an obvious security mechanism. Somebody breaks the window, I'm bummed, of course, because I have a broken window, but I still have a laptop. So, you know, these are, these are, these are things that we, for the most part, know how to do, but it's, uh, it's, it doesn't get deployed at the same level that we would hope to see it deployed in industry. So uh, I think we all have a lot of things, all of our organizations have a lot of things that they want to get done, but it's incredibly difficult to justify doing these things. So these are things engineers can go around doing without you. It leaves your time for other things that they can't do without you. So you can leverage tools if you can. Okay, objection, oh, they, they, they produce so many red flags that uh, we can't wade through all of, all of the output and make something useful out of it. Yeah, I know, I feel your pain. But you can outsource this out to the engineers and have the engineers evaluate the red flags in their components because earlier you got them security training so they know how to identify um, vulnerabilities in their environment. They do peer review to um, evaluate check-ins before uh, they end up being deployed into who knows where. Um, and all of this reduces the burden on the application security team which probably only has a handful of people if you're lucky um, and allows you to leverage um, the, the, the resources in the rest of the organization to um, amplify the impact that your application security team has. So thank you very much. Good luck. <laughs> it's a very difficult job. Thank you, Rindo. Thank you, Rindo. And uh, now may I request all the speakers to come on stage. Ah, uh, that's okay. <laughs> Do you let me? Yeah, then I'll be able to see all the speakers in one go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, perfect. So, you guys talked about a lot of diverse things there, like starting from encryption to securing your network to memory safety to activist safety, and uh, Windows talked about like securing everything. <laughs> so, looking at that diversity, I was thinking. Um, when I was talking to you before we came together and um, spoke at this um, event, you all have very different backgrounds. Some of you started as product managers, some of you started as developers, and some of you started directly in security. So I want to hear about your experiences when you started in different careers and you transitioned over to security, or maybe you just started in security and uh, what are your experiences? Like, do you feel specific challenges? Do you feel like, I wish I had not started at this particular stage versus I should have started as a dev? I just want to hear from you. And we can go in any order. So. <laughs> Whoever Everyone wants just to instantaneously go. looks at me. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, I've I've pretty much always been in security. Uh, that's not to say that I haven't done any uh, development, but um, uh, for me, it was always you know little kid, no friends, getting in trouble. Statue <laughs> Statue Limitations is over, so I'm not really too shy about talking about it. But. Um, uh, I, now that I work for uh, Spotify and also at my previous career at Tumblr, one of the things that I do think that I missed out a little bit on uh, by not like spending a little bit of time in development, so I'm a security engineer, so not only am I like breaking other people's stuff, but I'm also building uh, security mm -hmm. tools, building security enhancements. If we find a vulnerability, I can work on fixing it myself with a developer rather than you know, just being like, okay, you hate me now. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there is a lot of, of real joy that comes from, ooh, I broke this thing. I'm like the coolest, leadest person in, ever, you know, like my, my hoodie and my magnifying glass. But there is also this big satisfaction that comes out of like, I made this thing work, this is my baby. Mm -hmm. And then once you are working with developers, you can kind of understand sort of the psychological perspective that they're coming from when you come back to them and say, hey, uh, there's something wrong with your baby, mm -hmm. how that impacts them and how you need to be a, be a little bit softer touch than just be like, I broke your stuff. <laughs> um, so I 
really have spent most of my career as a product manager, and I've worked on a variety of different products, but almost everything I've ever worked on has had some aspect of security. Um, and I've always found that that's the thing that ends up being the most interesting to me, um, and also the most important piece of the puzzle to solve for our customers. Um, and so for me, as I sort of looked at the things I'd done at a variety of different jobs, I started realizing that like, I spent a disproportionate amount of my time partnering with the engineering team, the security organization, really thinking about how do we solve these things and solve these things at scale. And then I was like, why don't I just go do the security thing? Because it's the most interesting part of my job anyway. Um, and you know, for me as a product manager, you know, what kind of gets me out of bed in the morning is the problems that our customers are having. And for me, if there are ways to solve the complexities of security in ways that are easy and simple for people to implement and to use and really are transparent to, to what's happening, um, that is incredibly exciting for me. Um, my story is a little bit complicated in that I started out wanting to be a physicist. Um, my, my mom, at some point in high school, I have no recollection of this conversation, but my mom insists that uh, she was at, you know, I was doing my university application. She's like, Lee, why don't you apply to computer science? You're always farting around on the computer until the wee hours of the morning. Guilty as charged. Uh, I was like, no, I want to be a particle physicist. <laughs> which turns out involves a lot of computers anyway, but uh, it also involves quantum mechanics, which I was not so good at, and somehow I eventually wandered back into computer science. Um, but this is actually uh, the, the objection that I gave to her when I was saying, no, I'm, I'm doing physics, uh, was it turns out a very typical objection in the, like, why girls don't go into computer science, which is, I was like, mom, I don't want to sit behind a computer all day. Mm -hmm. Which it turns out, of those of us in the room, who actually, like, sits behind a computer all day? Like, you're, you're talking to people, you're interacting mm -hmm. with other humans. Um, so much of the work in the field is actually that, that interpersonal stuff. Um, and, I mean, I, I do end up spending quite a bit of time behind a computer. But uh, I, tell, I tell all of this story um, to make the point that the, uh, the, the path that I took was not the one that I expected, but it ended up being the one that I needed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so I originally came into this industry as a developer, and I developed in a number of languages uh, for quite a long period of time before coming out here to work in the security industry. And um, I think that that background can give you a lot of um, uh, strengths that you can use in security. So if you're thinking about getting into security as a developer, it's never really too late. Um, but uh, I also really felt coming into security after some number of years in my career that I just knew nothing. And I felt like I was starting all over again. And um, I found that the community, and specifically the company I worked at, ISEC, was very welcoming and uh, helped me to kind of grow as a security engineer and has led to some really unique opportunities. Okay. So I was always in security. Um, I was in security before there was much of an industry to call it security. Um, I was a software engineer working on security critical systems, whether it was financial transaction systems or actual security products. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it would be nice to try another space someday, but <laughs> I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. So um, yeah, this is, this is a fun place to be. Um, I would say, though, if I had a chance to experience other aspects of the business, I think um, I would really enjoy that. I think one of the uh, difficulties of our space is that there are a lot of folks that are very religious about their security um, uh, practices, that they, they're, we might hold in our heads the idea of like what the perfect security solution might be. And then anything that we do that doesn't achieve that is, uh, is you know, somebody is just, they don't understand security or they, they don't care about this. Mm -hmm. um, and when in reality, of course, they have their own criteria that they are measuring and there's a business decision behind, uh, I mean, assuming competence, which I try to do, that there is a business reason that they are um, holding the position that they have and maybe they also have to balance things like, you know, performance or cost or, um, you know, a delightful customer feature that they want that undermines all of the security mechanisms that you've enabled. Fantastic. That, that's, that, that's the real world. So I think if more of us spent more time in other aspects of the business, whether that was in sales or finance or um, directly interacting with users and customer support um, and, and, and recognizing how expensive a security feature can be that results in customer service calls that, um, 
you know, strip away the entire margin. I worked once in a place that a single customer service call would eliminate the entire margin for that license. Mm -hmm. And so everything that we did that resulted in a customer service call was basically saying that like that, that product is now free. Um, so these are the considerations that I, I feel like uh, as an industry, we are not as open to. Um, and um, because we are used to doing battle, right? Like, like trying to convince folks that, you know, you know, this is really important. And it's getting easier in 2018, but like, you know, for having been in this space for 23 years, um, I, I feel like I've spent a lot of my career trying to convince folks that you actually need to do something here. Um, and then also you should do this, that uh, I see um, that, that it's, it's actually uh, unusual for folks to actually consider what the other aspects of the business really, really need when it comes to considering these security, um, these security choices, and that they're not idiots, and then they don't, it's not that they don't care about security, it's that they care about a lot of things, and they've got a lot of priorities that need to be um, coordinated. Yeah. Yeah, I was myself, I transitioned from a software engineering to security, and there are two things that um, uh, have helped me is uh, one is assuming good intent, and second is having empathy. Because when you have these two things, you will be partnering with engineering as opposed to having that uh, across the table battle. So um, um, you guys uh, uh, are representing, sorry, I'm so used to have been around guys. You Y'all <laughs> <Y'all laughs> This is my first panel where I have like all it's females so and I'm like, <laughs> you break. guys, and you're like, what? <laughs> um, so you are representing different um, uh, industries here and you have been in the space for a little while. So how have you seen the security threat landscape change over years? I'm and you can go in any order. Like, it doesn't have to be. We have to. <laughs> yeah, I went first last time, so. What was that? I went first last time. Yeah, so she doesn't want to go next. <laughs> I mean, I think the big one that I've seen is the uh, we're just not keeping up. And I think a, a number of folks made points, especially Window, about the, uh, your, your, the size of your application security team is never going to grow at the same pace as your code base, <laughs> basically, <laughs> right? And that, that applies both within individual organizations but also across the entire field. So we need to be thinking about like how do we, how do we move beyond just that mapping of like the developer to the percentage, fract- the fractional time of a security engineer to building tools that uh, multiply the effects that, that those security engineers are having because we're just never going to keep up otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I, I have something to add to that, which is um, when we talk to developers, developers are not um, against security. It's not that they don't want to do it. They come to us and they tell us where their problems are. They tell us what um, they think needs to be fixed. And we need to listen to them and help them to find ways to fix their own issues and to get the business to prioritize these issues um, versus uh, always coming down like a hammer on developers. Like they are caught between us and the business and we need to be the ones to kind of be on their side. I've seen a a lot of movement and maybe this is just because of the trajectory of my career, but I've seen a lot of movement where people are more moving towards empowering uh, developers to be, have the security tools and have the security knowledge so that we know, the security team isn't acting like as the mother, father, may I, you know, where they have to come to us for every little thing or everything has to get rubber stamped to where we can allow them to effectively and trust them to effectively uh, assess risk and, and uh, mm-hmm. what, what their threats are so that um, one, the business doesn't just look at security as this thing that we have to pay for. It doesn't make us any money. It looks as, at us as an enhancement to the, to the development pr- uh, process as a whole. Yeah, I think for me, I've noticed the conversations with the engineering organization have shifted from at the end, right before you're about to go live, whoa, have you talked to security about it? To this sort of like a much more kind of proactive approach where kind of earlier in the development, earlier in the life cycle, those conversations are occurring. And increasingly, the tools that we're empowering the engineering organization with have a lot of those principles sort of already built in and baked in. And so there's kind of this proactive kind of guidance and conversation that happens at the front end rather than sort of the reactive potential kind of after the fact. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lot less expensive that way. And I, and I just, 
I mean just in terms of like the psychic overhead of, of how you work is just it's much easier if you can have it seamlessly happen up right. front. And I think everybody's realizing and kind of feeling the benefit of that. Hey, One of the it's things Thursday. I We're deploying tomorrow. Can you run a pen test? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, um, uh -huh. yeah. One of the things who I find really us? interesting yeah. Yeah. about huh. the changing threat landscape is all the new and creative ways folks have found to monetize compromised devices and, and, and computers. It used to be once upon a time that like uh, they would compromise a website and then they would you know, maybe deface it because, you know, they weren't actually trying to make money off of it. And then, well, they're hosting an exploit kit. They're using that to compromise devices. And then those devices we turn into a botnet, which would be used to send spam. And then it was like, oh, well, there's actually all kinds of interesting users and passwords. I can bundle that up and sell it on, on, a, on, on, on the black market and get uh, money for, like, you know, a couple million username password combinations, et cetera. And uh, then, you know, now we've got things like, oh, I can mine Bitcoin over there. Fantastic. Or, or uh, you know, or uh, I'm going to take that, that law office who probably doesn't have even an IT person. <laughs> Person, let alone a security person, mm -hmm. and I'm going to install ransomware on their device, and I'm going to collect some money that way. I just feel like they're so creative in the ways that they've yeah. learned how to monetize <laughs> <laughs> compromised devices. Yeah, my mama actually called me up uh, last week, and she's like, Kelly, I don't know. I was trying to download a recipe, and now this, this thing popped up, and I called this guy, and he wants $150, and I'm like, oh, no. please, oh. just... Just use the Chromebook, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a real, like, all of this has happened before, all of this will happen again element yes. to it as well. Um, I, like to, I like to talk about Bitcoin as being a, if you were to execute a replay attack of the entire history of financial crimes yeah. on the Bitcoin network, you could predict the future of Bitcoin crimes. <laughs> but the, the other thing that I see there is I, my, I cut my teeth on telecom. I um, strung cable and built PBXs for Bell Canada back in 2005. And the thing you saw in 2005, this was sort of the early days of VoIP, asterisk was around, Cisco call manager, all of this stuff, and you would see toll fraud. So you have a direct path to monetize a compromised PBX because you can call premium rate numbers in various countries of the world and, and the owner of that number then gets a bunch of money. Um, and so there was a very, like, very specific direct financial incentive to be doing this kind of compromise. And, and we're seeing exactly the same style of attacks because there's that financial motivation happening with like crypto mining. Mm -hmm. And I think um, over time our reliance on internet, on devices has increased so much that it has made it so much easier for attackers to get a foothold because Earlier it used to be like, we only do two or three things there, but now everything has been done there. Also, uh, if you think about, we used to have buffer overflow issues back in, what, 95, 96? Mm -hmm. And we still have those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, Kit talked all about having memory safety. Yep. So, the issues that we had more than 20 years ago, they are still there. So, we need to get ahead of some of these things, because otherwise, our backlog is just going to grow. <laughs> so thinking about this changing landscape, and I know all of you uh, ladies are trailblazing at your organizations, um, the security work. What are the kind of challenges that you face? And when I talk about challenges, it could be like people challenges, process challenges, or technology challenges. Like anything, any friction you get, any support you get, like what are the things that you face day to day? And what can we do as security specialists to uh, help overcome those? Sure. Um, I, I have one which is, uh, you know, we're creating absolutely new ways to interact, mm -hmm. but it's the same people that are interacting with it. And as, as was mentioned this morning, um, we need to challenge this idea that it's going to be really a wonderful place and that everybody's going to be really nice to each other and now we're going to this new techno utopia. Um, you know, this was the same thing that we heard in the early days of the internet in the, you know, in the 90s when people were just starting to get on. It's a magical information superhighway. Um, but we see the same behaviors from the real world, just as with Bitcoin. Um, we're seeing the same behaviors in the real world replicated and multiplied in the digital world. And getting people to build those, um, to think about this as early as possible in the process is going to help us to um, put out secure platforms and products. 
I think um, less so in my, my most recent gig, but in my, my previous work of uh, helping start the security teams at Slack and rebooting the security team at Heroku, getting just the sheer number of projects that we were trying to keep track of as a mm -hmm. very, very small security team, um, the flipping the script from that sort of, hey, it's Thursday, we're shipping Friday, can we get a pen test? The final security review, as we called it at Microsoft, to building it a practice around an initial security review, getting the, the product team and, and engaging with product uh, to have product on board in, you know, in thinking of all of the sort of checklisty items that product managers think about in building a new feature, building a new product, getting security on that very, very first checklist to say, like, what's your project kickoff look like? Is security in the room at project kickoff time when you're defining the scope of the feature, um, having it pivot to that instead of that final like uh, bad cop, like you can't ship because you haven't used the right crypto library or whatever, right? Like if you're, you've already lost if you're at that point. So having, having security in the room at that first kickoff um, was, really, was really transformative at both of those organizations. Yeah, so it's not a bandit that you stick on at the end for any scrapes and wounds. Yeah. I think one of the things that I've uh, started to realize um, in, in the past few years is that you can't really treat security as, as a one size fit all for your organization, even if you are a very, a, like a very single purpose organization. Uh, you really need to speak to all of the different areas of your, of your company or whatnot or wherever you're working because the people, for example, the people who deal with uh, content creators are going to have uh, different concerns and, and different uh, security concerns that they're worried about than the people who, you know, take the money from uh, subscribers. And uh, the people who are building out databases are going to think about security in a little different way. And so one, again, getting away from that security is sort of like the mall cop of your company that goes <laughs> around and, you know, tells you to, to stop, you know, um, you know, stop sitting on the banister. Uh, you say, here's what is the stuff you're interested in? What is the stuff that keeps you around at night? You're afraid that some celebrity is going to get hacked, or you're afraid that uh, somebody's going to get your financials for, for the next quarter, quarter release. And how can we give you data so that you can see right away, hey, this is something, something bad is happening, and I can now either bring in security or I can action on it myself? I think one of the things I think a lot about is just the ever evolving surface area that mm -hmm. I feel like we're working on. And you know, part of what I wrestle with is sort of how do you get line of sight on that surface area, right? It's, it's very hard because you can really only pay attention to things you can anticipate will happen. And it actually turns out the things that will really knock you down are the things that surprise you. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do you just reduce that cycle time to identifying those things and then kind of quickly finding ways to build like scalable ways to kind of understand those things. Um, the other is, people never use it the way you intend them to, yep. right? <laughs> it's like, I really, really? Like, I thought you were going to do that. You're doing that? Really? <laughs> I had no idea you were going to take down that website with a killer toaster oven. Like, you know, <laughs> like, and, 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 and so, um, I mean, it, it's good. It, it creates interesting problems for all of us to solve. So I guess maybe that's the silver lining, is that there are no end of interesting problems to solve. The, the challenge is just really kind of, continually focusing on how do you get your arms around this in a way that, that scales, right? Because you can't keep, it's like, it's like I'm going to keep scaling the security team. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't work. Mina, do you want to add something? So one of the biggest problems I'm facing in uh, security is actually finding fantastic people. Um, mm. At the entire industry seems to have woken up at the same time and recognized, oh, <laughs> wow, we, we really need to start building, building up our teams, which, you know, that's fantastic, but then it makes it really, really hard to, hard to hire fantastic people because they have all kinds of tremendous opportunities in front of them. They can work on all kinds of cool stuff, and they've got places that have, like, a fire hose of money to shoot at them, right? So, um, so, so I guess creating an industry that uh, finds a way to, to, to give people the skill set they need to, in order to be effective in the industry. Um, one of the other uh, talks I was thinking about doing in this, uh, uh, this slot was um, how to go from being a, a software engineer to a application security engineer. And um, of course, it's the wrong audience for that because you guys are already in security. So I got to find another like a dev conference or something where you can say like, hey, come join us. It's fun over here. <laughs> one of us. Um, but you know, I think, I think creating a, um, uh, a, a better um, uh, way to get folks into security with the right skills that they need in order to like be effective on day one. 
Thank you. So we have only um, seven minutes left, so this could be a little bit of a rapid fire kind of a question. <laughs> uh, if I were to ask you, um, what advice would you give to your younger self? Don't drink so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, uh, but no, but sir, well, that, but uh, also I would say be less afraid to ask questions. I think, uh, yeah. you know, I think, I don't think there's, uh, there, I think there are very few people in, in this room in general who have uh, not suffered from imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. and especially me growing up being around really, really smart people, I always kind of felt like I had to know all the answers and that I was stupid for not being able to figure things out right away. So, but I think also now that I teach, the, the fact that you are asking questions, pointed questions, that you are showing your curiosity and passion, it really goes a long way, not only for your personal enrichment, but it also shows people that, that you're someone who's not here just because, oh, I heard security makes me a lot of money, but you're somebody who really wants to learn. I think I would build on that by saying, and follow your curiosity. Yeah. Like the most interesting experiences, conversations, adventures, mishaps, whatever, have happened when I've just allowed myself to ask the questions and follow my curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the biggest misses in my life have been when I sort of sat back on the sidelines and, and didn't engage. Yeah. And so for me, it's just that curiosity is, go with it. And also don't just get into a field because you think you're you think it's sexy, get into the field that you like wake up every day excited to work on. Yeah. I think the big one for me uh, over the past year, I've been struggling with some burnout and just remembering that this whole career thing is a, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, mm -hmm. and that it's, it's okay to have, you know, the couple of years at one job where you like really go pedal to the metal and you stay, you stay those late nights and you, you, you bust your butt and then have the, have the year where like you, you, you put the brakes on a little bit and you recover a bit. And I think um, having that, be, being willing to see sort of multiple sides of, of the career path as because hopefully, hopefully you're all going to be doing this for the next two, de two three decades. Uh, because there's, it's not like the work's going to slow down. <laughs> so um, setting up for the long haul, I think, is the the big thing that I, I wish my my younger self had taken more vacations. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, these folks have already said some of the things, um, and I and I would just add to that that take risks, like mm -hmm. really. Um, do things that are difficult. Do things that are, um, th sometimes they're not going to be fun, right? Um, as Anshal mentioned, I'm making a documentary. I have thought about quitting this several times, but I'm doing it because it's something that is absolutely a big risk for me. It's something I don't know how to do and that I'm learning how to do as I go along. And it was the same getting into security and it was the same getting into programming. So just take the risks. So I, I have a couple of times told this story about how I found the hacker community as a teenager and um, uh, how I bought my very first Vax. It was a Microvax 2, and I, was, I went to the MIT flea because I knew <laughs> that there were these, these, uh, these guys selling a, microvi a Microvax, and they had posted on a BBS that I was on, so I, I was going to go find them. And you know, I tell the story about wandering around looking for these folks. You know, have you heard of the loft? Have you heard of the loft? Have you seen a Microvax? Is someone selling a Microvax? And, um, I, I know what I was wearing on that day, because I was wearing a pink t-shirt, I had my hair in pigtails, I was wearing really short, short cutoffs, and I was wearing these, these really clunky flu vogs. It was like <laughs> early 90s, like so sonified. 90s. And uh, you know, I, I felt cute, and, and, and I was walking around in this environment where, um, so ham radio operators don't dress like this. And, you know, it was a very different space, and I, but I remember it, and it stuck out in my mind, um, because, you know, so, so I, I bought the Microvax, and I started um, finding more people who were interested in the stuff that I was interested in, and I fell into this community, and, you know, I, I had the skills to be, you know, effective and, and, and contribute, and that was amazingly lucky for me. Um, but almost immediately, I started wearing really baggy jeans and really baggy shirts and flannels and just covering myself from neck to ankles. And I think, somehow, I didn't want people to notice that I was a girl. And I say girl because I was a girl back then. I was a teenager. <laughs> and, um, and then for like another, I don't know how long, I'm still wearing black head to toe, I guess. But like, <laughs> but um, there was this really long period where I, 
I, I, I didn't want people to, to recognize me as, um, as, as a girl and then a woman. Um, and we weren't professionals. We were, you know, a, a bunch of, let's say, security enthusiasts who <laughs> were, you know, it was, it was, it was a social arrangement. Even, after, even once I started working professionally and, um, and doing this, I still was somehow um, early on scared to uh, be thought of as just a girl. And um, so I would go back and tell my younger self that it's okay to be a girl. Not right now, and it's going to suck, and um, yeah, all the stuff that you're going through, you're, you're going to go through. But you know, you'll come out on the other end, you'll be, you'll be fine. You could be a girl in these years too. You don't have to like, you know. Um, I think I saw at, at a conference this woman speaking, and she was um, a CXO of some sort. And she had really long hair, and she was wearing makeup. And you know, that was the first time I'd seen an executive with long hair. And I was just like, I, I, I was just like, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe I never saw one before. It never like occurred to me that, that um, if you, you didn't have curly hair, it was, it was definitely you know, wrapped up really tight, and it was, it was constrained in some way. Um, you didn't see a lot of really uh, uh, obvious demonstrations of femininity. Um, I remember there was an executive at Microsoft. I went and had a conversation in, in her office. And she had sitting on the, like, the edge of her desk, like you know, in a, not, not in an obvious way, this really bright, beautiful green handbag, and it was just this beautiful expression of femininity. And I was just like, oh, and it like, and it occurred to me that like, oh, I guess I don't see that among executives, and I don't see the, the long hair struck me as well. It's just like we're all kind of reining ourselves in, um, and somehow it's not okay to be a woman in this space. And you know, I feel like. You know, the industry changes when we change it. So um, I would tell my younger self, it's okay to be a girl. And then I would tell like, my less young self, it's okay to be a woman. Um, and I feel that now, and I rock it for sure. But like, um, yeah, my, the younger self mm -hmm. was definitely afraid of that. Yeah. So great set of advice from each one of you. If uh, you were to ask me, I would say, be bold like these ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and ideas. And thanks for making time for this. Thank you. Perfect. So we will be, I think, breaking for 30 minutes, um, and then we'll come back here for our next session. Thanks, everyone.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Thank you.
Are you ready to privacy? Yeah. People standing over there, are you ready to privacy so we can uh, hear over you're talking? This is a surprisingly anonymous experience because these lights are blazing. And so I can't see any of you. Um, but hi, I'm Leah Kistner. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at Google. And I'm here to introduce this session, which is about practical privacy protection. And privacy is often construed to be about observance or disturbance by other people. But I think about the goals much more widely as respect, in the sense of due regards for the feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of others. To build something great, or even to build something acceptable, in the sense that people will actually accept it, respect for the people using it, the people who, who it affects, and the societies in which they live is key. And interestingly, when I see people interacting with a, with a product or a system that doesn't have that respect, they'll call those failures privacy failures. So I wanted to take a really broad look at this field. And this, these panels are designed to kind of cover a lot of the different pieces that I think go into this. Um, so, like to bring up our first speaker. So Elizabeth Zwicky works at Oath, and she's gonna talk about the grim truth about how real people, real companies, and real governments use email. She's a distinguished engineer at Oath, which is Yahoo slash AOL, and she, her team focuses on protecting people from bad email. She's one of the authors of RFC 7489, which is DMARC, and, one, and of O'Reilly's Building Internet Firewalls, and she's had a varied career from startups to big companies, including system administration, security, email, and teaching. So welcome. There's my clicker. <laughs> so yes, my company is not actually named OAuth, but that's OK. I answer to OAuth. Um, so, so why, why am I talking about email truth and illusion when we talk about privacy? Um, Email is one of the oldest protocols that we still interact with all the time. Um, it's a fundamental protocol that we do things with. Uh, it's showing its age in a lot of ways. We would like to increase its privacy in a lot of ways. Um, and most of the people who set out to do this are pretty firmly on the illusion side of truth and illusion. Um, so to start with, uh, the number one illusion, uh, the mailbox that you see is not the mail. Um, now, I work for a really big mail system. There are not very many really big mail systems, but almost all people using mail use one of them, or lots of them, maybe several. Um, and our numbers are that about 80% of the attempts to send us mail, we reject. So about 40 billion, yes, I mean billion with a B, attempts come into our systems to send our users mail a day, and we reject 80% of them. Um, and I, of course, don't exactly know these numbers for other email systems of our size, but I certainly know that when I give these kind of numbers, my colleagues at those mail systems nod, understandingly. Um, and I know that some of the big antivirus companies say things like 60% of all the mail on the internet is spam. And me and Google and Hotmail look at each other and go, like, did they get that number upside down? Because 60 is way too low. There's no way that 60% is the right number. So when you start thinking about mail solutions, they need to be not just about the mail you see, but also about that other big chunk of mail that never actually hits your mailbox. Um, okay, the next piece is, the hard part of what I do every day is not getting rid of bad mail because that's easy. 
Um, we certainly have interfaces on which we're like, if you just turn all of it off, you only have a 1% false positive rate, and that sounds pretty good. Um, no, the hard part is getting rid of the bad stuff while keeping the mail that people want. And why is that hard? Well, first of all, it's hard because engineers tend to think that there is good mail and there is spam, and if you were some kind of god, you could just sort them into the two piles and be done with it. That's not how it works. On one end, there is no mail so terrible that somebody on my mail system doesn't want it. There's mail so terrible I won't give it to them. But there's no mail they don't want. Um, people buy pharmaceuticals on the internet from spam. That's why people keep sending it. Those people want that mail. Um, people buy love on the internet a lot. Um, at the other end, um, there's no mail so good that everybody wants it. I have seen people vote their own pizza receipts as spam. I don't know why. Maybe it wasn't a good pizza. Um, in, in that giant middle, um, you may not have noticed this, but politics and religion are a little divisive. Um, and the mail that one set of people wants about politics is the mail, or religion, is the mail that another set of people emphatically do not want to know exists. So, um, a lot of our time is devoted to getting it right, not at some overall level, but for individual users. There's an individual opinion, and some things are not spam, they are mail that this user doesn't want right now. Um, the other fabulous tension for us, um, there are good people who make money sending email, but the primary people who make money sending email are spammers. Like, I, engineers ask me all the time, well, well, why would they bother? Because they get paid. It's very, very straightforward. You know who doesn't get paid for sending email? Your preschool, your parents' old age home, your utility company, your church, your sports team, your basically everybody you want mail from, that's not how they make their money. So, the people you don't want mail from have a vast incentive to be really good at doing whatever you want. Whatever I want, if I said I was only going to put mail in the inbox, if it contained the word aardvark, 100% of spam would have the word aardvark in it, in like a week. And, you know, all the mail you wanted would not, because aardvarks are not that popular. So, here's the, here's the big deal. I can get people who I don't want to receive mail from to upgrade and be as privacy sensitive or as security sensitive as you like. Plus, who is at the absolute end of the long tail of implementation of a new standard? Hardware devices. People whose mail is sent for them by hardware clients. Um, now, statistically, most of those people are, in fact, security cameras with fans in front of them, but let's ignore them for the moment because I don't care much about their mail. Um, and there are more of them than you could imagine. Uh, but who I do care about, I care about a lot, are, for instance, people using accessibility devices for the blind um, and other accessibility devices. Um, I care about printers. Why would I hate cameras and love printers? Because if you are on the other side of the digital divide, right, and you don't have a lot of internet access, and you want to fax something or email yourself a document, what you do is you go to the local corner store and they own one of those big fancy printers that most of us use on our employers, um, and it sends the mail for them. And it's got a mail client that's hard-coded in it, that's trying to send mail. And, and this is kind of an easy problem if it's in your company, it just sends mail as your company, but it's not an easy problem if it needs to send mail for your entire neighborhood. So, at the very long tail, the people who are slowest to adopt um, 
people with feature phones, so the developing world, um, are disproportionately underserved communities. They are disproportionately the people who it is morally most important to accept mail from. Um, I personally have written code that exists for no purpose other than to uh, correctly accept mail from specific accessibility advices for the blind. Um, so, okay, so the whole problem is harder you than you think, and the mail you can see is not all the mail. Uh, worse yet, your mail is not everybody's mail. Um, engineers like folders. My research labs team tell, just likes to say, you know, people talk about filers and pilers. And when it comes to email, really what we have is pilers and noise. Like, the only people who care about folders or filters are engineers. And for a while, I did not really believe them. And then, at a point where our employees were a tenth of a percent, less than that of our user base, I went and looked at all the folders we delivered mail to. Four of the top ten were named after internal products. <laughs> okay. Really, users, I mean, there are always users who love every feature, but they're more or less noise. Um, engineers never say there's too much spam in my spam folder. Um, users say this all the time. Uh, and uh, here's the thing, we, uh, Facebook and Yahoo, it was Yahoo at the time, uh, collaborated on a thing called RRVS, Return Receipt Verified Since, I think, don't shoot me. Uh, if I have the acronym wrong, uh, which allows you to say, um, if you are a sender, my user verified this email address on such and such a date. If your recipient registered more recently than that, they're not my user, don't deliver the mail. Um, which is a fabulous way for people to avoid problems with reclaimed accounts. You had the speaker earlier who talked about what happens if you use an account to set something up and then you never use the account again. When we first turned this in, we discovered to our horror that actually users register Facebook accounts with email addresses that don't exist. And it's not like they're like, oh, here I am, I'm signing up for Facebook, I'll make something up and then I'll go register it. No. They're like, here I am, I'm signing up for Facebook, I'll make something up, and then when I need to authenticate the account in nine months, I'll try to register the email address then. What bad thing could possibly happen? Um, this, is a, you know, this is a noticeable percentage of email from involved in people who do this kind of thing. And, and it took most of our engineering team a long time to sort of scrape their jaws up off the floor. That had not occurred to us as a thing people do. Um, similarly, here's another one that's great. Um, people often ask about all those uh, advanced fee fraud, the people who say, I am ambassador so-and-so, and I have this large crate full of gold at your nearest airport. Um, and they have names like Lawyer Smith and you know, Ambassador so-and-so. And you're like, who would believe that? Turns out a lot of West African lawyers and ambassadors do this. And when I say ambassadors, I mean people sending mail to the US Department of State as ambassador so-and-so. The reason that the fraudsters do this is that this is a perfectly reasonable cultural thing for them to do. It makes total sense. Um, now, the other thing I used to dislike, I used to dislike accounts named Mr. So-and-so. Most of those are also West African. Uh, until I discovered a new thing. Um, turns out it's kind of popular if you're sending out save the dates for your wedding to spin up a new email account. Why not? They're free. Um, named Mr. and Mrs. I'm going to pick on the Smiths forever because I have no sense of what to make up. Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Then they send mail to all their friends. Then my algorithm deactivates them and they hate me because they have just spun up a brand new account, sent mail to a lot of strangers. Um, so, 
Uh, all of these things are things we don't think of when we look at our mail, but they are things that make total sense in the context of other people's mail. So thanks, Elizabeth. And next up, we have Maritza Johnson. And she's from ICSI. And she'll be talking about, wait, how was I supposed to know? Baking privacy into the user experience. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Do I get to use my microphone? Oh, sorry. I assume this works. It sounds like it works. Hello, everybody. I am so excited to be here today. Uh, back when I first heard that RSA was in the works, in that you know 12 hours it took for the event to sell out, I was like, oh my goodness, this is just such like a warm-hearted, feel-good moment uh, that this was being planned. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, when I was invited to be a speaker, I of course said yes immediately, and had almost no idea what I was going to talk about. Um, I figured I could pull it together, um, 10 minutes to talk about privacy. I literally talk about privacy in my sleep sometimes, so I, I figured I could do this. And then in the, inter, in the inter, um, intermediate weeks, I feel like the privacy gods have kind of blessed me with headlines lately that really kind of touch on something that I've thought about for like the past eight years, and that is how do you design for people so that they understand the implications of the decisions they're making about their privacy? And how do you talk about their use of data, the use of their data, in a way that makes sense to them? So with the recent headlines about Cambridge Analytica, um, and I'm only going to say, to talk about the incident by name right now, and then we'll talk about this abstractly in a way where we can all you know, talk about solutions. So, I feel like users kind of hear about a survey manipulating their data and kind of misusing their data, and they think, wait, what? Like, what the what? How was I supposed to know that this survey app, when I hit install, was going to take all my friends' data and my data and do something else? It just doesn't make sense. Then you also have product teams seeing this, and they're like, no, we, we designed that platform to do a different thing. And we didn't expect that the data would kind of come, you know, get pulled out of the system and then be misused. And, you know, this is not what we intended. And, and people kind of feel generally kind of bad about this, and it's, it's not a good feeling on either side, right? So the title of my talk is, wait, how was I supposed to know? And we could take it from both sides. We could take it from the user side, and we could also take it from the product team side. And for, from my perspective, um, I would say that my husband's been really excited that I've had to plan this talk, because any time I start to kvetch about privacy and usability, he's like, uh, 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 be productive, you have to give a talk soon. So in the spirit of that, I'm going to focus on some advice for the people who are designing tools. Uh, I'm not going to say it's easy. I don't have hard and fast solutions for you that will definitely work. What I will say is that these are Three things that you can try as somebody who designs technology, somebody who works on a product team, whether you're a designer, a UER, an engineer, a PM. And hopefully, these tools are something that you can use to do better. So the first thing that I would recommend to all of you, as somebody in a meeting where you're talking about the design of something that features somebody's data, Guys, we are so far past PII as being the only type of data that's worth protecting and worth thinking about. If you're looking at data that is contributed by people, that's about people, like you should be thinking about um, certain things. And what I would recommend is to be humble, like we heard this morning. You are not your user. We have tools for getting to know our users, and I recommend that you start using them early and often in the design process. So this isn't just, I'm kind of taking a broad view of design. It's not just when you sit down to design the user interface. It's when you're thinking about how you design your system generally. So how do you get to know your users? One, like we talked about in the first panel, you could actually talk to your target demographic. Hopefully, you guys have access to user researchers. If you don't, 
you can do research on the internet, on your own. We can call that desk research. Basically, go searching for information to find out what do we know about the people we're designing for, and what do we know about the type of data we're going to be using. If that's not available to you, if you feel like you don't have time, get in touch with a privacy expert. You can ask them, hey, what do we know about these users and this type of data? Or what do we generally know about things that are similar? There are lots of people who are active on Twitter who I think would be happy to give you some advice. There are organizations like the EFF, the ACLU, lots of people who are happy to kind of share that, both inside your company and outside. A third group you might try, like we heard about this morning, would be extreme users. So I'm not suggesting that you design a product for every extreme user ever, but the more you get exposed to those special cases, the more you start to broaden your idea of what your product should do. Uh, so it can be very enlightening in how you might you know, consider those edge cases. I challenge you, when you're designing your product, to be brave and take a broad view of usability testing. I think it's kind of common knowledge now that we do usability testing to see if the user can complete a certain task in a certain amount of time with some le level of satisfaction. When we're talking about privacy interfaces, I challenge you to take a broad view and start looking at stuff like comprehension. Do users understand the implications of the decisions that they're making? Do they understand the data that's, being, that's involved in uh, whatever feature it is that you're designing? Um, as much as you can incorporate, incorporate that into your testing and get feedback from real users, I think that can really help to inform what's working and what's not working. My final piece of advice for you. So if you've kind of checked out over the past few minutes and felt like those past two points really apply more to designers or user researchers or people designing kind of end user products, I invite you to come back because I think this <laughs> advice can apply to everybody who sits around a, team, a table when you're talking about a product design. So when you're talking about something that involves user data, I invite you to be a leader and to push back against the status quo. When you're talking about collecting data, talk about do you really need to collect that data? Can you, once you've collected it, reduce it in fidelity and store something else? Do you really need to store the data for as long as you possibly can? Or maybe can you have a reasonable retention policy? Can you add a new control so that people have more control? Uh, can you store it in aggregate form? You know, all sorts of tough questions that maybe um, kind of go against the culture internally, maybe go against a certain product idea. But I think these are the tough questions that you have to be asking when you're dealing with kind of p data about people or people's data. Um, and so, so I'd ask all of you to kind of be a leader in that way. Uh, I would also say, like, I often hear kind of in response to those sorts of questions, but wait, like, we want to preserve option value. So one thing that's interesting about privacy is that users kind of wrap privacy up in trust. And the way they think about companies using their data is very related to trust. So if you're building your products, always preserving option value, think about how you build relationships in the real world. So if you're out there dating and you're trying to preserve option value, are you like building a trusting relationship? So you know, think about that when you're thinking about your users. Think about that when you're working on, on the data. Um, kind of treat data respectfully. Ask these hard questions and push, push your teams to do better. So I just want to summarize these three points for you guys. Um, and then I'll also leave you with, with one question or some, kind of something to think about. So if you kind of, in hearing this talk, wonder where are the concrete examples? Where are like, the examples of product decisions where these things might apply? Wonder why is it that it's not possible as a privacy community that we can talk about solutions in a way when we can all kind of test them? Like I said earlier, we don't have hard and fast solutions that we know work to solve many of our problems. So how can we build a community so that we can actually share the problems and work on solutions together? Um, much in the way that I think we've kind of achieved in the security community. So with that, I will leave these, um, and I look forward to taking your question, or hearing the questions in Q&A.
Excellent talk. Okay, and the next up will be Wilketi Adika. Uh, he's from Google. He's a software engineer, and his time is split between privacy reviews and engineering tools slash infrastructure slash features to support privacy. Uh, prior to Google, he worked on security at Shape Security, MIT Lincoln Lab, and Purdue University. So welcome up. Thank you, Leah. So at Google, I do a number of things, but one of the things that I do is work on this team called Elbow. And Elbow's mission is very simple. It's to protect the privacy of end users by nudging app developers towards privacy-safe development practices. Now, to understand how we achieve that mission, you kind of have to understand a little bit about our beliefs. And so when we talk about Elbow's belief, it starts off with this sort of fundamental truth that we think is obviously true, which is people are inherently good, right? And so then it follows that developers are good. And as a consequence, you end up with this situation. If there's a situation where a user's privacy is harmed by some app, it has to be inadvertent, right? Not on purpose. Now, you probably are thinking, like, surely you and Elbow are not that naive. And that's true, right? But we have the luxury of a world-class security team, a world-class anti-abuse team that focuses on the bad actors, right? We need to focus on the folks that are not actively being malicious, right? Because you could be a perfectly well-intended individual and still cause harm. And so we want to focus on those particular individuals because they also need a little bit of nudging. So you probably are subsequently thinking, OK, if I add it up, good users, and all they need is some awareness about what they're doing, then the problem is solved, right? Solution, end of story, we're done. But life can never be that easy, right? There's always some complexity buried in there, right? And that complexity comes from the following, procrastination. Procrastination is making it very difficult for us to attain our objective in terms of pushing developers towards where we want to go. But before we sort of dive, you know, dive into this, we need to level set a little bit about what procrastination is. And so I'm going to leverage the ideas of both Pierre Steele and Cornelius Koenig. So they came up with this equation, this procrastination equation, that is known in academic circles as temporal motivation theory. Right? It's the combination of sort of expectancy theory and hyperbolic discounting. And it's a very simple equation. So motivation, right, that's, that's the thing that's how desirous are you in terms of achieving some go a goal or objective. And you have expectancy. So, so this equation really explains why you probably procrastinated on every essay in college, right? So expectancy, how confident are you going to kill this essay or do well in this essay, right? Probably not too high, right? Um, then you talk about value. Like, it's how confident are you or how much reward do you get out of the outcome? And then you say, OK, with impulsiveness, you have, you know, how distractible are you, right? Like, when you talk about an essay, pretty much everything else is more interesting than doing your essay, right? And then if you have the opportunity to go to, say, like a football game, basketball game, and your essay is due, like, a year out, talking about delay now, uh, you probably say, well, you know, I could probably just uh, go to this game. But if the game is you know, like today or tomorrow, rather, your deadline is the day after, you're probably thinking, maybe I can bring my laptop to the game, work on my essay there, and, and make it all happen, right? And so, it, given the generality of this equation, given its applicability, it shouldn't be surprising that it has applicability to our use case, what we really care about, which is getting developers to do the types of things that we want to do from a privacy perspective. So, the behavior we're interested in is this behavior around the transmission of hardware identifiers. So from a best practices standpoint, we think there's only a handful of cases, namely two cases, where using or accessing and transmitting a hardware identifier actually makes sense. And pretty much every other use case, there's a better alternative, right? And so what we want to do is minimize those cases where it isn't legitimate for you to be looking or accessing this, these hardware identifiers because it allows you to track individuals across applications and you as a user have no control over this, right? So we want to minimize that. 
So the first thing that we did, the first nudge, had to do with Android Studio. So if you're going to be developing an app, chances are you're going to be using Android Studio. And boom, how cool is it that as you are accessing one of these hardware identifiers, you get this warning, this lint warning, basically saying, hey, don't do this. It's not recommended. What you should be doing is using one of these other uh, identifiers. And you know, in the event that you happen to fall into one of these exceptions, it might be OK. So this is the first nudge that we did. And now the task is to say, OK, how does the procrastination equation think about this? right? So from an expectancy standpoint, how confident are you based on that warning message that you can execute on a scale from 0 to 1? I would say somewhere in the middle. Why? Because, well, I still have to figure out whether or not these new identifiers have the same properties as this sort of the Bluetooth uh, address that I was trying to access in that particular example. I have to determine whether or not this will affect my application in ways that will make sense. And so it, it, while I'm pretty confident that I can go look all this information up, I still have to go look that information up and, and, and figure out what, what the implications are. And then from a value standpoint, it's pretty low, right? Like in that warning, that warning just said, hey, it's not recommended to do this. You should do these other things. So you know, what reward am I getting out of this outcome other than saying, well, I got rid of this lint warning. right? So I would say the value here is pretty low. So you, you score that as a, a 0.1. And then from an impulsiveness standpoint, well, I don't know if you've ever used Android Studio, but it's, it's very intelligent, but it's also very chatty. So it's telling you lots and lots of things. And you know, why pay attention to this warning versus another? But you know, I, depending on how healthy your application is, you may have fewer warnings. You may pay attention to it. So I slot this somewhere in the middle, 0.5. And then from a delay standpoint, it's pretty good, right? It's right there in the IDE as you're coding. So it doesn't get much better than that. But again, as I said previously, you still have to think about what the implications are for your application before you can actually integrate it, right? So that gives you overall motivation, one, essentially one third. So now let's look at the second nudge. <coughs> so the second nudge has to do with this thing called the pre-launch report. So with the pre-launch report, you as a developer are basically saying, hey, before I can launch, I want to make sure that everything with my app is A-OK. -okay. Among the things that we look at are privacy properties, right? And so in this warning, the major difference between the warning in the Android Studio environment and here with this pre-launch report is that it's now saying, hey, look, you might be in violation of a Google Play policy, one. And then two, this may affect your visibility in a Play Store. And so by saying these two different things, we are you know, hopefully motivating this developer, right? Because as a developer, you probably care about installs, right? And if you care about installs, uh, your visibility very much matters in the Play Store. So now let's look at this through the lens of the procrastination equation. So from an expectation standpoint, I don't think we've given the user, the developer, any more information to make them feel more confident about their ability to execute on this behavior of changing the identifier. And from a value standpoint, I think we've provided a lot of motivation. In some sense, right? we're telling them that you may be in violation of a play policy. And then two, we're also telling them that, hey, look, um, this uh, may affect your visibility in a Play Store. So now you, you have some motivation because your installs might be affected. Then from an impulsiveness standpoint, there isn't very much impulsiveness because this whole process exists for you to examine what may or may not be wrong with your app. right? And then from a delay standpoint, it isn't as good as you know, being in your integrated development environment. So I, I scored that as, as twice as, as bad as, as, as you had in the earlier nudge. So when you look at it, put it all together, you have a fairly high motivation, right? So now when you want to put these nudges side by side, you can see, well, we had a 4% reduction over a given time period for the first nudge. Reasonable, right? Respectable. But with the other one, we had a significantly larger uh, reduction in the usage of these hardware identifiers in terms of them being transmitted. Now, you might be saying, like, you didn't need an equation to tell you that, right? Like, you know, the, 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 the potential threat of having, you know, your, 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 you know, the play team affect your app by removing you from the Play Store because you're in violation or affecting your visibility, like, clearly, that would motivate someone, right? But what this equation gives you is a framework for thinking about this, right? When you're thinking about these interventions, how do you, what should you be changing? What, what parameters should you be tuning in order to produce this better behavior that you're looking for? And so the takeaway for me really is the following. Look, I get it. You probably don't have an IDE at your respective company. You probably don't own a, a Play Store to use, but you probably have a bunch of well-intended developers 
who are probably not engaging in the best privacy respectful behaviors, and you probably have a multitude of interventions that you can try. So what I'm suggesting is that you try out this procrastination equation, put it, use it as a filter over your interventions, and determine whether or not this is the best approach for you to get the behavior that you want. And with that, thank you for your time. So nudging, it's a good technique, works really well. Uh, and then I want to welcome up our next speaker. Seni Kamara is at Brown University. He's a professor there. And before that, he was a researcher at Microsoft. He works in cryptography. That, that's, that's what crypto means, by the way. And uh, mostly on designing algorithms and protocols that preserve privacy. A lot of his work has been on designing practical systems that operate on end-to-end -end encrypted data. So, for example, databases and search engines. So, please welcome Seni up to the stage. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, so I'll be speaking today about a project that's joined with uh, Tariq Moataz and Martin Zhu. So since 2013, uh, there have been 9 billion records that have been uh, leaked uh, as a result of data breaches. And what's interesting is that, well, beyond the fact that there's 9 billion, um, what is also interesting is that four only 4% 4 of those were um, encrypted. Okay? So as a cryptographer, um, the question that comes to mind to me is, why so few? Right? Why do we only have 4%? of the records that were encrypted. So is it because we're incompetent? Um, or is it because we're lazy? Or is it because it costs too much, right? And the answer is probably, you know, maybe some mix of multiple things. But there's an interesting quote by uh, a Yahoo executive that was interviewed by the New York Times um, after the Yahoo, um, uh, the Yahoo leaks. And he was asked, you know, why wasn't this data encrypted? And his answer was, because it would have hurt Yahoo's ability to index and search message data. Okay. So, again, as a cryptographer, um, you know, this makes me think, well, you know, or this may uh, motiv motivate the following question is, does encryption really kill search, right? Is this really true? I mean, intuitively, you may think, yeah, it kind of does, right? That's the point of encryption. It's supposed to hide all information about the data. So, once we encrypt, of course, we're going to lose search. But it turns out that uh, cryptographers have been working on this exact problem for a very long time, right? So it's been about 17 years that we've been developing algorithms and protocols and different kinds of cryptographic algorithms f um, to specifically allow us to search over encrypted data. And there are many different ways of doing this. I'm not going to go over the details here. Um, but it's become a pretty mature field at this point. And we have uh, different, uh, different approaches that give us different trade-offs. So we can do it more or less efficiently, we can do it more or less securely, and we can sort of tweak all these different, um, these different parameters. So uh, let me make a sort of one point clear, right? What I'm not, so I don't want to suggest that encryption is a silver bullet, okay? So encryption is not going to solve all of our problems. Um, it's only one small tool, right, in a larger toolbox. And of course, when we're talking about data breaches, data breaches could occur in many different ways, right? They could occur due to phishing, due to dictionary attacks, they could occur due to somebody stealing something. But, you know, I guess the claim that I do want to make is that encryption will at least help us, okay, in some way. Um, okay, so we have this, uh, this work, this research uh, that's been maturing over 17 years on how to search on encrypted data. And uh, one question is, well, okay, so this is very nice, there's a bunch of papers, but can this actually be deployed in, in the real world, right? Can this actually be used? And so this is a question that we were interested with Tariq um, and with Martin. And so um, we said, you know, let's, let's try it. Let's see if we can actually deploy our research. So we looked at the space of end-to-end -end, um, encrypted um, applications, and actually we're doing pretty well now with end-to-end -end encryption, right? Sort of, um, at least in some settings. So for example, with messaging, we have a lot of really nice end-to-end -end encrypted apps like Signal and WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger. Um, we have a lot of different options. And in video, we're starting to do, you know, well as well. We have FaceTime is end-to-end -end encrypted and Skype got end-to-end -end encryption. So we're sort of doing okay um, here. But one thing that we didn't really, you know, at the time when we started this, that we didn't find um, were any end-to-end -end encrypted apps for photos. And I looked up some statistics, and it's estimated that in 2017, there were 1.2 trillion photos that were taken. And 85% of those were taken from a smartphone, 4% from a tablet, and 10% from a digital camera. Okay, so 
um, we have a ton of pictures that are being taken on our devices. So one interesting thing about uh, photos, and in particular photo collections, is uh, one, that they're very, very large. Right? If you're anything like me, you have a ton of pictures, you take a ton of pictures, and you have gigs and gigs and gigs of photos. And because they're being taken, or because 85% of these photos are being taken on a mobile or on a smartphone, right, um, that actually suggests that you may want to store your photos in the cloud. It's actually a reasonable thing to do. Right? If you're like me, like you can't fit your entire photo collection on your phone. So you're going to want to store them in the cloud. The other reason why you may want to store your photos in the cloud is that they have high sentimental value. Right? You have pictures of your kids, of your family, your parents, your friends. You really don't want to lose these pictures. Okay? So that's another motivation to put them in the cloud. Now, the downside of putting your photos in the cloud is that your photos may be very private. Right? These are pictures of you and your friends, your family, um, private moments. Right? So you may have some concerns about your privacy. Okay? Um, Another reason is because data breaches actually happen, right? Especially with respect to photos. In 2014, at work of, I'm not going to shut up on his name, Majerzik, uh hacked 30 Gmail and iCloud accounts and was able to get you know, 500 private photos, uh, very compromising photos, including photos of celebrities, right? This was all over the news. But even if you're not concerned about data breaches, maybe your job requires you to take and hold sensitive photos, right? Maybe you're a journalist or a photojournalist or a documentary maker. Maybe you're an activist, and you have pictures that are very sensitive, right, that document government abuse or police brutality. Okay? Maybe you're a citizen journalist. In some parts of the world, the only journalists um, that are still there are you know, regular citizens with smartphones. Okay? So in all these cases, um, you know, the common theme is that you, wanna, you may want to protect your photos. So um, with this in mind, we decided uh, to create an app I uh, just call it an end-to-end -end encrypted camera app, and that's what I'm going to describe next. It's called Pixec. So this is what it looks like, um, at least for now. And so the first uh, screenshot is this is the, the, the login screen, and then you have uh, the screen to take the picture, and the third is your photo collection. And the app uh, works in the following way. So as I mentioned, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. So there's a key that's generated on your device, and that never leaves your device. Um, if when you take a picture. Uh, with the app, what's going to happen is uh, the app actually uses machine learning to tag the picture. Okay, so it'll do object recognition. If I take a picture of this room, it'll probably say there's chairs and there's people. Um, so your picture is going to be automatically tagged with those um, uh, those tags, and then it'll also tag the photo with your your location, and then it will give you the option to enter your own tags as well. Okay, so now once your image is taken and tagged. Uh, the image or the photo is going to be encrypted, again, with the key that's only stored on your device. And all these tags, all this metadata is going to be encrypted using uh, encryption schemes that support search, okay? that support uh, search over encrypted data. And then everything is going to be sent to our servers, okay? our servers in the cloud. So now the encrypted photos and all the encrypted tags are backed up on our servers. And of course, we don't have your key. Okay? So we don't get to see the metadata or the pictures. Now let's fast forward, you know, maybe a year or two years, and now you have a photo collection that holds, you know, I don't know, that's 40 gigs, you have thousands of pictures, and you want to recover that one picture from summer 2007, right? From a picnic that you had with your family in 2007. So how are you going to get this picture back, right? If your whole photo collection is in the cloud, and if it's, you know, 40 gigs uh, in size, how do you get that one picture, right? Um, obviously, you don't want to download your entire photo collection and decrypt it on your phone for this one picture. And so this is where the search on encrypted data comes in, is that what our app will allow you to do is it, it allow you to search over your photo collection, right? but in the cloud. So um, you will enter, you enter your keyword, summer 2007, and the app will uh, sort of process this keyword. right? It'll encrypt it in some form, and then send that to our servers. Our servers are going to take this encrypted form of the query, of your query, and it'll take all this encrypted metadata, and it'll somehow figure out which encrypted pictures it needs to send back. Okay? And it'll send back just those pictures that match the query. And of course, the whole point here is that we never get to see your pictures, we never get to see the metadata, and we never get to see your query. Okay? It's all end-to-end -end encrypted, and the key is only on your device. Um, so. The app is available um, on uh, the Google App Store. 
Uh, it's only available for Android for now. And if you want to get access, you can uh, contact us on Twitter at Pixac App. So um, something else I wanted to mention is that so for this particular app, we use actually a relatively simple form of search on encrypted data, of encrypted search. We can actually do things that are much more sophisticated. Okay? We, can, we can do things like NoSQL databases, end-to-end right? -end encrypted NoSQL databases. We can do things like end-to-end -end encrypted graph databases. We can also do, and this is sort of the more complicated or the most complicated thing that we can handle, which are end-to-end -end encrypted relational databases as well. Okay? Um, and so some of the things that we're trying to do is to figure out what, you know, what other applications and services can we build on top of this. So if you have any idea, um, you know, I'd love to hear from you. Um, yeah, and so this is uh, the website if you want to check out the app. And if you want to get access to it, just uh, you know, contact us there. Thank you. And now we're going to be on to our last talk before the panel. And I want, so I want to introduce Shah Sundaram. Uh, she is at Snap. She's actually the first privacy engineer at Snap and built their privacy program from the ground up. For that, she was at Google and Symantec. And so she's right now been working on designing Snap features with privacy in mind and does privacy engineering reviews for the majority of the Snap releases and all of their acquisitions. So welcome, Shah, to go talk about machine learning privacy. Thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm Shah. And today I'm going to talk about machine learning and privacy, basically all the buzzwords that are happening right now. So I'm a privacy engineer at Snap and formerly at Google. So some of this work I've done at Google. Um, basically, what does a pri being a privacy engineer mean? So I review any launches for privacy as well as security. Basically, I look at the infrastructure, the design, the data, the UX, any additional UI changes that were input, so that to make sure that this doesn't harm our users in any way. So typically how the life cycle or evolution of a privacy solution looks like is I find a problem, identify it, catch it in the reviews, write documents about it, educate our engineers, add guardrails and validation around it. And as I do this over time, I look for patterns that emerge from me doing this all over again. And then maybe if I see enough patterns, just go and implement and build an infrastructure that will completely eliminate this privacy problem from the get-go. So today, I want to talk to you about machine learning. And as I do privacy analysis of any machine learning system, what are the patterns that I see and what are the problems that I see? So just to take us through this, I'll give you a very basic toy example of machine learning, where typically you have a set of user data. This is about users, maybe about their demographic, and in this case, a sensitive attribute like their salary. And how a machine learning person would approach this problem is take this data, do a lot of feature extraction, model training, and try to look for all the patterns in the data so that you have a trained classifier. And eventually, you'll have an automated system in which you can ask this trained classifier a question of, let's say, how much to pay this new guy, Charlie, and it'll give out a response of estimation of maybe this much with this much probability. So when we talk about privacy in this particular space, the question we ask is, how can we provide a valuable service and protect the user's sensitive information? In this case, I have just highlighted Alice, but you also want to make sure that each individual data is protected and nobody gets to know about it, and it is not proliferated much. So why does this problem exasperate in a machine learning environment is because the process of feature extraction and model training is very, very manual. All of these data scientists or machine learning professionals need access to this sensitive data, and only then can they build these systems. And the problem worsens, especially when the data collectors are one team or one company, and the data processors or people who are building this model are, are someone else. And we have seen this go wrong so many times in our system. Uh, basically, whenever uh, 
we send out these collectors, send out this data to the processors. They typically say that they have anonymized this data and send it out. And we see that it is very easy to de-identify a particular user and re-identify them. Here I give an example how Group Insurance Commission did that and released anonymized data set with which uh, Latanya Sweeney was able to de-identify and find a particular disease that the governor of Massachusetts was suffering from. So how do you prevent this from happening? So we have some very good literature in the privacy world that we could use and build infrastructure to completely eliminate all of these problems from the get-go. So basically, you could use differential privacy, which will add some kind of a noise in the input as well as the output, and which will give you good uh, utility at the same time protect the user's privacy. You could use uh, ideas from homomorphic encryption in which you could encrypt the data and do analysis over the encryption data. There are some limitations to it, but it, you could do a lot more still. The third thing is federated learning that at SNAP we are heavily invested in is you do all the analysis in the client itself. So all the model building is done on the client and you send only updates to the server. So that sensitive data never leaves the client. And also there are ideas from secure multi-party computation where you could, many of these teams could collaborate and generate the output, but at the same time keep the input sensitive to themselves. And we heard Sini also talk about a few techniques about crypto here. But these classical methods of privacy, uh, so this protects against the classical methods of privacy. But as I do more reviews, I see a lot of problems for the users in these machine learning systems. And until, let's say, artificial intelligence takes over humanity, I think these are the important problems that we should look at, and that's what I want to talk to you about. The first thing that I see is uh, misclassification risk to a user. Basically, could a false positive or false negative harm a user? So this is typically how this affects how the model is trained and what output a model gives. For example, any model that you train with machine learning, it's always going to give you an output that is an estimation of outcome. Basically, it is all probability theory. So probability theory does not say that this outcome will not happen. It says that this outcome will happen, but it will be very rare. So what it means is, let's say you have a machine learning system that gives you a, re a best result with 99% accuracy. That's super high. But let's say it gives you an accuracy of 99%. What it means that if you see 100 events, one of them is going to go wrong for sure. So basically, what is going to happen is always one image is going to be mistagged or mislabeled. If you're doing label classification, one image is going to be mistagged or mislabeled. And uh, think about a system like all of these big data providers or these big image classifiers, which contains a lot of user data and photos app. They are classifying thousands and thousands and millions of user photos, and it is very easy or it is very likely that one of them is going to mislabel it. And we have seen examples where the mislabels have been very, very bad for the user. The worst is in case of, let's say, automated cars, right? Think about a car that is standing at an intersection and that is trying to see whether the light is red or green. And if you say that the precision of the system is 99%, what that means is one out of 100 cars is going to run the light. So the account, or in this case, the user risk is very, very high. So what I suggest that instead of measuring the quality of the model with just precision and confidence, you need to anticipate the risk to the user for this low probability and low confidence events and put safeguards in place for the worst outcome. And have safe defaults. I think that's the only thing that's going to save us. The second point that I want to talk to you about is fairness. Basically, how can we design a system that can protect a user from biases? And this, I see, typically affects the data that we collect. Let's say you have the 
best machine learning engineers here, and you give them this data set about uh, salaries for men and women, and they build you the most precise, exact machine learning model. But whenever you're going to question or ask this data, uh, ask this classifier a question, how much to pay a woman, it is almost always going to undercut a woman. And it is global. So basically, however you test this model, wherever you test this model, it is always, every time, going to undercut the pay for a woman. So these biases are very much inherent in the data itself. You could tell me right now that why not just get rid of the gender column and retrain your classifiers. Uh, maybe in this example it works, but do you think in my example it is devoid of any race or ethnicity bias? It isn't, because there is a lot of correlation between your location, that is your zip code, and your race and ethnicity. So figuring out, there is no obvious method to figure out or adjust historical data to get rid of these biases. And it is hard to identify these different biases throughout our systems. And there are many anti-discriminatory laws that could help guide us and tell us what you should be careful about. But the data itself has so much of this context around it that um, the cultural context especially, that the machine learning model just does not capture. And corrective measures that we want to put in place that will probably alter these results are very much contentious legally and politically. I think Elizabeth talked about how sorting out mail itself is tough. And so we are embarking on this kind of new research area where we don't even know what are the right measures to put in place. So if I have to characterize, stick in my, characterize this in my evolution of ML solutions, I'm here right now. I'm, there are a lot of patterns of these happening, and we see that as we go towards these automated systems, we are going to have these big falls from those. So in, in the end, I would like to leave you with this checklist of any ML system analysis. Basically, first, we have to ask what training data is used and kind of what efforts are put in place to improve the quality of the data. So if you have any ML engineer, they will also ask you about these two things, and they will put a lot of effort in kind of regularization, uh, bias versus variance, improving precision, all of those things are good for privacy. And so you should let them do it and give them all data, kind of good data as well as bad data, to make sure that they test their systems well. But at the same time, don't stop there. There are many more questions that you need to ask from the system so that you can get a very unbiased and a good model train. So basically, the other questions you need to ask are how sensitive is this, model to, uh, is this model's accuracy to changes in test data? What is the risk to the user if things actually get mislabeled or misclassified? And what are the scenarios in which this model can be applied? And lastly, is this model valid? As time changes, things change, and when should we retrain this particular model? So I think that's, that's all. And so, thank you. So we're going to move on to the moderated discussion portion of our session. And joining us as moderator is Allison Miller. So she is currently SVP Engineering at Bank of America. And she has spent over 15 years at the forefront of consumer authentic identity, authentication, anti-fraud, security, and privacy at some of the world's leading online consumer-facing platforms, such as Google, Electronic Arts, PayPal, eBay, Skype, and Visa. She has also pioneered the use of algorithmic approaches like machine learning to security pro problems and has launched technology that protects billions of devices, accounts, dollars, messages, transactions, and ultimately people. So welcome up, Allison. Come on up, everybody. Hey, guys, it's the last session. How are you all doing in the audience? And then. What? Okay. Thank you. 
I'm a bit of a wooer, so I feel like not being in the audience, I want to encourage each of you to take that on. And hello to folks on our live stream. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you guys so much for your presentations. It's really interesting to hear sort of different angles on this problem set. Uh, security conferences aren't usually where we get to discuss issues of privacy, but it's kind of the end game for consumers in that security and privacy are kind of always intertwined. And one of the things that I really love about discussions of privacy lately is that it used to be that the only folks who were really talking about privacy were lawyers. You remember when privacy mm -hmm. professionals were all attorneys and it was all about compliance and the conversations were all about opt-out versus opt-in. But now we're actually approaching these as kind of design problems or we're talking about them like engineering problems. So how has that, has that changed the way that you approach the work at all? Have you um, been exploring that? I mean, you, you're a privacy engineer. There, there, how many folks here are privacy engineers? Okay, a few, I see a few hands. The lights are really bright. How many of you wanna be privacy engineers? Okay, well, everybody's hiring. Everybody's <laughs> hiring for folks who are interested in, in working on privacy engineering. How has the approach changed for you? Definitely. Now we have a role called privacy engineer. Typically, it was just a security engineer. Now we have a definition of what a privacy engineer looks like. And we see that lawyers, yes, definitely help us with a lot of kind of inputs about what's the right thing to do. But when you get into the weeds of things and when the devil is in the detail, it typically needs an engineer to go and say what is good, what is right, what kind of encryption works where, what it doesn't work or what it aids or it doesn't. And so definitely I see see that being a privacy engineer, it helps in kind of product development phase itself. And even more than that, especially at the design phase. So more I get involved in the design, the better systems that we get in the end that protect the user. Sure. So at Google, one of the things that I do is work with product teams to try to help them create more respectful products. And part of what you do, I mean, so if you're compliance, you just kind of say you are compliant or you're not compliant. But as a member of a privacy working group, part of what you do is help the team come up with a solution. And so you usually need to have a technical background in order to help them figure out how to best utilize these complex systems so that they can achieve a goal that is still respectful of the users and meeting their business objectives. I wish that we would take it a step further, though. I, I look forward to see where the field goes as more technical people kind of take up privacy with a solutions-oriented mindset. Uh, so I, I guess I've been lucky in that I've always worked in privacy for as long as I've kind of been in the field. Um, but like I, I kind of started um, on a team at Facebook where I worked with almost all lawyers, and you know, they're we we come from two different kind of approaches and how you approach the problem. And so your tool set is different. The way you think about problems and solutions is different. Um, and so I see a lot of value. I, you know, my bias is I'm trained as a computer scientist. So of course, I see a lot of value in computer science for finding solutions. Um, but I would actually, I really look forward to privacy going much more in the way that security has gone, kind of like the, in the way I wrapped up my talk to say, um, I wish there were more space for technologists to share in the common problems that we have in dealing with user data and thinking about how to protect data and collect data um, and kind of have more of like a community discussion about best practices and lessons learned. Um, I, I have a feeling that right now we're kind of long on lessons learned and maybe short on solutions. And I think uh, having kind of like a safe space where we can actually talk about that as a community and talk about that as uh, you know tech companies would be beneficial. One of the trends that I think is kind of interesting too is that um, with a lot of the dynamics of social platforms, we are, it used to be, you know, like I'm Selena Kyle on Twitter, that's my pseudonym. That was back then, that was my attempt to get privacy was to not necessarily be myself on a platform because I didn't know how I was going to use it or what the interactions were going to be like. So mm -hmm. now we're crafting products where it's a social platform. So the difference between what needs to be shared or what we want to share versus what we want to keep secret, it's, it's different for different folks. Like some people actually want the, car the Canadian pharmaceutical um, promotional email and other people consider it spam. We're creating this sort of 
dynamic, very complex matrix of options for folks in order to provide them choice, um, but yet they, they're not necessarily trained to navigate all of these options. So how do, we, how do we provide them with simplicity so that we get to that ideal of the default is they're safe, the default is they're doing the thing that is sort of um, the, the one that will protect them the most, but yet also mm -hmm. give them all of these choices. As a product manager, how do you how do you think about that? Uh, or a researcher? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, one of you want to take it? I can. I'll say something really short. That's a hard question. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and um, I think it. You know, you have tons and tons of people who are looking at it really closely and trying to come up with a way that. I mean, ultimately it kind of ends up being a compromise in some sense because trying to satisfy everybody with limited resources usually doesn't work out. But um, I think that uh, every case is unique and it has its own nuance. And so it's very difficult to give a monolithic answer to that, to that question. Uh, Fair. Um, why don't I take a, oh, well, Elizabeth. Um, we have made some attempts to build email experiences that give people some more control over that. Because one of the problem with email is that you tend, you tend to want to have a single identifier, um, but then you give that to a lot of people and then it's, right. Um, but there again, you hit a big tension between um, users who want features, but it becomes difficult so you can, um, there, are, there are places where you can make effectively a disposable email address. We call them internally as disposable email addresses. But you have to be really clued in to do that, to know to do that, to think to do that. And the, the classic example is when do you give out your email address? You give out your email address when you're in line, you've been shopping, there's a screaming child, there's a cashier who's like, if you give me your email address, we'll give you 20% off. And you're like, look, I'm just so done with this experience. If I give you, don't even give me the 20% off, just shut up, right? <laughs> Here's my email address. <laughs> Let's be done with this transaction and get me out of here. Um, and so that, that makes it very hard for people to negotiate multiple identifiers. Um, and that's a tension I don't really know what to do about. Yeah, sorry for asking a really hard open-ended question like that. Your, your work uh, with the Google Play folks is really interesting though because you're not just trying to train users in dealing with all of this optionality and or issues. You're trying to train developers. So one of the things I was wondering is, how are they responding? Are the developers interested in this? Do they, do they see this? The developers are basically good. I think I saw you write that. <laughs> um, are, they, are they interested in, in uh, developing these controls? Or do, are, they, are they pushing back on the feedback they're getting from your team? So we haven't collected enough justifications or responses from those end users or rather developers in order to conclusively say what it is that they're doing. But from what we've observed is there has been a very positive response where they would go a mile further than where we have, you know, thought they would go in terms of what they do. So that we have some other work where we um, are encouraging developers to not use as many permissions, right? Like, you know, sometimes you know, there's an abundance of permissions, they're collecting a whole, a, whole, a whole lot of them, maybe you don't need some of them. And what we found is, you know, these developers, in many cases, will, in addition to removing the one that we identify, it's like, hey, you probably don't need this permission. They'll go and remove some other permissions that we didn't tell them about. And so, you know, for the developers that are receptive, they are very receptive, at least um, from what we've seen. But anecdotally, we haven't done a comprehensive analysis yet. But from what we've seen, it's been very positive. Cool. Well, that's good security work too, right? If you don't need it, don't collect it. If you don't need to, if you don't need the service, turn it off. So awesome. Um, and that's kind of interesting too. Be, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if in your work, you, you as uh, on the privacy side of the fence, do you find yourself uh, clashing with your security brethren or are, all, are you all uh, often aligned and obviously everyone is working towards the same end goal, but are the methods meshing or is there creative tension 
between security and privacy in your world. We get along like a one big happy family. Oh, yeah. one big happy family. <laughs> I think sometimes I see attention not within those two teams, but more on uh, the product team side where they're like, well, why do I need to talk to a privacy person? I already talked to a security person. Ooh. Or where sometimes it can feel right now like we have more actionable advice to give on security. And so that can sometimes be uh, what gets tended to. Um, so I can, and it's not really attention, but it's uh, kind of an interesting thing that shows up between the two. Yeah. But then, like, between the teams themselves, I feel like security folks are usually our best advocates. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're the advocates. I, I, when there is tension, is usually tension in terms of different threat models. And so mm. you just need to, like, explain what your threat model is. Like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, you guys are using this threat model versus that threat model. Now we're all on, all on the same page. But I think that generally there isn't really any uh, friction between the two teams. Cool. Hey, Sunny, from where you sit as a researcher, what are, you talked about some of the problems that you're looking at, research you're doing. What are the sort of other interesting topics that, that you think that maybe um, you want to bring to the folks who are building these platforms and see if, um, what, what their ideas would be or what other researchers are working on this space that are really um, pushing things forward? Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting developments. Um, in research, I mean, so my particular area is cryptography. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen some really interesting things happen in industry. So, for example, I mean, obviously, uh, Signal, WhatsApp, you know, WhatsApp deploying end-to-end -end encryption to, like, you know, I don't know how many people at this point. Um, right. And, uh, you know, Apple deploying differential privacy, Google deploying differential privacy. I think these, are, these were really, really sort of big, um, big events in terms of privacy. And there are a lot of other technologies that I think could potentially find uses. Um, so what I work on is, you know, algorithms that operate on encrypted data. So things like, you know, databases and like information retrieval, um, search engines. But there's other things like um, uh, one, one thing that was mentioned was secure multi-party computation. So this allows different people who don't trust each other and that may have um, data sets and they need to compute some joint function on these data sets. But because they don't trust each other, they can't just share the data with each other. But they can still do this in a private way, in a privacy-preserving way. And so you can imagine training machine learning models using this, um, doing all kinds of analytics on data. Um, and so that's, I think, another really interesting technology. There's been a lot of advances in making it more practical. Um, of course, one of the challenges with all this is that when we make these advances in research and we sort of uh, make them more and more efficient, right, it's sort of, we, it's very kind of siloed and it doesn't mean that because we, now we have efficient algorithms and protocols that we can actually just, you know, drop them off into a product, right? There has right. to be a lot of work in terms of like usability, in terms of how do you build a real system on top of it, does it scale? So there's like a huge amount of like work that has to be done. Um, to do this, but I think with the examples of end-to-end -end messaging and differential privacy, we can see that it's actually possible to do. So I think that's very exciting, and I hope that there'll be more, um, more of these sort of tech transfers, basically. Great. So. Are, and the others, do you, are there any technologies that you find especially promising that you're excited about when it comes to um, your ability to help protect users and their privacy? Federated le learning is one thing that I'm really excited Federated about. Federated learning? Yeah, or any kind of uh, doing as much analysis as a client and possible. And so not sending sensitive data, and the client I mean at the user's device or at the user's end itself, and not sending the sensitive data if possible back to the cloud or back to the servers that collect them. And if there is a lot of promise as these devices get more and more powerful. We can do a lot of privacy preserving personalization, especially for a particular user in their own environment. And so that brings solves a lot of problem for the user where there is no no way where that data gets out and gets leaked somewhere else. And that personalization is al also always very user specific and two users don't share any of these uh, learnings from each other in a very non-privacy manner. So the idea there, I, just to repeat that, so mm -hmm. essentially the, the, the client keeps the data. Yeah. They don't share back their data. It stays with them on their device. So their yeah, money stays right. in their wallet. They don't. Okay. Yeah. 
Got it. Cool. That's cool technology. In security, we haven't always had as much luck pushing things down to the client side, but um, it would be very useful if we yeah, can. Yeah, the devices are getting so powerful right now, right? Earlier they weren't that powerful, but now it can do a lot more. And so it's becoming easier. These technologies are more um, available right now. Awesome. Any other new technologies folks are eyeing? Maybe on my wish list would be uh, a nice oracle that could predict what privacy concerns pe actually matter to people. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So maybe somebody could start working on that. Uh, I feel like the past couple of weeks in the headlines has just been really interesting to see um, kind of an example of something that really has kind of like roused an interest in the use of personal data in a way that I haven't seen happen before. Um, and I feel like actually maybe maybe it, it did happen when we had like the Snowden revelations. I feel like a lot of security folks were like, wow, this was like my worst tinfoil hat nightmare come true. Um, so kind of similar with like this, you know, with the Cambridge Analytica stuff, it's kind of like, okay, so it turns out trying to tinker with democracy and undermine it is the thing that gets people riled up. Um, but if we had an oracle that could tell us for, you know, personalized suggestions that could help folks kind of motivate them to make changes to how they share data, that could be interesting. <laughs> Yes, I think magic oracles would definitely be interesting. <laughs> I'm sure there's a few places where we could use those. But so I, I think that it's a, it's a truism, and it's going to be true on every technology and every platform that different users have different needs, they have different requirements. Um, what about some of the, the patterns that we, privacy patterns or design patterns that we learn from one place, can we translate them elsewhere? So for mm -hmm. example, some of the things that you're learning um, from email, are those things that we can take to mobile messaging, to social? Um, maybe you can plug DMARC right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could plug, to, I feel kind of bad about plugging DMARC on the previous to. question because it, in, in my universe, which is kind of specialized, it's almost old technology now, but um, it does take a very long time to move whole internet places. Um, and, and DMARC is a nice example of a technological solution that makes the world behave a little more like users expect it to behave. Um, How so? When you look at the from address on a piece of email, mm -hmm. you tend to believe that that means something. Um, and in sort of non-DMARC mail systems, there's, there's really no guarantee that means anything whatsoever. Um, and what DMARC does is allow cooperating senders and receivers to ensure that the right-hand side of the at sign actually means something. Which, as you know, if you, the distance between like how people think email works and how it really ought to work is like here, and we've, we've, like, we've bridged a very small piece of that gap. We still don't know any other way than trusting the mail center to, to have reliable large-scale faith in the username side, but, but now the domain name might actually be true, right? Okay. <laughs> um, I, think it's a, I think it's a neat, like it's a little bit of an elegant design, right? In that you, you, it, what it does is it puts more onus on the senders to play, and then it reduces some of the um, work or cognitive load on a user side trying to decipher these things and it lets sort of the servers talk to each other and it's a nice yeah. design efficiency. The, the more or less new piece of it is actually that it allows senders to find out whether or not their mail actually authenticates. <laughs> and it turns out that's useful for two reasons. Um, one, big companies send mail in ways you might not expect. Big companies send mail in ways I might not expect. Um, so most companies don't sort of send all their mail from one place. They send it from dozens and dozens of places and there isn't like a master list where somebody actually knows about all of it. Um, and that's a very big barrier for them in achieving um, authenticated mail. 
And when we were originally working on DMARC, that was the main barrier that we were looking at. But it turns out that the DMARC reporting, which is there mostly to get you over that hump, to get you to the point where you believe that if you turn this knob, you're not gonna break something really important to you, um, also provides a more important piece of information in that reliably you talk to somebody and they're like, nobody would ever fake my mail. And you're like, that's just not true. There is nobody so, you know, government agencies say, nobody would ever fake my mail. And I'm like, that's not true. Right, right? I think it's tax um, season, we, we know. Um, the IRS is very clued into that, but, but not everybody is. Um, and so these reports also give them a way to suddenly say, wait, why are people receiving mail from China claiming to be my agricultural products business in the middle of Iowa? Like, why would that be a thing? Um, to which the answer is, I don't know, but it's not good. Um, and you would probably be happier if they stopped. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a big driver for, for adoption, actually, that people are suddenly able to see um, these violations that were not visible to them before. And making that transparent, making it visible, it helps a lot. An ounce of prevention being worth a pound of cure, if you will. Yeah. So folks who are running platforms, when all of the participants in your ecosystem are kind of on one platform, do you think that that gives you a better shot at setting up the right incentives so that folks are, or providing the right transparency to the senders and receivers, say, of content? I feel like it's a, a good opportunity to do better. Um, I think kind of pulling, pulling back a, a thing that you brought up earlier, um, what I would like to see would be more work put into finding the right default settings. Um, you know, finding those right defaults that are for most users most of the time, and then also ones where if they're wrong for people, it's not a big deal, right? You, you want to try to find those like fail safe settings uh, for the defaults if, if possible. Um, where then if there's something that would expose a lot of your data, then leave that for the power users to discover. Leave that for the people who are really interested in kind of sharing broadly and widely to discover. Maybe don't make it the default, even if that would, you know, delay the viralness of what you're working on. Awesome. So privacy design or privacy engineering, figuring out what the right trade-offs are, making those kinds of pitches and those kinds of calls, mm -hmm. it requires a certain kind of mindset and a skill set. So what do you all think makes a great privacy engineer or a privacy uh, product manager or someone who's going to build these right tools and, and do the research that's needed? Try to be the user. Think like a user, yeah. okay. Uh, I think that's what helps. And things like a user who's going to be very diverse from all the different backgrounds and how they plan to use. Maybe a teenage girl or maybe uh, someone in a remote place or the old lady example that we heard so much today. So there are so many of these diverse examples of users that we can learn from and develop the product and look, look at the product from that perspective. What about technical skills? Development, machine learning? Encryption, I mean, so maybe, the original crypto. Maybe I'd say like, so taking it from a slightly different perspective, um, since I'm, I'm not in industry, but I am in academia, and so I do teach. Um, and so I think one thing is that maybe sort of at, at the undergrad level, um, one thing that we haven't done as well, I think in computer science at least, is um, educating our students to sort of have a broader mm -hmm. view beyond computer science. So educating them in ethics, uh, making sure that they have sort of a broader liberal arts education, that they understand more than just, you know, coding. Um, so, yeah. you know, I know some schools are doing this now. We're doing this at Brown. Um, you know, I teach a really large undergrad class in um, algorithms and data structures, and I make sure that they get at least, you know, some content about not only just machine learning, but about the ethics of machine learning and discrimination and all the things that we've seen um, in the past. But I think that's really important that sort of the next generation of computer scientists, of engineers, of program managers sort of have a more well-rounded education um, that includes, you know, not just, yeah, not, not, not just, just STEM. Mm -hmm. Not just STEM. But yes. other stuff. Yeah, exactly. So that you yeah. can think like other types of people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yeah, I definitely agree. I feel like taking the broad view on a lot of these issues just really 
helps to have a more well-rounded conversation around what the implications might be. It makes room to have a conversation about what the implications might be, where I think it can be kind of easier to not think about it, <laughs> right? It's easy to think about your product existing and within a little bubble and not have to think about all the ugly things that could happen. Um, so I think the more diverse perspectives you bring in, the, the more you're kind of having these conversations, the easier it gets. And where, where typically, uh, so you're doing research, inculcating young minds, thank you. If you're, <laughs> if you're engaged, but you also developed a product, so don't think we didn't notice <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> Well, it's, it's actually free right now. It's not even a product. It's just, well, so. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. If a product is free. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Sunny really doesn't want to be a product developer I mean, right I'm now. Just, <laughs> there's another moment there. Um, I'm just sort of curious as to um, when you, where are you typically engaged? So you're at Google, you're at Snap, wherever you are. Are, are you engaging in the, at, with the product managers to help them understand as they're designing the products uh, how to threat model and how to think like all of these different users who might have different accessibility issues? Where are you engaging? So I engage with both product managers as well as engineers. And coming from an engineering background, I think I enge understand engineers better and their code better <laughs> rather than uh, other things around it. Um, so typically, I find that uh, going back to that point about education, if you talk to these engineers and explain them what are the threat models that you're worried about and what are the things that you have to put in place, we see I see that proliferate. I see that these engineers go and educate other engineers and talk about these threat models to put in place already in their code. And so if they catch some kind of a vulnerability, they come and tell these engineers, go and talk to Shah, because might be you're not supposed to do that, and she can tell you. So education is also a very big component here. That's very similar to security. It's like, yeah. yes, there will be a checkpoint at the end, but if you can pull it back and engage earlier and, and empower developers and designers to think of, about these problems and attack them earlier, then uh, we end up with better outcomes. Definitely. I feel like I just talk privacy all the time. So kind of like I joked that I talk privacy in my sleep. Uh, when I was working both at Facebook and at Google, I kind of just talk privacy all the time. So anybody who wanted to talk about it, it's like, find the privacy people. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I actually, I mean, it feels kind of lame to say that that's kind of a solution in this space, but it's how it gets started. Uh, and I feel like it, it very easily becomes more of a conversation that lots of people are having when they have the vocabulary to talk about it, when they have familiarity with incidents, when they start to see where things went wrong. Um, then all of a sudden you have, you know, a small network effect of people asking similar questions and, and, it, and it matters, right? Like just like for security, when you get to a situation within a company where you have teams coming to you asking for security advice, same thing with privacy. When you have teams proactively seeking your advice, you feel like you've, you know, you've made a difference. Because um, then you're not kind of trying to like walk around and listen to what people are talking about to kind of inject your privacy advice. Not that I would do that. Not but. That you that. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, we have about a minute left, and I'm going to ask another hard question. But it'd be super fast. So just spit out the first thing that comes to your mind. You know, PR approved, of course. Um, which is so. Let's fast forward a year. You come back to Ursa. What is a problem that you hope to solve? A feature you hope to launch? A, a group that you hope to connect with to make sure their their users are being, or sorry, their requirements are being met by your product or your research? You come back in a year. So you're not solving everything. But maybe you, there's a bite-size, a year-long type of problem that maybe you could solve. Anyone got anything? For me, at least solve the fairness and the bias issue in machine learning right now. Fairness it's and bias in machine yeah. learning. Solved in cool. a year. Cool. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. I want to see it. a big tech company be able to talk about their privacy failures in a way that uh, we can then all think about solutions. Ooh, I like that. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Research. Uh, I want to see more end-to-end -end encryption. That's what I want to see. Cool. More and more. <laughs> Developers doing threat modeling with privacy in mind? Something like that? <laughs> Not really, but... <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you have 10 seconds. I think op I'll, I'll, I'll do one. Uh, open threat modeling. Like, it would be cool if we sort of were trying to 
Open threat modeling. I'm just, I'm not even going to explain it. I'm just <laughs> going to throw that out there. Open source threat models for key populations, considerations and requirements. Elizabeth, you got anything? Something email related? Man, in a, in a year, I can, there, the problem is the things I can do in a year are really inside baseball. They're not amusing. So you've got something, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's hashtag secret. I, it's not even secret. <laughs> it's just so, so dull. Cause you're, cause you're, you're working on infrastructure, right? That's where the good stuff happens, infrastructure. Yeah. You got anything to round it out? Or are we going to call it? Call it? I mean, like, there's definitely things that we're working on, but, you know, you obviously can't talk about those things. So I'm trying to imagine <laughs> things outside of the set of things that I know will be coming, you know, okay. in the year. Okay. So. More hashtag secret yeah. from the privacy <laughs> panel. I like it. Okay, thank you guys so much. Really appreciated the chance to speak with you and to listen to your ideas and the things you're working on. Everybody? Thanks so much. All right, off we go. What's next? A break or no, another speaker? No. Speaker? We have, speaker? we have a last speaker. All right. Good job. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and sticking around uh, for our closing keynote. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Jeanette Manfra. So Jeanette is the Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security for Cybersecurity and Communications. Um, that means that she is the highest up person in the United States government who only works on defense in cybersecurity. Uh, and she has been a really good ally of those of us in the private sector, especially those of us who care a lot about the upcoming elections and what we need to do to secure them. Uh, and it is wonderful to see our government uh, invest in that area and having somebody like Jeanette uh, who actually knows what she's talking about uh, for us to work with and to coordinate with. Uh, before that, Jeanette worked in the White House and the Obama administration and National Security Council. She's had a variety of positions in DHS. Uh, she was a military intelligence officer in the US Army. Uh, and I just found out a Girl Scout, uh, which takes you on that whole arc. Uh, um, and so we're really happy to have Jeanette here. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you for coming, Jeff. I feel like I'm about to have a recital of this. <laughs> so I have to apologize first. We've had all this cool sort of informal interaction and I'm all dressed up and using a podium like a typical government speaker. Um, but uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to talk about here. And you know, for me, I can give kind of a cybersecurity talk off the cuff, talk to everybody about all these cool policy things that we're trying to do. Um, but I decided that I uh, I wanted to give a speech about being a woman. And uh, so you'll have to forgive me because I've actually never done that before. And uh, so I wanted to make sure to really focus on, and, I, and for those of you who are not women, I apologize. Better next, luck next life. But... <laughs> try again. Um, but um, I do hope that um, some of these thoughts will be relevant to all of you. Um, and um, so with that, uh, let me just talk a little bit about um, my, at least my best advice for what it's like having spent my now entire career in a, a very male dominated organizations. So, in a, but before I start, I just, I really want to thank you guys for pulling this conference together. Uh, it's such short notice. It's really amazing. Um, it would probably take my organization six months just to find out where we would have the conference, <laughs> much less actually invite anybody to it. Um, and for those of you who came and, uh, and participated, I got to hear some of the, um, the previous uh, talks. And there's just really some amazing people that um, some of them I've heard of, some of them I haven't. I'm going to start following you all on Twitter. We got Twitter accounts, by the way. Um, we're very excited. At, at NPPD underscore Manfra. Um, also, uh, DHS actually has the at cyber handle. Uh, didn't know that. Um, we didn't use it very much. <laughs> so um, we're, we're working on the, uh, the uh, whatchamacallit, the picture. 
Um, if you, it's a little lame right now. Um, but um, so really just want to thank you all. Thank you for having us. Um, thank you for the presenters. I uh, just, you all are such role models. Um, your level of uh, competence um, is, is just amazing. And so let's talk a little bit about what I'd like to call the mothers of invention. Modern technology, think about it. It stands on the shoulder of giants, and many of those shoulders are female. We must all recognize that women are not immigrants to, to technology, but co-founders and fellow pioneers. Ada Lovelace defined the first algorithm before computers were invented. Joan Murray led teams at Bletchley Park in cracking codes in World War II. Admiral Grace Hopper helped design COBOL. My own great aunt actually wrote some of the first programs for the Navy and went on to become a leader at IBM. This list is just the tip of the iceberg of these mothers of invention. But currently, women only occupy 11% of total cybersecurity positions in the United States. In a world where there's a critical gap for cybersecurity talent, this is not good enough. We need to do better, and we will do better. We cannot provide for the long-term stability and security of cyberspace if we are not leveraging all of our available talent. More importantly, we can't honor the legacy of the brilliant women that have come before us. In World War II, many women filled in as factory workers to augment industry for the war effort. We face a similar gap today, but the challenge will not end with the signing of a peace treaty. This is an enduring mission. We need more women in this space to fill a talent gap we have now and continue to fill it in the future. That means our work here is never done. While our legacy as pioneers and founders in this space can never be taken away from us, it can be hidden or left unexamined. I am proud to see a surge in popular culture that explores the rich history of women in tech and brings it forward for public awareness. It is reassuring to see the contribution of these hidden figures recognized. I'm also proud to see events like RSA and others, which give women and others a platform to learn from one another, take stock of our progress, and understand the challenges that many of us still face. I'm also proud to stand here and say that my employer, the Department of Homeland Security, has continued to honor our shared legacy. In my position as Assistant Secretary, I follow in the footsteps of Suzanne F Spaulding, who's a former undersecretary for my organization, Dr. Phyllis Schneck, who's a former Deputy Undersecretary for Cyber, and our current Secretary, Kirsten Nielsen. In my time at Department of Homeland Security, uh, which has been about 10 years now, uh, I've served in a number of positions. As Alex mentioned, I was in the uh, National Security Council. I was the uh, uh, previous secretary's cyber counselor and a variety of other things going from back in 2007 when we actually started this organization. And um, I joke, we were still arguing about whether cybersecurity was one word or two words. Um, the one word won out against my better judgment. Um, it's not, it's not one word, sorry, <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> And, um, but I've seen, a, I've seen a tremendous amount in the time that I've been there. It was, you know, in the beginning, it, nobody paid attention to us. Um, we were just sort of these nerds kind of talking about like doom and gloom security scenarios. And um, turns out most people don't understand how the internet works and they don't re actually really want to, I think. Um, and so my own path uh, has been fascinating because you know, I was there when uh, I was in the White House when Sony happened. Uh, I worked on OPM. Um, been in sort of the um, negotiations with the Chinese and uh, some of the challenges that we've had with them and the progress that we're trying to make with them. And um, and I've seen the government really um, struggle with a lot of complicated uh, questions. And I, I think we're getting better. Um, I think we're recognizing the, the balance and the trade-offs that we have to make, um, but, we're, but we're continuing to work through that. I know companies are, are continuing to address these challenges. And, uh, but the one thing that I have learned is um, that I have to continue to, um, to take risks, and I have to continue to lean forward, and I have to continue to be a strong voice. And we believe that we, as, as Alex said, we're the advocates for the defense. We're the advocates for um, the critical infrastructure community, the private sector, those that may not have a voice in the policymaking process. And uh, so that's one of the reasons we encourage so many to work with us, because the better that we understand um, what the 
private sector needs, what they're struggling with, what potential consequences they could face if government takes certain actions. The better advocate we can be within that process. Uh, so other women in this career field um, have had similar paths, building a diversity of experiences and personal relationships on the way. But there is no right way forward. Each position has given me new experience, learning opportunities. I've changed so much in terms of what I thought we should be doing in cybersecurity 10 years ago to what I think now, all based off of these different experiences that I've had. And every single one of those choices to take a new job um, was stressful, um, but I decided to do it and lean forward Forward, and uh, I, I really believe it's made me a better person and, and frankly, a better uh, leader and advocate. So um, I want to talk about some specific lessons that I'd like to offer um, that I believe have served me well and I hope will, will serve you all, uh, particularly uh, for those of you who are a little bit younger in your career. I still haven't admitted the fact that I'm older than I think I am, um, but, <laughs> but I'm working on it. <laughs> um, so first, Focus on the work and being competent in the work, even if it means doing it for free or less than you'd like to make, <laughs> in my case. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, what matters most is the work and the, you, the recognition that you're competent in that work. It's not to say that there are no other factors that can undermine what we do or how we advance, but our work often meets extra scrutiny and the glare of skeptical eyes. But where we may see a hurdle, we should also see opportunity. Skeptical eyes force us to be creative, to be bold, and to ensure the work we do is unparalleled and beyond reproach. It pre prepares us to work effectively, quickly, as a team, and with a mind to communicate our thoughts and rationale. These are all traits of effective leadership. We should also recognize that the advantage is inherent in volunteering or simply doing the work. There are a lot of jobs, as I said, that I took that I wasn't sure it was exactly the right career step for me, but I saw an opportunity, and I saw an opportunity, frankly, to fix something that was broken. There are no shortage of good ideas in tech. No shortage. And uh, there's a shortage of those, I believe, that are willing to follow through on those good ideas. This is risky. An initiative could lead to nowhere, receive no buy-in, and often there's no guarantees for credit or for advancement, or frankly, somebody else may get the credit and the advancement. Build your trust groups and confidants. None of us can know everything, nor should we. Much of what we do is a team effort. We talk a lot about this concept that we've um, been talking with folks about, about collective defense. My risk is your risk. Thinking about cyber um, as a global digital public health crisis and thinking about how we have managed those sorts of scenarios and applying that. And the only way that we can be successful is by doing it together. But I believe that the only way you can individually be successful in this space is to have these groups of trust. People that will tell you, you cannot, you cannot be an expert in everything. Um, I went to MOG uh, a couple months ago, I guess, um, because we did some work on, on DMARC, and I realized how little I know about email um, very quickly. <laughs> but you just by being able to have trusted people who will advise you, tell you where you're going and, and where you probably need to shift, we can augment our decision-making power and expertise by building these personal and professional trust groups. I hate the term networking because that sounds like mocktails and cocktails and all of that other stuff. Um, and there's a lot of networking, by the way, going on down at Moscone Center. Um, <laughs> A lot, um, and I think it's really just an excuse for people to have those cocktails. Um, it really needs, or, or frankly, try to sell a product or trying to get your next job. I'd rather it be about relationship building. As our careers progress, many of us are thrust into roles where our scope of responsibility can exceed our own personal areas of expertise. I've personally been there many times. In technology, cybersecurity, the situation is compounded by complex interdisciplinary problems that often require quick and decisive action. As we advance throughout our careers, we have an untold number of opportunities to build relationships with those whose expertise and insight complement our own. Maintaining and strengthening those relationships over time make us all better and serves us all of us well as we face new challenges. Take risks as if you had nothing to lose. And you probably have a lot to lose, especially as you get older and have kids. Uh, but we have to continue to take risks. 
As we continue in our careers, there is a distinct tendency to take fewer and fewer risks, to temper the bold and creative ideas that had initially propelled us forward when we were young and frankly didn't know any better. There's an argument for this approach in other industries, but not for technology. We stand on a ground of shifting sand. We must constantly move forward, never look back, and evolve to adapt to our environment and the threats we face. We should never suffer the innovator's dilemma. More importantly, we need to recognize that we, as women, bring a unique perspective, ideas that are fresh and new. We must lean in on this as a natural strength and as a critical contribution to industry. What's wonderful, wonderful about technology and cybersecurity industries is that it creates an environment that is prone to competition, internal and external. I said it was wonderful, it's not always pleasant, but it is the cool thing about it. A bold idea begets other bold ideas, and bold action in turn also creates bold action. I have found oftentimes that simply moving forward with initiative can set off a series of events that direct this natural competitiveness towards constructive ends and quick action. You spend a lot of time in the government talking about problems, thinking about problems. My opinion, we don't spend enough time fixing those problems. And so my tactic has been, even if I don't have full authority, you just launch something and say, here's a plan to tackle this problem. What do you all think? Now, the quickest thing everybody will realize is, hey, that's my job. And so they'll start to quickly figure out a better way to do it, which is fine. That's what I wanted them to do. But now suddenly, a variety of initiatives, some of them that have been public, some of them that haven't, we've got people moving just by saying, you know what, there's a problem, and I'm not just going to talk about it. I'm going to offer a plan. And frankly, I'm going to be very aggressive. My mom kindly calls it tenacious. It's probably obnoxious, but you just keep focusing on d actual tangible actions and offering solutions, but also being willing to take the feedback when others have better idea for you. So this means putting yourself out there. It's not always easy. It means taking decisive action. It means being bold. It also means, most importantly, weighing our decisions towards disruption rather than the status quo. I believe we must be fearless. I'd like to remind you all, before I finish, we're not newcomers. We're not strangers in a strange land. We are coming home to continue the work of the brilliant women who came before us. This means we need to change our view of what our place in technology is. We must see ourselves as fulfilling a legacy and not merely making up for lost time. We shoulder a mantle of responsibility to find talent in ourselves, our daughters, and our sisters, and pave the way for them to share in the great work that we do. The future of our technology and how it changes the very world we live will be written and defined by our efforts to do so. I know this is a heavy mantle, but I take it seriously, and I believe you should too. And there's little doubt we will often face an uphill battle, but we will do what we always do. We will pick up a shovel, we will focus on the work, and we will get it done. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So that's our event. I wanted to have you all join me first in, in thanking all of our fantastic speakers, session chairs, panelists. We, we had 30 of the most inspiring, most talented people coming from the cybersecurity and privacy field speaking today. And I think in doing so, we demonstrated that we are able to find these people that you're all, we're all out there, we have a broad, diverse community, and that events and conferences just need to think about that and to look because of how valuable it is. And just looking at this beautiful wall here shows the many inspiring quotes, the many things that people have said that they're taking home with them and people joining around the world who are enjoying this. So thank you again to everyone who spoke, everyone who presented, everyone who chaired one of the sessions today. Thank you. In addition, I'd again like to thank our wonderful sponsors without whom this could not have been possible. Uh, we have them all listed. We mentioned them at the beginning. In particular, another shout out to Cloudflare for providing this beautiful space and for providing so much of the staff that helped make this event go so smoothly and so seamlessly today. You know, you really wouldn't realize that this came together in just about six weeks. Uh, it, looks, it looks fantastic, it looks phenomenal. So thank you to everyone who helped put it together.
And then finally, it is, again, as Parisa said at the intro, it's a thank you to all of you, all of you who joined us here in person, the more than 1,000 people that have been watching online throughout the day, and I think it's a much bigger number, the people following on Twitter, all of you are part of this, and we think that while it's the end of this day, it's really just the beginning of coming together. Hopefully, you've each found a chance to learn about something you hadn't thought of before, to meet someone who's working in an interesting and related field, to find a connection. So please keep that going, including that for those of you who are local, we're going to be continuing up on the roof where we have a cocktail party going for the next few hours. So thank you again for joining RSA. Thank you for being a part of it. And on behalf of the organizing committee, the planning committee, and everyone on the sponsorship, please enjoy the wonderful diversity that we have in this community. Thank you for being a part of it, and have a nice evening.